Good morning. I will call the uh, committee to order. Welcome everyone back. I declare open this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee. The uh, Senate has referred to the committee the particulars of proposed expenditure and particulars of certain proposed expenditure for 2013-14 for the parliamentary departments and the portfolios of Prime Minister and Cabinet and Finance and Deregulation. The the committee may also examine the annual reports of the departments and agencies appearing before it. The committee has fixed Friday the 12th of July 2013 as the date by which answers to questions on notice are to be returned. Today the committee will continue examination of the department and agencies of the finance and deregulation portfolio beginning with Medicare private. Medibank Private, sorry. We will then proceed to outcomes two and three of the department and conclude with the Australian Electoral Commission. Understanding Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session. This includes answers to questions on notice. Officers and senators are familiar with the rules of the Senate governing estimates hearings, and if you need assistance or copies of those rules, they're available through the Secretariat. I particularly draw the attention of witnesses to the order of the Senate of the 13th of May 2009, specifying the process by which a claim of public interest immunity should be raised, and which I now incorporate into Hansard. Officers called upon for the first time to answer a question should state their name and position for the Hansard record. And I remind uh, witnesses and uh, members of the committee to speak clearly into the microphone and ensure all our mobiles are either switched off or on silent. I would also like to request that if senators wish to table any documents or provide additional information during the proceedings that they please bring the duplicate copy so that copies can be made as quickly as possible for other members of the committee. I welcome back the Minister for Finance, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong, and I welcome Mr. Savitas, Managing Director of Midi Bank Private. Minister, do you have any comments? No. Mr. Savitas, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, I would. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, George Savitas, uh, Managing Director of Midi Bank Private. Uh, Senators, um, I just thought I'd give you a little bit of an update on uh, the, the organisation, how we're travelling. Um, our number one concern is the benefit costs that we're paying as a health fund. Uh, last year they grew 10%. Um, our outlays on hospital cover was, were 3 billion last year. And that particular component grew 12%. So twice the rate of our premium increases to members. Um, what's driving that is uh, in part an indexation that we negotiate with the hospitals for their annual reviews. And those, those contract negotiations are always quite tense. Uh, you cannot, can't always meet the expectations of your providers. But the other factor that's fueling that growth is utilisation, uh, driven by um, population ageing, uh, by new technologies and by improved access to healthcare, new medicines, etc. And so uh, we continue to work through ways and means in which we can coordinate care more effectively to deal with improvements in the size of that utilisation, in other words, reduction of unnecessary usage, uh, whilst maintaining and improving healthcare outcomes. We're also going through a period where there's some changes around our product itself, um, means testing of the rebate, uh, the new legislation that's uh, going through Parliament that will have also impact around our systems and cost structures of our products and also the prepayment that occurred uh, as a result of the dating of the uh, means testing commencement date. Uh, as that runs off, there will be changes to um, uh, cover and, uh, and probably height and switching that was likely to occur in the market or downselling. So uh, our organisation is uh, preparing itself for those conversations with customers to make sure that they're properly informed uh, in the decisions that they make as changes to premiums uh, flow through. That also has a flow and effect around our prudential cover. So we look at claiming going forward, our actuaries work in this area and uh, make sure we meet our prudential standards and ensure that we have the right buffers and reserves in place to protect us against the volatility. Just to remind senators, um, the, the $5 billion worth of revenue that Medibank receives every year from members, we pay out a little over $4 billion in claims. And if the $4 billion projection is, uh, in, in our assessments is uh, incorrect, if there's some volatility in that, that can have uh, 
uh, consequences around the margins, which are three and four percent range in terms of operating margins. So what are we doing about this sort of context? Well, obviously costs are important. Contracting costs, the cost of benefit outlays, but also our own corporation, uh, the overhead of the organisation. So we have a fairly intense program of cost reduction happening at the moment. Uh, and we've been able to meet our targets for the, this financial year and we're continuing that program into next year, trying to double the, uh, the savings target as we add another significant reduction next year. Uh, this contributes to keeping premiums as low as we possibly can. Uh, we're also refreshing the second brand that we own in health insurance, um, AHM, the original Australian health management brand that we acquired three years ago. And that's been repositioned to be um, targeted at those individuals who, if you like, um, are looking at a price uh, for health insurance, not so much the benefits, and, uh, and maybe are in the obligation purchase, i.e. that if they don't buy a product, uh, they pay the, the extra Medicare levy surcharge. So that uh, reformulation of that product range is going to market as we speak. Uh, membership continues to grow, but at a slower rate. Um, we are seeing an increase in uh, customers coming to us to sell down to reduce their premiums and have, if you will, like lighter cover, an increase in that proportion of activity. We're pleased to see our health advice line run by our nurses is continuing to increase in its calls received, the 7 by 24 hour service that we provide free for members as we provide more health uh, in the experience of being a customer of the company, not just an insurance policy, a financial service. Just last month, we um, launched Anywhere Healthcare, sorry, this month, month of May, Anywhere Healthcare in, uh, in, at a launch in Tasmania. This is our new video consultation platform that links the patient, the GP, and the specialist in a video consult to assist uh, Australians to be able to reach and access specialist services, especially for those who are in regional and rural Australia. And uh, it's been a very successful launch. We've had quite a lot of inquiry, GPs wanting to uh, install the system and use it as a channel to uh, connect their patients, as general practitioners, their patients with the nominated specialists that the patient requires for a video consultation. We funded that entirely through our own organisation and we're launching that into the Australian marketplace through the GP networks across Australia. We also launched in the, year, in the, in the month, sorry, uh, our research on mental health in Australia. Uh, we've uh, w worked uh, with the NOWS group to uh, understand more fully uh, the cost of mental health in the Australian uh, population, not just the direct cost uh, that we normally measure, but consequential costs in terms of use of the health system more broadly. And we were surprised to discover uh, in the NOWS research that $28.6 billion a year uh, are the costs associated with mental health in Australia. And we're working with uh, the peak organisations to provide coordination of services for those who have mental illness to try to, try to minimise, again, wasted costs that are occurring through random healthcare, if you like, rather than coordination of care. And then finally, Senators, I, I just thought I'd mention that uh, comments about the Garrison Health, the ADF health contract. Uh, the commissioning phase is uh, completed and it's successfully completed. We're now in operational mode and uh, you know, we're pleased to be able to report that the, uh, the system is working well um, and we, uh, I'll be actually briefing uh, uh, senior uh, officials in the Defence Force this afternoon as we do our normal regular update. Uh, but we're very pleased about how that contract's working. We know we're saving the ADF money, but we're also providing a more consistent service for the 80,000 men and women who are part of our uh, Defence Forces. I'll, I'll stop there at, at that point, Senator, and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, um, Senator Common. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Min ministers disappeared. I wanted to start off with a question to the Minister, so I'll just... Sorry, Senator, I've forgotten my tissues. So. <laughs> so, so, sorry about that. That's right. Um, Minister, I just was keen uh, in this session to start off uh, with um, one of my routine questions to you, and that is uh, 
uh, what is your current position in relation to the potential uh, sale of uh, Medibank Private? Uh, it remains the same. We remain firmly committed to keeping Medibank Private wholly in public hands. Uh, so the government has not uh, considered the potential sale of Medibank in any way? The government's policy is as I've stated. Is that a yes or no? Well, we wouldn't consider, uh, we're not considering <coughs> a change of policy. Uh, not even a partial sale? No. Okay. Um, given the Medibank Private Sale Act passed Parliament in 2006. Sorry? G given the Medibank, and this is now a question, I guess, to either the, the, the department or uh, to Mr. Savidis, however, uh, is appropriate uh, for it to be answered. Uh, the Medibank Private uh, Sale Act passed Parliament in 2006. Um, can you just talk us through the work that was done since 2006 uh, to give effect uh, to that legislation which was passed by Parliament? Jan Mason, Deputy Secretary, Business Procurement and Asset Management within the Department of Finance and Deregulation. Um, Senator, there's been no work done uh, in recent years at all on the potential sale of Medibank. As to work that may have been done closer to the passage of the legislation, I'd need to take that on notice and check our records. So what, what is the status of a bill that is passed by Parliament, which is an act of Parliament, uh, but then is not enacted by government? What, what, what sort of, what is the status of that as far as executive government is concerned? So I don't. Well, I mean, executive government administers the laws. Like, what sort of work, oh, as a matter of course, Senator, do you do in relation to legislation passed by the parliament? I think I understand your question yeah. now. If it were government policy to proceed with the sale, uh, the department would assist the government to um, sell the company. But as the minister has just said, it's not government policy. Yeah, but it's parliamentary legislation, I guess. Like, I mean, does that. Well, I think the difference is that uh, the legislation enables a sale to happen, yeah, sure. um, but it's not government policy to sell the company. So, so how, I mean, what, what would be the time frame required for the department to give effect to that legislation if government policy changed? Um, we would need to take that on notice, I think, Senator. I mean, a sale process uh, can take some time. It can be done quickly, but it can also take some time uh, to prepare for a potential sale, and it's not something that we're working on. Uh, th thank, thank you, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Savis. Um, I I'm interested in the uh, figures that you uh, put to us around the rising cost of uh, benefit payments, in particular in relation to hospitals, and you mentioned an increase of uh, 12 per cent. I mean, obviously, there is both utilisation and the uh, increase in uh, cost per service, so to speak. C can you give us a bit of a high-level indication to what extent the increase in uh, benefit payments is driven by increases in utilisation as opposed to increases in the cost of service? Yeah. Yes, Senator. Um, so hospital treatments, for example, in the published figures of our uh, FY12 year, 3.2 billion. Uh, grew 10.4 per cent year on year. That's hospital services, not the ancillary or general. And if you unpack that, I think you'll find that it's it's roughly one third the indexation and two thirds utilisation. Sorry. One third of that increase of 10 per cent. Yeah. Is with the indexation, yeah. you know, the adjustment every yeah. year for like a inflation effect and CPI effect, and the rest of it is volume increase. Yeah. So say something like five to six percent more members every, every uh, went through those hospitals year on year than the prior year, and and that extra volume is because the age of the population we cover, the four million lives, has grown a year older, yeah. and the bell curve is skewed to the right. Yeah. There are more older people in the mix than younger as the baby boomers drift yeah. to right, and so that volume bubble is manifested in utilisation. It will be there for something like 15 years. And it's not at its peak yet. Um, you know, I'm, I'm about to go into that space. So, you know, there's a, that, that volume is, a, is an issue for us because it, it is re represented in real dollar costs that we pay out, 10% growth in hospital claims year on year, which our premiums have to cover mm. to ensure our prudential margin. 
and our premiums are only 10 per cent ahead of our costs because yeah. the, uh, the way the uh, claims ratio plays out against our revenue. We do rely on investment income, as you know. We have our, our prudential reserves which are invested, but we invest conservative, conservatively and primarily our investments are interest rate based. So, so when you say you rely on investment income, does investment income cross subsidise? It does, yeah. It does, does it? To, to some extent it does. It's a small amount because if you look at the percentages, um, what was it last year, a couple of hundred million, oh, 150 million of investments yeah. um, against an outlay of Four billion. Yeah. So, but okay. It's a very small amount. Yeah, sure. Isn't it? But yeah. Um, so to what? It, so you, you've got an operating deficit, then, do you, for your hospital insurance? No, no. We our uh, underwriting margins are positive, and our investment so, income is additive to that. But you, so you don't need it to actually achieve a positive. Oh, you, you can live without it. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, so three point two billion of uh, hospital. Uh, benefit payments, and obviously that's made up of utilisation and indexation. Uh, what about on the flip side, the premium, the hospital insurance premium uh, income, like mm. how, how has that been growing? And that's obviously made up of growth in membership as well as yes. uh, indexation. So what is the correlation? What, yeah, what are the correlated It's around 7% growth last year, 7%. overall in the premium income growth. And in dollar terms? Oh, I don't have the numbers on me right at the moment, Senator. I can take that on notice. It's roughly about 5.3 billion, I think. Yep. It's. And 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 what are what are the sort of I guess proportions in terms of uh, growth in membership as opposed to uh, oh. rate increases? Oh, it's primarily rate increases. Primarily rate yeah. increases. Yeah. Like the last published membership growth was 1.8 percent, yeah. uh, FY12 number, against say a, an in, uh, a premium increase in that year of about. My recollection, 4.7. Yeah. So no, most of the growth comes through the premium increase. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I mean, all other things being equal, I mean, you know, 4.7. That assumes that everybody stays on the product they're on. One of the risks that we've talked about in recent it's estimates was the risk of downgrading yeah. level of cover. I mean, yeah. can you just talk us through uh, the imp you know, how that's been trending and what? the implications of that for your premium income? Yeah. Generally. Not specifically, I don't have the specific numbers, but we know through our call centre conversations and retail store conversations that when we do cover reviews, the consequence of cover reviews, um, we are seeing an increased amount of sell down. People asking, well, what cover can I have for less dollars that covers the essential things that I'm looking for? Or will I drop my ancillary cover and only stay with my private hospital cover? I'm not saying that it's all conversations, I'm saying that the percentage that is sell down is, a, a, is growing. Um, as people are, are looking for uh, premium relief, especially those who are, know that they will be means tested and have the higher hit with the, uh, the rebate being lost off the premium. Yeah. And they're getting a 40% increase, as you know, so that they, they will be looking at $1,000 a year more in premium for um, a mid-level cover. And they'll, they may have a conversation that says, how can I save some of that $1,000 a year by being on a lower cover? We would are very concerned to make sure that members understand that we're covering themselves, this is a human being that we're covering and all of their needs as they get older. So they should be very careful about compromising the level of cover that they have in their policy. So c can you give us an update on um, your level of capital reserves? I don't have those numbers right at the moment. We don't disclose the mid, the mid term sort of position, yeah. but in the financial report of last year, um, our prudential reserves are all stated there in document. So what, what were they? I think approximately approaching two billion of all of our uh, yeah. prudential capital, including uh, the cap ad ratios. Yeah. Can, can, can you uh, update us on what's been happening in terms of dividend payments since we last met in February? Well, we pay our normal interim and final dividends, but we don't disclose those um, until we publish our annual results. That's been the practice of the GBE. Well, I mean, when, when we, obviously in the budget, uh, there was provision, well, not this budget, the budget before, or the mid-year economic, I can't remember now, where was it? Somewhere along the way, I think it might have been my EFO, there was a, a, an additional special dividend of $300 million. Was it last year's budget or? When no, Senator, we actually uh, disclosed through a disclosure note in our annual report last year our intention to pay a $300 million dividend. So has that been year. paid or not? Well, we don't disclose that until we publish our results. You don't disclose whether you've paid your special dividend? 
Well, most corporations don't disclose until they actually tell mm -hmm. the market. I'm sure we've had these conversations in the past where you, where you did actually disclose uh, no, the whether you had a. The answers have always been the same. So. Sorry, no, the it answers hasn't. Have I don't think that's right. No, that's, I don't think that's right. So, have you, has a final dividend been determined yet? Um, final dividend. Where are we? Um, no, well, we haven't disclosed our final dividend payments for the prior year. I'm not asking you how much it is even. I'm just asking whether it has been determined. Oh, yeah, so the normal process of dividend, um, there's no, there, has been, there has been no disruption to normal process. Uh, have there been any uh, fresh discussions on uh, new dividends, new special dividends uh, since we last met? Senator, We'd I think you're that. asking in a um, different way the same question to which Mr Savides has answered. Um, Would it be disclosed in the annual report? Well, we know that since uh, the government changed the status of uh, <coughs> Medibank Private, you've um, collected about $832 million worth of <coughs> dividends on top of you know, quite a sizable amount in uh, yes, income the, tax, the tax uh, so, of Australia which of course comes from uh, privately insured members at Medibank Private. Yes, and the taxpayers of Australia have running, benefited running down from a dividend that you, you wish to take away from them through privatisation. Can, can we have an update on your uh, membership both in numbers and as a percentage of the total market, uh, Mr Savidis? Oh, I don't have that material with me, Senator. I can take we, that we, we ask about this all the time. It's pretty basic. Uh, the, We'll issues on, on membership we publish in our annual results um, to, to disclose to competitors, all 30 of them out there, a quarterly update on, on our position uh, would undermine our you know, ability to compete effectively. But, but, I mean, you, you report, I, that's the first time that I've had this answer in estimates from you. I mean, you normally quite freely share with us membership trends and where you track in terms of your market share. I don't think I, I do. I don't think that's true, well, Senator. <laughs> I think you probably well, want I, him I, to. I, I, will, I will send you a letter separately pointing you to your evidence in the past. Well, why don't you just uh, ask Savides. the question and we can put it on. Um, and we'll take it on notice and we'll see what we can do. It's, that's a very uh, unusual answer. Um, well, taking it on what, what is the percentage of your non-health related business? Uh, Mr. Savides. The, the revenue from non-private yeah. health insurance, yeah. so Medibank Health Solutions revenue. Um, it's approximately $300 million a year in the core activity of health solutions. Um, and the new contract that's come into play this year is the ADF Garrison Health contract. It's roughly about the same amount, so when it's fully annualised, because Garrison didn't start in the beginning of the financial year, it would double the revenue of health solutions. So uh, Health Solutions is uh, a profitable venture for Medibank? Uh, it is a profitable venture and the specific nature of the profits will be disclosed in our annual accounts. Yeah. How is pet insurance going? Well, it's a small category, Senator, and um, it continues to be a companion sell to our broader product portfolio, as does travel insurance and life insurance. Uh, Minister, what is the public policy case of the government owning a pet insurance business? Well, <laughs> we own Medibank Private uh, and consistent with the governance arrangements, we don't direct uh, them as to how they run their business. And if I suspect if I did, you would be in here um, very heavily critical of me. Well, I mean, I, mean, I, I suspect, well, hang on. Uh, don't you have a role in approving corporate plans and have, don't you have regular formalised interaction as the shareholder minister? Don't you have, I mean, you know, you've got a level of, I mean, to suggest that you've got no influence at all, I would have thought is understating uh, your role, minister. Yes, we do approve the corporate plan, uh, but the, the level of... Uh, and you've got and, a 100% shareholding. I beg your pardon? You've got a 100% shareholding in a pet insurance business. Uh, well, we have a 100% shareholding on behalf of the taxpayers. In a pet insurance uh, in, business? In uh, a very substantial uh, private in health insurance business that uh, a lot of Australians rely on, uh, that is performing well and returning uh, dividends to its shareholder, the, ta the Australian taxpayers. So what is the purpose of pet insurance as part of the business you run, uh, Mr Savidis? Well, it's part of the bundle. Uh, Senator, um, when we survey our customers, we're constantly surveying them 
and asking them how can we meet their expectations you know, within the, the remit of our business profile. And um, there are many members of Medibank, especially those very attached to their pets, which by the way, um, there, are, there is some research, Senator, around the health of the human being and their companion friendship, especially when you're on your own. You're doing it for us. Uh, so I think it, overall it has health well, outcomes that are beneficial. So, so I mean, how, how are the, I mean, you talk to us about the claims trends in hospital insurance for humans. I mean, what are the claims trends for yeah. uh, uh, pet thing, insurance? Let me tell you, I wish my mother had taken out pet insurance for her cat. Uh, how, old was it, was, how old was your mother's cat? Oh, he's, he's quite old and he, uh, I think he's, that he's, costing, might... he's costing us a lot. But he's Would a the minister's cat. cat have been able to no. uh, well, we benefit did, we from We didn't take it out. I just said like we wish we had. His head. No, it's just that we have a 10 year rule. Because there's no community <laughs> rating for community pet rating. insurance, is there? There's I'm no... just making the point. It would be very expensive. <laughs> we, no. we have, I hope it joined early, otherwise the lifetime health No, no, we precluded. So. And there's no rebate for pet insurance either, is there? I, need, I think there's an assumption you're holding on to, Senator, I need to correct, and that is that we don't have an underwriting risk with pet insurance as a commission You don't sale. have a what? An underwriting, an underwriting risk. risk. It's so, a commission So essentially sale. you're just using the Medibank brand well, to sort of flog a product? No, it's the other way around. We have a customer base that has a need and we've leveraged our brand to provide a solution for their need and we haven't put at risk our balance sheet because it's a commission sale. There so who is underwriting the insurance for you? I, we, we go to the market every three years and test the market. There are multiple providers. I don't have the name at the moment. So, so it was quite remiss of me. The government doesn't actually own uh, a pet insurance business. The government is contracting pet insurance well, through the, you. The government business enterprise has made a decision that its, its business yeah. uh, plan uh, uh, encompasses providing a service to a portion of its membership. That's what's right. occurring without taking on risk. That's mm. right. Now, uh, Mr. Savidis, just going back to some more uh, serious matters, um, what is your assessment of uh, the impact on Medibank uh, of uh, FIAC, uh, the, the regulator, uh, seeking to extend its supervisory jurisdiction, uh, especially into competition? Mm. Uh, well, look, um, one thing we have noticed is that in the interaction with FIAC over the last 12 months, um, they've been very keen to try to work a process to uh, smooth and make more efficient the uh, annual premium uh, approval uh, methodology. And, and we've had some real gains in that area, Senator. Um, so we've been pleased about their efforts and also defining the roles, the roles of the regulator, the department, et cetera. And that's been really great, the health department. Um, they have an extended role. Um, it's PACU, I think, P-A-C-U, the, the, the unit that they've um, developed. And uh, it does provide a, a market assessment and commentary. It's still young in its phasing, and uh, we, we haven't been disappointed about what we've seen. Um, we're, we, we have a, a positive and constructive relationship with the regulator. We've just recently conducted um, uh, the, uh, a review of our internal systems, in our IT and our business uh, sustainability DRP, disaster recovery capability. Uh, it was a very exhausting uh, review process over a week. Uh, the pre-work was enormous, mm -hmm. and we came through with very strong, a very strong scorecard. So sure. we're very pleased. But yeah, I mean, and I guess I wouldn't expect you, for commercial reasons, to say to be in any way critical of the regulator. However, in, in a generic sense, um, I mean this is an increase in regulation into a, a sector that is already highly regulated, is it not? What, what is the implication on Medibank in terms of your costs, in terms of your compliance costs in particular? I, I don't think there has been at this stage. Um, look, for example, let me talk about a positive aspect of it. Um, we've raised with the regulator the, the emerging role of aggregators in the um, health insurance market, um, the online uh, comparison sites. They're not insurance companies, they just promote the offers, they're like agents. And the aggregators uh, churn the market, and that's a cost to the sector. So we've um, taken our analysis of the impact of the aggregators to um, FIAC in this particular unit of theirs, and they're reviewing our submissions, and uh, they're also researching more broadly the views of others. We think there ought to be some regulation around uh, the discounting that it can occur through regulated channels, which can't occur directly through insurance firms. So we're, we have an unfair playing field, we believe, and we've raised those concerns. So it can play a constructive role in ensuring good competition. 
is there a case still for having a separate uh, private health insurance uh, regulator as opposed to having like an upper type approach across the financial services sector as a whole? Well, I've heard from other health insurers who operate in both general or life and, and, yeah. uh, and health insurance, and they have to deal with two regulators, you know, APRA yeah. and, and FIAC, and they've often said, look, it would be better if it was one because it's one's conversation. It's not a, we don't have that problem at Medibank, we only deal with FIAC. And when FIAC wishes to undertake more intensive regulatory work, they actually use the resources of APRA to, to do that work. So it seems like that companion activity is already happening, um, even though the names are, are still separate. Um, just going back to some of your opening remarks about the growing cost of uh, hospital benefits in particular and, you know, contracts with hospitals, I mean, can, can you just talk us through what the contracting environment with doctors and hospitals is currently like for, for a private health insurer? Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's tense. Um, and it's different across, so, you know, there's the religious not-for-profit sector, there's the private equity s sector, which is highly stressed in terms of gearing, and then there's the listed companies that uh, operate in our market, and then there's the odd group of independents as well. So they all are different in terms of needs and, and where they are in terms of expectations in contracting. Uh, we continue to try to contest the market rather than just do... Um, um, an indexation adjustment, so we do uh, do the case mix comparisons uh, on a neutral cost weight basis, so we so that the comparisons are fair, and we draw attention to the provider if they're an outlier, if they're charging too much, there's something abnormal about their cost structure. We try to bring them back to average or to the right sort of premium in the market that reflects the services that they offer. That's not often welcomed, um, but if we were to ignore the, the work of being a, of, a, of contesting the market, um, our customers would pay a lot more and that would have a negative effect on our market share and our membership. Um, just going back to Medibank Health Solutions, uh, can you just talk us through the progress uh, on implementing the uh, new contract to provide healthcare services to the uh, Defence Force? Yes, so we entered into uh, arrangement or into it, we inherited an arrangement which was not a national system. It was, there are, I think, about 70 garrisons around the country. It's Army, Navy, Air Force. And many of them had their own arrangements in terms of <coughs> relationships with local medical and health service providers, as well as on base clinics. So we inherit the lot. So our job was to turn it into a, a consistent. Um, integrated service of health coverage for the ADF staff, around 80,000 ADF personnel across Australia. We went out to the marketplace and contracted to off-base health service providers. Uh, the first phase of that was quite straightforward, but uh, when we discovered some anomalies in pricing, especially in the area of specialist charges in some of the regions, um, that became a bit tense. We use the weight of evidence of our private health insurance provider contracting network to make the case of what is reasonable, given that we're a volume purchaser of healthcare in Australia. And, you know, we had discussions with the AMA. We didn't always agree. But ultimately, we came through with a very substantial network of off-base hospitals, specialists and ancillary providers, general cover providers, optical, dental, etc as well as a contracted arrangement for running the clinics on base. Um, we understand, uh, I don't have the specifics, but we are saving the ADF money uh, by having a national consistent system with contested supply. Our CAT team, which is our central team of processing the referrals into the provider network, um, is operating efficiently. We're responding. We have a 24-hour health advice line for our ADF staff operating as well. It's being well used. And we continue to have conversations now with the ADF around new services or better ways of treating, including the video consultation platform I've just talked about, Anywhere Healthcare, in helping our um, uh, treatment response rate improve by not letting distance or access to specialists uh, get in the way of uh, treating our ADF staff immediately when they need those services. So summing up what, all of what you've just said, the recruitment of uh, healthcare professionals, doctors, that is now on track and the remuneration arrangements and 
all of the issues with the AMA have been resolved, have they? Oh, well, even in our private health insurance space, all the issues of the AMA are not resolved. They're never entirely resolved, are they? It's no, always we have a work an operating, in progress. We have an operating environment that is meeting the needs and, yeah. the, and the commercial expectations uh, of sure. our client. Okay. Now... The process now is being bedded down with that um, defence contract because we talked about it at previous estimates. How long has it actually been running for now? Uh, okay, on the ADF contract, I'll just get some specifics here. So I got the dates right. I just had a couple of questions. The, um, yeah, so the the contract started um, in November in an operational sense. We started the contract uh, implementation phase in August, July, August. 20, and, 2012. Yeah. So and, it's, and so now yeah. we're up and running. You know, 250,000 on-base appointments have been consumed already. 100,000 pathology tests, 28,000 imaging tests. So it's an operational environment. The response rate is meeting the response rate requirements. Uh, but for the first time, we're talking about a nationally contracted mm. network of providers. And the size of that provider network, it's, uh, nearly 4,000 medical specialists, over nearly 9,000 allied health professionals. The ratio of health workforce to individual, i.e. the ADF staff, mm -hmm. it's one in 20. For every 20 ADF staff, we have one specialist. In the Australian population, it's one in 700. Yeah. So it's a very strong, very responsive, high quality health system for the ADF. It differs from the Australian marketplace in one key way, you must be referred. And it's through the referral that the savings occur and the quality consistency is delivered. And so we're learning things about healthcare cost management through this exercise of running a defined population. If we can show proof that we can improve the health status of the people we cover at a lower cost through this kind of arrangement, then that has obviously very interesting consequences around how we could promote reform in the broader health system to get similar benefits for funders, mm. but also benefits for consumers of healthcare as well. So how does the referral process operate? Because we talked about that, I think, two estimates ago, about exactly what the linkage was going to be, and that referral point was critical. How exactly is that working? Yes, yeah, so the, the Central CAT team is in, in um, Richmond, in Melbourne. Yep. Um, they receive uh, the request from the uh, on-base clinics, right. which are run by the doctors who are uh, employed there. And they're already contracted through defence, the people who aren't. So that's, that's right. That's a separate That's mechanism. right. So the referral process is really a quality check to ensure that the provider that you're referred to through the clinicians with prompt yep. uh, is the right provider contracted, but not only that, that the relationship will be paid mm -hmm. so that the individual's not paying. They used to in the past with the mm -hmm. credit card. Uh, no longer is that required because we now have a contracted system so an ADF staff uh, employee will go to the provider and the payment is behind the scenes, as right. it is in health insurance. So there's no out-of-pocket for any... Because there, there were concerns no. being raised at the time. And no, we I think about ADF those, got yeah. the best health cover in Australia. So. Yeah, so they yeah. go through. And yeah. the clinics now are on all major bases? I think they are. I, I'm not quite sure. if it, Some bases are close to other bases. They may share. If you want a specific on that, I can take that on That'd notice and come back. And yeah. also overseas placements, so that... So we, we're domestic, so we run the system on the Australian continent. So personnel who'd be having treatment that would be going through here, it would, if they were posted overseas, it would not, that wouldn't operate when they... Uh, the overseas assignments are covered with their own medical service pr okay. provision. If somebody returns, obviously, and they need treatment, then they fall into our own environment here. And the other point was the, I mean, I did ask questions about this later, Senator, but just linking in terms of the process with the, medi, with the uh, mental health information. Was any involvement in that stuff, which I've read some of it, but not all of it, was there any linkage there with the military contract? Did information through the military contract get fed into that research? I, I don't know if that's the case, Senator. I can take that on notice. I know we work with organisations like Beyond Blue and... Yes, yeah. um, uh, organisations here in Sydney, uh, Black Dog, in, sorry, in Sydney with Black Dog and others. But um, uh, well, there is a flow on effect in our work on mental health uh, that will be applied in terms of um, the knowledge, the yeah. know how into the ADF environment. We'll have consultations with um, our client service contacts there. And if they're happy for those services to be made available, we already do have counselling services, but we may 
improve the quality or the depth or the sophistication of those services as we learn more from our research with the NAUS group and uh, with Beyond Blue. Okay, and the, and the other question on the, um, the defence contract, is there a particular review process in place for that? Because it's only been in place for about eight months. Oh, it's, so. quite a, uh, it's quite a robust yeah, I would expect so. yeah, contract and uh, it has lots of checks and balances and uh, part of my conversation later today is uh, part of that uh, to be in dialogue with the senior office to make sure that they're getting the services they require and I'm accountable to respond if they're not. Okay, thank you, Senator. Essentially, I've only got one more question. Uh, has Medibank uh, Health Solutions uh, been engaged by the Department of Immigration uh, to provide services to uh, people accommodated on Nauru uh, or Manus Island? No, we have not, Senator. Thank you. That's, that's it for me. Yeah. I have a, a, a couple of questions, if I can. In relation to your, your um, opening comments in relation to launching the, the new program dealing with video conferencing, um, coincidentally in Tasmania, um, firstly, can you tell me why Tasmania was chosen as the launch site? And secondly, can you talk through uh, the committee how that's going to work and what sort of services are actually provided? Excuse me. The, um, with the uh, Tasmania, I'm not sure why our team chose Tasmania other than they, their relationship with the local GP networks there. Uh, they probably had a significant amount of enthusiasm uh, for the technology. And also the reach to specialists was probably a higher need. Um, and so uh, they facilitated the launch there because they had the real players in, you know, engaged with the real service and, uh, and hence it was a, a credible uh, launch, not a show and tell exercise. But it is a national service. We've, rather, we've contacted all of the GP networks around Australia and independent GPs. Any general practitioner can install the technology into their practice. It's not just a conversation technology. It also is a payment system embedded in the conversation. It identifies the, the payer and the reimbursement cycle occurs behind the, te the telco conversation. So it, it, administratively it's more efficient. It also has the ability to bring the health record into the conversation as well so that the clinician has the history and file of the uh, patient in the conversation. The, old, the, the, the thing that is the sort of power play in this technology is if the GP and the patient are together speaking to the specialist, that's really, really effective. It rarely happens. You normally get your GP referral and you do a one-on-one -on -one touch point. That's suboptimal in the health system. And what we're passionate about at Medibank is that we need to integrate healthcare more because through integration we get better decisions, better outcomes, and we get less waste by having repeat visits that were unnecessary if we'd only got the care providers together in a team-based conversation. Video technology can do that at unit costs much lower than the physical system can. Well, certainly it goes hand in hand with the, the desire of the Tasmanian community to have greater access to, to specialists, yeah. but also with uh, the rollout of the NBN. Um, Tasmanians see that as a real advantage uh, in terms of um, healthcare generally. It so can only help, yeah. Yeah, I think it will be great. Now, you also touched on, um, you've got some growth areas. So I was just wondering if you, if you can break down the, um, the demographics of, of the increases that um, Medicare or Medibank are actually um, enjoying at the moment. In terms of new members coming in, what sort of age groups, demographics are they? Um, I don't have that information on me, Senator. Um, there, there are segments that grow faster than others. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And our marketing teams are often wondering, you know, why aren't we getting the growth in some categories and versus others? So they're constantly looking at ways to reach. Part of the reason why we uh, refreshed and energised our second brand was to be able to um, reach into segments that maybe just one brand can't reach into because we're trying to cover too many bases in the proposition. Um, in, in terms of the general conversation around growth, our Medibank Health Solutions teams are finding more and more funders of healthcare, like state governments, who are, say, providing services for high-claiming older Australians who have multiple uh, situations in terms of disease status. I think it's something like 2% claim 35% of a state budget in healthcare in the normal population ratio of costs. Our conversations there is that the Health Solutions Group can come along and provide a care coordination service, take the funding that is already being spent on that population give back a proportion in savings, 
coordinate the care of those people with high touch case management, seven by 24 hour contact with telco, and arrange their appointments, keep the file updated in terms of health record. That activity can be done at a margin, positive margin for health solutions, and a saving for the funder, and improved health outcomes for the patient, for that category of patient. So we're exploring more and more the health management of segments of the population, the ADF is a segment, um, as a new line of business. And even in the conversations around the NDIS, where disability is a category of population, um, there are interesting conversations occurring with some of the funders at state level about getting our approach to healthcare coordination happening in their particular funding area to save funding dollars but improve healthcare outcomes through coordination and the deployment of our virtual technologies. Uh, you also mentioned in your opening comments um, the increase uh, traffic, for lack of a better word, of your nurses helpline. Can you um, step us through what that process is and where the areas of growth and where you see the benefits to the community as well as to Medibank? Well, generically overall, we're, we're saying that health insurance as a financial service is not sustainable. It has to become a health service, a health relationship because the cost will continue to grow and if we, there's no value in those costs, i.e. relational value with the customer and the member, uh, we're, we're going to stress out. And so we've taken that view, transformation's important into healthcare. One aspect of that was to acquire the McKesson's Asia Pacific business, which we did three years ago, the, the strongest seven by 24 hour nurse uh, network in the region. Um, 800 Australian nurses, seven by 24, 200 in New Zealand, long-term contracts with state governments and federal that business came on board. We then took a segment of that workforce and applied it to our four million lives in Medibank Private. Opened up a seven by 24 hour nurse advice line for our members free of charge. Anyone with a hospital plan with Medibank gets a fridge magnet, the number, and a personal conversation at any time. Most of the calls are weekend and evening. They're skewed two thirds to women, one third to men. Uh, the age profile of the calls tend to be younger. So younger people, women, accessing 7x24, mainly evening and weekend, getting direct conversations with health professionals. We, we avoid unnecessary hospitalisation in terms of appearance at A&E, but don't get me wrong, we also say in many of those conversations, you need to go to the hospital now. Depends on the triage and the protocol and the outcomes out of that triage. So we'll probably introduce other health professionals into the virtual conversation and relationship with our members. And as Australia ages, I think that conversation becomes more regular. Uh, people who are tied to home, transport's difficult, or maybe in a care environment, still, in, still having their ability to relate to their health professionals at any time, we think is a future requirement to keep the costs in the health system down, but also keep access up. So we're excited about the health solutions future outlook. It will overlap our health insurance work because as the two overlap, we actually transform the experience of health insurance over time to become, if you like, health assurance, not just the payment. Excellent, thank you. Any further questions, Senator Moore? I'm following up on some questions I asked a while back now, but you, I talked about the range of servicing, and I'm following up on the access you have in terms of online, phone and office visit and I'm just wondering whether you have any information. I, I know you keep that stuff in terms of what mechanisms the, your clients use, or your customers, I suppose, right. use to access your services. And there's been various letters that have gone out um, as, as, you know, I have, a, I am a Medibank private customer. Yeah, um, so you see the traffic. Yeah. yeah, to talk about, you know, encouraging people to use different methodologies. So right. do you have any data on exactly which ways the clients... I certainly have the trends, uh, Senator, Good. I can bring the data on, if, on notice, but so go. trends are that uh, there is more and more uh, conversation online mm -hmm. and we now have the click to call capability. So you are, you're online, you're looking at our services, you have a question, you click and you get the, uh, the call going straight through to the call centre. Okay. Or you can register the, a uh, request for the call centre to call you okay. with a time, if you like, as well. So there's more increased traffic on online. Mm -hmm. um, we're still very much weighted towards servicing health insurance conversations rather than health conversations. So the conversation, sure. you know, what I've just talked about with health advice line with nurses is 
I uh, don't have the right, the, the absolute numbers, but I would think it's probably about 15% of our call traffic. Mm -hmm. I would like to see it to be 50%, mm -hmm. so that the relational conversations are about health itself rather than about the administration of health payments or premiums or uh, technicality. So yeah. that's pressure on ourselves because we need to work hard to make our product simple mm -hmm. so that the administrative side becomes compressed and so that we work harder in the investment around health outcomes and health relationship. So how many call centres do you now have? Uh, we've, uh, we have two, one in Wollongong, the AHM call centre, and, yeah. and the major one in Melbourne. We have a sub-service membership services group in Brisbane, Yep. Uh, but the principal hub, if you like, is in the Melbourne Docklands call centre. And on notice, can I get the data on how many staff there are in each of those call centres? Uh, I think we've got about 250 people in call right. centres. Um, most of them will be in Melbourne. And we have about 500 staff in retail, still have around 100 locations in retail. Right. We remain committed to be physical as well. Yep. Uh, we don't want to withdraw from our presence in terms of access and physical location. And the publicity signage of having the name up in the streets and shopping centres, so yep. that, that part. Yep. Okay, the other thing I want, and also the general government services, and I know you're not a government agency, they're looking at that, that online aspect of people using it. That's right. Do you have any um, way of knowing whether people are accessing you by iPad, iPhone, or that mechanism? There's been a lot of push recently that people who get the other kind of equipment are more likely to actually access services in a mobile way. Look, I'm pretty sure our IT people have those have, have the ability to discern the methodology, the, the nature of the okay. contact. I don't have that information, no, I can I could, take that on notice. It's more of a general interest I have, but it's just there's been a general promotion about um, people interacting with government services, be it yourself, human services, yep. uh, other areas. And I'm interested about this iPad, iPhone thing, which I don't do, but um, that I know it's being promoted. Um, the travel doctor service. Um, I know that got the, um, the process that you had a couple of years ago in promoting that and actually getting, again, information about what's going on overseas so that people who are looking at it will use your service, the travel doctor, to find out hot spots and right. what they should have. Do you have any data on the access of that? I don't on me, but I can That'd be good. Uh, bring back to you the, I can, on notice uh, the volumes of traffic in terms of inquiry. Yep. So if I'm travelling to Vietnam, what vaccination do I need or yep, protection? Exactly. Uh, and, uh, and we run a service of registering the vaccination, mm -hmm. so it's age tested in terms of record and mm -hmm. we can prompt you for repeat, etc. So that, that's the nature of their service. We're, we're working on trying to get more of that travel doctor service into a virtual space because it's yeah. physically constrained so that you can actually have the injection mm -hmm. uh, and that constraints You can't the do that growth. online, Mr. So that you, Not so at the so moment. Yeah. It'll probably happen one day. Do you know how much of the market you've got with the travel doctor service? No, I don't. Yeah. So, uh, we, we, we are probably the largest branded yeah. uh, travel vaccination company in, the, in, yes, in Australia, yes. but um, it's still a relatively small organisation. And also, do you have links um, with your service with um, phone affairs in terms of information sharing? Um, one of the issues that we've raised in another context is the still low level of Australians travelling overseas who actually advise um, through the, the Travel Safe Service and actually advise um, DFAT that they're going to go to a place. They only tend to contact DFAT when they're in trouble and it can be quite serious trouble. Right. So is there anything in your service with the travel doctor that actually links through to uh, that site that people can actually link on to the, um, the travel service? It probably service? is in the customer information that we provide because we provide little booklets and mm -hmm. information about health and sickness when you're travelling, etc. Um, we do run the, um, uh, the uh, visa health checks yep. for the Department of Immigration for people inbound. Yep. Uh, that's been a long-term contract that Health Services Australia had before we acquired them. Yes. Um, so that there is a very strong years. relationship with uh, DFAT. Yeah. So I'm, I'm once again looking at the access and the easy access about whether there's that easy click that if they're looking at your services for the things they have to do in terms of health that they'd be an automatic click to click, uh, click to get them into the immigration area. Could, yep. No, DFAT area, which it's really sensitive. And I've just got one other area, and that's to do with the Special Purpose Fund. Oh, Maybe. yes. Can you give us some information on the Special Purpose Fund and how yes, it's, it's, and it's, what run, yeah. it's run out of money. Um, so it was part of the handover of the AHM acquisition. That's right, yeah. And uh, we committed to um, deliver the intent of the fund, which is to ensure that those monies gathered and collected mm -hmm. would go to the um, 
uh, community organisations that were doing research on health. That's right. So we made those commitments to those organisations mm -hmm. and we ran the dollars through until we completed the fund and then, and then we closed the fund down. Okay, so that, I just, it's just no longer there. That's right, right. and the board that was operating... Because it was, was part of the transition, wasn't it? It was. It, it was, was an obligation that we had yeah. in the acquisition of AHM. And, Chair, I am wrong. I've got one other couple of questions. It's that's fine. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. Um, uh, the volunteering program that you run, I've been within your organisation with encouraging um, staff members within your your organisation to volunteer. There's a number of special areas that you've mentioned that are a couple on your, your process, a number of particular um, organisations that you prefer as sponsored areas. Can you tell me how people get in there and do they drop off? Um, in terms of, it's just in a lot of areas now people are talking about how difficult it is to um, attract organisations like yours with a big network to become a sponsoring organisation. How are the decisions made about which organisations your volunteering mm. support is provided mm. and how is that actually worked through your staff? Is it, yeah. What does it do? Because it's a very, I might, you've talked to me before about what a very popular scheme it is mm. within your organisation and I'd like to know what, how many people are working in it now. So the Minibank Community Fund uh, yep. draws a half a percent of our profits every year to fund the community uh, grants that we are undertake. Yep. The, the mission of the community fund is aligned with our purpose for better health. So it's in, it has a th uh, two or three areas of uh, category. Mm -hmm. um, it identifies community groups that promote better health. How is that done? Uh, well, that we get uh, submissions and they sure. ask us to fund this particular activity. Mm -hmm. It also, um, it has another theme about community connectedness because social connectedness is a, a health determinant. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we look for, um, we don't actually have to look for them, we, we get plenty of applications. Um, and so the monies are uh, divided, I think, three ways. Um, Smith family, because they identify yep. uh, families within community that have economic challenge, mm -hmm. and their job is to get the children through school, and so we work with them, and we have volunteers working with them as well. Yep. Uh, and that's that connectedness piece. Um, we also have the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Program that yes. goes to primary schools around Australia. Yep. And uh, we've sponsored uh, that group. They're growing in terms of footprint. And as a sponsor, we're helping in that growth. They have other sponsors as well. That gives us great relationships at local school yeah. level uh, and to fly our sort of flag. But it's not a heavy promotional activity. It's more a community commitment. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece, there's around, uh, it's, I think, uh, more than 100 grants that we, we send out every year, obviously $5,000 denominations, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and we, get, we might get three, four, five hundred applications. We, we have an independent <coughs> panel from our community fund. They screen them. And then we uh, make a determination as to which organisation gets the grants. And then we issue them out and put that on our website. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a much broader group with lower dollars, but it keeps us connected and we're investing in community. But again, the theme is uh, better health, uh, focusing on the young, and also there's financially disadvantaged young as well with the Smith family component. Uh, just on that point, Mr. Savides, does uh, Medibank Private have a um, workplace giving program? Yes, it does. Yeah, so employees can make mm -hmm. a, um, a tax-effective contribution to a panel of our um, charities and, and groups that we're associated with, and we we match it dollar for dollar. Can you give us um, an idea of the quantum of contributions? I can bring that on notice. Yeah, Thank I'm happy you. to bring that back. Yeah. And that's out of the same bucket. No, that's a is that's a separate, a separate bucket. Yeah. So the matching, because um, yeah. the matching program has been working, I know, for a long time within various branches. I just happen to know people who are involved, and there's an incentive for individuals within the the local branches or your administration to um, donate, and then mm. Medibank private matches up to five hundred. Is, is yeah, I think you're more up to date, Senator, than I am on the detail, but it sounds right. Yes, there was a cap on it. Yeah, um, well, understandably. It may change year on year, but. but uh, that sounds great. Right. Yeah. And that is a separate allocation to the, the community right. fund. And I'm interested in terms of the panel operation. How does it, how, is it an internal panel that you've determined through your organisation? That it is internal, mm -hmm. um, but we make sure that they're not associated with any of the sure. groups making the bid. Yeah. Uh, but it's certainly not myself sitting there stamping or whatever. It's a, we try to get um, health solutions, health insurance, right. state representation, some board members. Yep. Um, yeah, so it's a sort of a mixed group and they assess and adjudicate. They have a fixed framework of evaluation, so it's consistent. And now that comes a scoring system and then uh, you know, the, 
the top tier get allocated the funds. And yeah, you know, we, we always say to those who didn't achieve it, please come back next year and you know, mm -hmm. give them some advice around how uh, the positioning of the request might have fit our criteria more strongly than the original submission. And who, the um, people who are successful, are they all on your website that they can talk about? I think, yes, the, I think we do process? put them up there. And, um, is it, a it only happened just recently for the latest round, so right. it's quite fresh. Okay. And there, there's an annual report for our community fund as well, which is. And awesome. Is there information in your own annual report? I mean, in your own annual report about this? No, it's quite light because we go to the trouble of producing the separate report. But right. last time I spoke to our staff, I think they were going to bring the two together. Right, because yeah. it just makes yeah. makes sense. Okay. And the other thing, just in terms of geographic spread, because of your your network, um, the are the charitable involvement, is that actually also looked at from a geographic perspective? Yeah, it is. So yeah, we're a national organisation. In fact, part of our community fund contribution goes into New Zealand. We have 200 staff in New Zealand and a business there. We run the health line for the Department of uh, the Ministry of Health in New Zealand and some of their charities are recipients as well. I was just wondering about that, how that crossed the area. So um, I'll follow up if I've got any other questions. So thank yep. you. I just have one question which um, I'm not aware, but you're getting very much into um, uh, the digital um, movement. It, do you have an app um, for iPhones and such? For we do, yeah. yeah. You do? We okay. have a calorie balancer and a oh, symptom God. checker, and a, <laughs> so we play in that space. They're online. And you should get, we should all be on it. <laughs> I'm not going to make any comments about that. What does so, it cost? Minister? It's free. It's so, free. Yeah, it's so we free. can get the, free, we could, the whole committee can get the free calorie counting app. Counting the calories is not the issue, Minister. Counting them is not the issue. <laughs> I try not to count, it's too scary. Yeah, that's right. Are there any further questions? I have. Yes? Sorry, after, after Senator Moore, I just wanted to finish. The research on mental health is that, that you mentioned in your opening statement, is that available on your website? We have a report which I can make available that, to you. That'd be great. I'd really yeah, like to look at that. Yep. Thank you. Any further questions? Mm -hmm. Minister, you yes, I did want to uh, close uh, the session of the estimates um, with uh, just to um, put on the record um, a couple of things. Um, uh, since the last estimates, um, I, and on the 15th of March, I announced the appointment of Ms Elizabeth Alexander AM as the chair of Medibank Private Limited. Um, Ms Alexander replaces uh, Mr Paul McClintock AO, who has served on the board since 2007. Uh, I want to place on record the government's thank to Mr McClintock, both as a director and as chair during that six year period, uh, and uh, for the professionalism he showed in steering Medibank through a, a period of great change. I also want to welcome Ms Alexander, uh, who is obviously a, bus a person, an Australian with a very extensive business and uh, non-business experience, uh, having been, for example, chair chairman of CSL Limited, chair of APRA's Risk and Audit Committee, uh, and uh, she has, amongst other things, and she's also been on the board since October 2008, so brings a wealth of uh, experience and longevity and uh, experience within the company as well. Um, uh, we are also consulting, as is appropriate, with the chair on, uh, I think there's a current vacancy? Yes, that's right. There's a current vacancy on the board, so I'm consulting with Ms Alexander, as is expected. I did also want the committee to know, at the time I uh, I think I became Finance Minister. Of the portfolio government business enterprises, there were none headed by a woman. Uh, we now have Medibank, NBN Co and More Bank out of the eight uh, who have woman, a woman as chair. Thank you very much. Mr Savitas, um, thank you very much. We look forward to Thanks, getting Senator. an update at the next accident. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Kim? We now go on to bringing back the Department of Finance and we're dealing with outcome two. Welcome back, Mr
Welcome back, Mr. Chun. We, we are now uh, dealing with outcome two, and I'm going to give the call to Senator Ryan, who still has a voice this morning. Just, uh, thank you, Mr. Chun. I've got a question which may be outcome one, and I appreciate it, but your technical expertise might be able to answer it. Drop my doubts. If not, I understand <laughs> that you can't. Um, go. And I'll put it on notice. Um, or it could even be for Treasury. Um, so we're going back to budget, are we? Yeah, I've just got I have one question I forgot to ask. Right. And I'm trying to ask this technical question, but well, and I said if I you have sent budget people. Yeah, I realise that, and so that's why I prefaced what I said. But uh, I'm calling on Mr. Chun's expertise; he may be able to help with. Um, on um, in budget paper number one, on sheet nine seven, I'm interested in the question of a component of the government's balance sheet. Listed under assets is a category called investments, loans, and placements. So which page? Uh, nine nine seven. seven, budget paper one. Nine seven. Yeah, nine seven. I'm happy to put in. I said, if you can't answer it, I'll just put it. Yeah, we'll give it a shot. Um, but. Um, under assets, there is a category called investments, loans, and placements, which is estimated to be 103.278 billion in 2012-13. Um, what I'm interested in is sort of the composition, not by to the dollar of this uh, category. Note 14 on page 926 of Budget Paper 1 indicates that part of this amount is deposits, which makes sense. I mean, are those government deposits held at the RBA? Um, yes, I think that's correct, but Dr Helgerby might be able to add more to that. Um, so did I, uh, Stein Helgerby, Deputy Secretary, Governance and Resource Management Group. Could we take it on notice? Yeah, sure. Think, sure. Yeah. Um, so this is. Sorry, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Yep. So no, no, the line item in table two, I, nine I'll, seven. I'll, yeah, I've got a. Um, I actually, I've got a, a brief in front of me. I don't have the sheet. So, so it's nine seven. That's where we started. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there'll be a line item in assets, investments, line and placements, yes. and then the note fourteen on, to the bottom at nine twenty six. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, so and there's that question. Um, it also, um, the same note says that another part of the funds uh, are the funds Australia is linked to the IMF, which makes sense. Um, but then it lists a large other category covering other items, which is around $70 billion, I understand. Yep. Um, uh. Is it possible to understand what that other $70 billion consists of? Yeah, we'll take that on notice. We, we might okay. be able to get back to you before lunch, Senator, if we can. We'll yeah, sure. It, if not, um, we'll so just to give you a heads up of the couple of the sub-questions yeah. I was going to follow up with, uh, because I assume um, part of it could be cash in the future fund. I'm not um, sure if that's no, going to be no, 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 okay. no, that's separate. Um, is another part of it the cash balances of the other nation-building funds that, that we heard about last night, um, so, which we've got the numbers given yeah. to us last night? And if not, sort of, you know, what else is in there in that okay. 70 billion? But I appreciate right. you don't have the information handy. Uh, thank you for your understanding. Um, now, in outcome two, um, is this, or would you prefer to deal in outcome three with questions about the relocation of the Sydney CPO? I'm never sure if it's procurement or maps, but I'm happy to go in either place. It's right. actually in maps, the It's route. actually the, the Sydney CPO. Uh, okay. Am I right there? Hold on. It, I know the running of the facilities under maps. I wasn't sure if the procurement yeah. of the facility yeah. was under Deal maps. Deal outcome three, please. For sure. This Happy to. Um, Should be, I suppose. Sorry, it, it may. I just want to just. We'll take it on notice. There may be some future fund in that other. Yeah, I thought the, this is the, the cash component to the future this fund is might the GGS. have been. GGS. Anyway, we'll take that on notice. Yeah, come back to it. It sits within the GGS. Yeah, it might be um, too. Okay, so if I could now turn to other outcome two, I just want to. Um, uh, talk about some um, ICT issues, if I could. Sure. Um, in relation to, I mean, we're getting to the point now where there are many new government websites, and this is a, an ongoing uh, issue, I think, for many governments, state and federal. Um, what strategies and steps are taken to maintain legacy websites? For example, pe people might be looking a, a program might have changed. Uh, or if I could think, for example, there was the nation building plan, which we've discussed in this committee at a great length, yeah. that would now be a legacy website. What steps are taken to maintain legacy websites? I've noticed on one of them it says uh, 
when I was looking up local government recognition today, it said a little badge on it. This website's no longer maintained. It's kept here for archive purposes. Is there a strategy in place around this? Because I imagine it's getting to be a bigger and bigger issue. Yeah, you're probably right, Senator. Um, I'm not sure. Well, agencies are largely responsible for their own uh, websites and the content okay. on them, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Archer might be able to add some, something further. Uh, Glenn Archer, uh, First Assistant Secretary in uh, GMA. Um, Senator, essentially, um, Mr. Tune is correct. It is very much a matter of responsibility for agencies to uh, maintain legacy websites where there are uh, issues of policy that continue to be relevant to them um, or to uh, eventually archive those if they're um, uh, no longer current. Sure. So, is there a, I know you have policies on accessibility, for example, yep. and we'll move to policies on mobile websites in a minute. Yep. Um, do you have a policy to which government agencies are bound with respect to archiving websites so that information is accessible? Let's say, for example, I wanted to go back and look at the information the government had, and it had a Google Maps feature on nation building website with the school halls. Um, you know, is there a policy requiring um, agencies to maintain those or to? Uh, Senator, we're not uh, trying to oblige agencies to go back um, uh, into time uh, uh, to um, add accessibility to a broad range of websites. Some agencies, where, where the data continues to be relevant, um, there is effort being put in, into that. So, uh, and certainly following machinery of government changes, uh, departments will often undertake significant effort to, to bring up to date um, uh, past websites and to make them accessible. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't clear enough. I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not suggesting you make past websites more accessible with the modern standards. I'm more thinking of websites that were relevant at one time that might not be relevant to current policy anymore, yep. but that are relevant for research purposes or someone doing an assignment or for to compare current policy to, for example, um, but it might be an expired program. Is there a policy around, you know, maintaining accessibility of, uh, uh, sorry, maintaining websites Access. being live? I suppose. Yes. Is it? Might I help my colleagues, yes. Senator? <laughs> sure. Uh, right. John right. Sheridan, First Assistant Secretary, Technology and Procurement Division. Um, the National Archives has a policy about archiving websites, and it's it's explained on their website, and it talks about doing so at particular trigger points and how to do it. So the, there is a policy that exists. Okay. And so agencies just live live by the National Archives. That's policy. correct, Senator. Yes. That's different to the National Library's Pandora's Box program, isn't it? I think. Uh, it may well be, yeah, yes, sure. Senator. Just making sure I don't get confused. Oh, Common National Libraries Program. They also, I think it's called Trove, um, which um, uh, stores information uh, for past websites. Um, now, can I turn to mobile websites? Sure. We've had a discussion before about mobile websites, and a number of larger government agencies were, you know, working on them, uh, and a policy that the that AGMO was coming up with to try and get the government online, particularly with the increasing use of tablets now, uh, but as well as iPhones and, and things. And I think we had issues with the ATO not being particularly accessibly on a mobile thing about a, uh, a year a year ago. Can you provide an update as to where AGMO is on a policy with government mobile websites? So, Senator, yes, we did discuss this at the last estimates and I uh, indicated then that the, um, the strategy was going forward uh, for consideration by the Secretary's uh, Governance Board um, that process has been completed, the strategy um, has been finished uh, and we are, uh, the release of it is, is imminent. Uh, okay. Um, is that, when it's released, is it released publicly? It will be released publicly, absolutely. Uh, Senator, I did touch previously on, I guess, the core components of that strategy, um, the fact that we're looking to uh, ensure that um, government uh, websites or appropriate websites uh, are, are mobile enabled, um, i.e. that they support um, access uh, from mobile devices uh, and that they do so in a, in, in a more effective way. Um, and, uh, and in relation to the use of mobile technologies by, the, by public servants in, in uh, improving the way in which they are able to do their jobs and deliver services uh, better. Um, yeah. So that, that continues to be the core, as it were, of the, of the strategy. Um, so will, will the, um, does this policy require that, uh, does it have particular benchmarks? Well, I understand, for example, 
as you are slowly rolling out a mobile website strategy, because there's a bit of incoherence you know, at the moment across the government. Some agencies are very good, some aren't, aren't so flash. Um, are there particular trigger points for traffic or for when websites are redesigned, for example? And the reason I ask this is that um, the National Mental Health Commission, um, until June last year, had a contract out for website design. It's for over $30,000. It's not a particularly surprising amount for a large agency, but it doesn't have a mobile capacity, and that's quite recent. And so do you have trigger points on uh, traffic? Well, it's hard to guess before you built it, I suppose, uh, but also when something's rebuilt? So, Senator, using the word policy is probably overstating the, okay. um, uh, the, the document. Um, it is it's, it's essentially a, a roadmap that outlines a sort of two-year action plan for agencies um, to kind of assist them in the adoption of mobile technologies for, for both that sort of customer-facing uh, service delivery component and also to support workplace um, and workplace productivity. So the policy isn't just for the users, it's actually going to be for the agency itself to roll out mobile devices for its own use? It's going to be to able to support, uh, to, to give guidance to agencies around how to make good use of mobile technologies in the workplace. Um, in our previous discussions, we've only really been talking about, my concern is from the user end, that I, I still that. go to yeah. various web, government websites on an iPad and they don't work properly, and on an iPhone they don't work properly, um, let alone a Blackberry, but not much seems to work well on a Blackberry. Um, the, and I'd be concerned I mean, if, you know, if the, the, the action plan, to use your words, became, was more focused on rolling out mobile devices inside an agency than making the websites accessible uh, for those seeking the service. No, not, not for a moment, Senator. It's okay. absolutely, it, 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 there is a balance because we see that there is opportunities on both sides, but certainly it doesn't, um, you know, place a greater emphasis on that. I'd have to say, Senator, um, it, it, it's not as though uh, the fact that we haven't yet released um, uh, the strategy uh, or the roadmap uh, uh, is holding agencies back. We've seen uh, many agencies uh, already release quite powerful and um, uh, quite effective uh, mobile uh, applications. In fact, uh, uh, just uh, yesterday um, we gave an award to um, Department of Human Services for their uh, Centrelink Express applications because they are, they have been so successful and and uh, um, and have uh, enor enormous uh, take up and interest from their um, customers. Are there particularly um, agencies that agonise of the view um, are sort of at the leading edge of uh, that are doing very well, and others that, without condemning them, um, are. <laughs> Uh, are probably touched behind the curve or could learn from some of the better agencies. Uh, and, and indeed, that you're touching on a point that we have, uh, where we look at it within the roadmap, and that is the degree to which some agencies can learn from others. I guess, um, you know, if I look at three agencies that certainly have demonstrated um, uh, strong capability in this area, DHS, um, the Bureau of Statistics, um, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade with their Smart Traveller uh, mobile app, they come, they come to mind. I guess uh, other agencies which, uh, which are perhaps um, more uh, challenged would be those agencies that have a, a, great, a, a large number of programs, and so they need to consider how they are going to address mobile across those, those program ranges. And of course, they also may not have the same volume of, of users. Sure. Um, when it's released publicly, could you just provide a copy to the committee so it can be circulated? Absolutely, Absolutely Senator. Thank you. Um, I think Senator Coleman's got something to I have Due to be released very, very short. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, very short. I'm not saying take it on notice, just whenever it goes out. Are you going to go to a different area? Because I'd like to ask some questions about IT. Sure, you go for it. Yeah. Right. Um, we saw where uh, Minister Conroy released the National Cloud Computing Strategy yesterday, which I understand finance had a role in developing. Um, this is a, a new concept for, for most people, and I was wondering if you could outline the key elements of this strategy. In, in some detail, and the concept behind um, clouding, and what that's actually going to mean to departments. Uh, okay, uh, Senator, I might just take that from two perspectives. First of all, in relation to the to the strategy released by um, Senator Conroy yesterday, this is very much a, a, a broad view of of the degree to which cloud uh, can deliver benefit uh, to to the nation uh, and to the nation's productivity. Um, through uh, through uh, high speed broadband being broadly available, uh, obviously through the NBN, uh, uh, to deliver uh, new services for 
for certainly for government, but also for small, uh, medium business, for community organisations. Um, the National Cloud Computing Strategy has, has three um, primary roles, maximising the value uh, that cloud can provide uh, to government. And, and when I say to government, in terms of how government uses cloud also um, to provide services to citizens. Um, to uh, promote uh, the use of cloud uh, to small businesses, uh, not-for-profits uh, and, and to consumers. And also to look to see whether we, where we can support a, a vibrant um, cloud services sector. So um, looking at um, you know, Australia's place um, in, in the world as a, as a trusted uh, cloud provider, uh, making sure that there's uh, appropriate competition and investment um, uh, in cloud. So that's, that's kind of the three pr primary aims of the uh, National Cloud Computing Strategy. Um, uh, yes, we, we did work quite closely uh, with uh, broadband in the development of, of the strategy, uh, recognising that there was a significant uh, component of it that dealt with, uh, with government and that uh, Azimo ultimately would have to provide guidance and support to agencies in the implementation um, of that component. Uh, the, um, uh, the government uh, component looks at um, how we can increase the use and adoption of cloud technology uh, within, within government and do so in a way that um, uh, understands or addresses uh, the, the usual risks that exist in cloud. Um, and the one that's often always, oh, sorry, just almost always uh, raised, of course, is the issue of security and privacy. Um, and it does so by looking at where there are opportunities to use um, public cloud for data that is not um, typically subject to that sort of concern. So, for instance, we're going to oblige agencies to move their public-facing websites um, to have them hosted uh, in public cloud. And we can do that because public-facing cloud, uh, public-facing websites are, by their very nature, data that you want um, the general public uh, to be able to access. Uh, cloud has, by its very nature, uh, much better support um, for um, variations in demand, for the, you know, the spike in, 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 in access that may be needed uh, to support particular information needs for, for citizens. Um, uh, secondly, we'll be looking to um, uh, have agencies move their, their testing and their development um, IT infrastructure into the cloud environment. Uh, this, um, again, this is an area where, at the moment, agencies have to invest in their own testing and development infrastructure. That might be storage and servers and, and, and processing capacity. Uh, and uh, in, in the context of developing some new system and in testing it, cloud um, is, is a perfectly sensible way to, to go because you actually only want to have access to that capability for a short period of time. And also, it, testing in the cloud is quite valuable in the sense that you can, you can stress test it, uh, whereas often to do that within an agency, you need to buy a lot of equipment to be able to, uh, to, to undertake that sort of testing. Can you just um, explain to the committee what cloud is? I mean, I, I understand and appreciate um, what you've, you've told us about the strategy, but... <laughs> <laughs> I've got to see if Glenn, uh, Mr. Archer, can do it in you know one sentence or. Less. I mean, I know what what cloud is. I have a, a concept of what it is, and I'm sure other committee members would be most interested. It's one thing to put it up in cloud, uh, but it's about how you retrieve it as well. But if you could just put on the record um, what cloud is, that you know. Uh, that would be most helpful. And I would probably uh, set a record, Senator, because the, the, you know, trying to define cloud in, in one sentence or, uh, has been something that many marketing uh, folks and, uh, have tried for many years, but I'll, I'll, I'll give a go. But I'll, I'll, I'm suggesting, if it's okay with the committee, that we'll just conclude this um, segment and then we'll uh, go to our break, if that's all right. What do you mean this segment? Uh, just uh, just the on the IC, IT, IT stuff. Well, I've, I've still cloud. got stuff oh, yeah, on IT stuff. stuff. But no, I've got IT stuff. All right. Well, do you want how about now? we have a break now? Well, you can sure. think about you, your explanation. <laughs> very timely. <laughs> very timely. So we'll stand adjourned until quarter to 11. There's a bit of pressure, but... No pressure, right. You're not allowed to be pressed by IBM if you can't do your Right. Before we uh, commence with um, this education on clouding, uh, can I just uh, advise um, that we will be, we've changed the agenda and we will be taking the lunch break today between 1 and 2 p.m. 
So uh, we'll keep going through until one o'clock, just so that officers are aware of that. Okay, now, <coughs> Mr Archer, you have the call. Thank you, Senator. Um, so uh, during the break, I've uh, had a go at trying to draft what I think is a simple explanation of what cloud is, and, and uh, I, have, uh, I have a couple of options, actually. So um, fundamentally, cloud provides uh, services uh, to users over the internet where the IT infrastructure in terms of storage and computing capacity is shared. Um, so that's, that's one definition. Perhaps it's often more easily understood um, when trying to describe uh, cloud by pointing to examples of cloud. And some well-known uh, examples of cloud would include things like Google Maps, uh, Apple's uh, iTunes uh, service, uh, Microsoft's uh, Hotmail service, um, Amazon's services, these sorts of things which many of us have used day, day to day now uh, are classic examples of cloud services. Okay, thank you uh, for that. I'm sure that'll be helpful for all committee members. There are risks though, is there uh, not in terms of using cloud storage? And I was just wondering um, how that's been managed, what the processes will be, because it, you know, it is something still fairly new. Senator, I think uh, we, we have quite mature uh, legislation and, and regulation that, that um, protects uh, government information and, and the interest of, of citizens in terms of um, their, their own privacy. Um, so the Privacy Act, um, the Protective Security Policy Framework, uh, the Australian Government's Information Security <coughs> Manual, um, these provide um, uh, significant guidance around uh, the use of cloud um, from the perspective of, of, the, of, of understanding what are the risks that may be associated with, uh, with the information. Um, agencies are required to comply with that legislation and regulatory framework and to protect the interests of, of government and of Australian citizens and businesses. Um, the current uh, policy uh, which uh, in place um, is that we do not store sensitive or personal information in a public cloud environment inside or outside of Australia. Uh, the Defence Signals Directorate advice to agency recommends uh, against outsourcing information technology services and functions outside of Australia unless agencies are dealing with data that is all in the, in the public domain. Um, so the, I, I guess, um, so that's, that's the current state of play. Uh, I should say that we are currently examining uh, these issues and looking to, uh, obviously in the context of uh, uh, ensuring that we protect government information and citizens' information when using the cloud and we are working towards um, uh, pr uh, being able to provide agencies with some further clarity um, and guidance in this area. In relation to this new technology, um, was there any consultation with any other governments um, internationally with their experience in this area? Senator, we've certainly spoken to other governments about cloud generally and the benefits associated with it. Um, obviously, we've uh, uh, discussed issues about um, different um, um, uh, privacy regimes in different countries. So there have been some discussions. So is this um, becoming um, more common in terms of how other governments are, around the world are, are using uh, technology? Certainly cloud adoption by government um, is becoming uh, qu quite common um, in, in certainly most of the OECD countries, for instance. Uh, and uh, the same issues that, um, that concern us also concern those countries. So would it be fair to say um, that the rollout of the MBN um, is fairly critical um, in terms of the speed to assist with cloud servicing? Uh, certainly the rollout of the NBN, access to high speed broadband is fundamental to cloud services. Um, uh, it's, it's just uh, a, a requirement that if you're going to be able to access uh, a cloud service and you are in a, you know, in a city that's remote from where that's physically located or in a rural um, or country location, um, having access to high speed broadband will be the difference between the, the service actually um, functioning uh, well, functioning poorly, or not functioning at all. Okay. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. 
Um, one of your responsibilities, and I mean, you've touched on it to a degree, but one of your responsibilities on the outcome too is to provide secure communication networks for ministers, senior executives, uh, and agencies. Given some of the recent, <laughs> you're smiling. No, that's okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so, in light of recent reports about attempted penetration of government uh, departments and agencies, secure uh, communications, can you just talk us through uh, what you're uh, doing? Uh, to deal with um, the increasing uh, threat levels uh, in, in relation to uh, security of communications between agencies, ministers and so on? Um, thanks, Senator. John Sheridan, First Assistant Secretary, Technology and Procurement Division. Um, the whole of government networks that we provide are secured in the way determined by or directed by the Defence Security um, Seek Defence Signals Directorate, so we meet the requirements of the mm -hmm. Information Security Manual. Those networks are certified, audited, certified, and accredited regularly, um, in, as required by those um, by those arrangements. And that's how we make sure they meet um, the requirement. So, so, so they set the standards, but in terms of uh, ICT protection measures, I mean, are these types of services that are provided by your department, or are you contracting them out, or is this uh, on an individual department by individual department basis, how, how does it how does it work in practice? So finance provides some whole of government services. The um, Icon network, the fibre optic network that runs around Canberra. We provide the ministerial communications network that runs around the country. Um, we provide the telepresence network that sits on top of the ministerial communications network. Um, those are um, secure services uh, and. Other departments have other services. What do you not provide? So, what, so, so can you just list what you do not provide? Um, well, I think it's probably easier to list what I provide. Yeah. Um, so, so there's a lot that's excluded. Uh, agencies provide their own communications, okay. their own networks. Um, indeed, the department itself, the, uh, my colleague, the CIO in the department, provides the networks within finance. We, my division provides whole of government networks. The link between a minister's office and his or her department is provided by the agency concerned. Yeah. And John's area is providing the other things that are sit at the top of that. Do you have any role at all in terms of making sure that you know these protocols that are set by the Defence Signals Directorate are set up properly complied with? So my, my personal role is as the delegate of the secretary as the accrediting authority for the whole of government networks and systems my division provides. So you don't play a role in terms of individual departments, security no, I do, communications? No, I do not, Senator. Um, so, I mean, okay, so you've told us what the sort of, uh, you know, the, the protocols are and so on, but in terms of your actual activities in recent years, can, can you just talk us through what you have practically done in terms of increasing the level of security of uh, government communications that you're responsible for? So we, we do what DSD tells us to do. Yeah. So, so, what, so, what, exactly. so what have you done? So, so, so there are a range of controls <coughs> that, are in, that DSD puts in place um, and rec either recommends or um, probably de determines more um, strongly that they should be in place. We make sure those controls are in place. They can talk about um, things as um, uh, sort of prosaic as access to buildings, yeah. but they can also talk about the structure of firewalls and gateways, um, those sorts of things. So, so I mean, is, is it fair to say that this is an area where there's been uh, increased effort in recent years, given of increased threat levels? Uh, I, I think it would be fair to say, um, Senator, that agencies, including our own, review the threat level with information provided by DSD and react accordingly. So has there been increased effort? I think it's a fair comment. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, is there an estimate in, in, around the cost involved in terms of to quantify that increased effort involved? We don't have such figures, <coughs> Senator. So, so who manages the budget for increased security efforts? So we don't get allocated the budget with that particular thing in mind. We get operating budgets for the various um, networks we provide. So, so to the extent that there was increased effort, you've essentially absorbed that within existing that's, resources, is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so, so you are looking at whole of government, you're looking at sort of, to a degree, well, you're looking at communication between your department and the minister's office. Uh, is there anyone that coordinates across all of the Commonwealth public service, the uh, arrangements 
uh, to ensure that security of communications is at the appropriate standard? I mean, who actually yeah. coordinates it across <coughs> all so, of the departments of the public service? So the Attorney General, uh, the Attorney General's department sets the protective security policy framework. Yeah. The Defence Signals Directorate provides the information security yeah. manual um, yeah. directions and guidelines that sit under the PSPF um, and agency um, chief executives and their delegates accreditation authorities ensure that those things are put in place. So who monitors compliance? Like that's the responsibility of individual secretaries of departments, yeah. is it? Indeed. Yeah. Um, so there is no central coordination as such, it's an agency by agency proposition? No, there's a central... Uh, there's as, there's as a Mr. policy, described, yeah. <coughs> but, but there's no central coordination of To ensure that that happens? Yeah. Uh, no. Well, to the extent that AGD have got overriding yeah. coordination responsibility, it, it rests with them. Senator, I, I've, I have a responsibility under the Public Service Act and these other requirements to actually comply with these things. So. Yeah. Senator, I just want to add one um, uh, element to that. Um, so I, I manage the coordination and advice to government on new, on new investments in ICT. Uh, we explicitly look to examine that issues around cyber security are considered in, in those proposals as they're put forward. And uh, we provide uh, guidance to agency where we think that there's additional effort required before those um, those proposals um, should go forward for further uh, consideration. Yeah. Now, in relation to the Canberra uh, fibre network, uh, which serves as a public sector, you mentioned the ICON intra-government communications network. Uh, presumably, there are uh, incursion vulnerabilities. Uh, I, I gather that finance is doing work uh, to reduce the number of gateways uh, into government networks. Can, can you just talk us through that to the extent that you can? Um, yes, I can, Senator. Um, one of the policies that my um, division is responsible for is the redu reduction of internet gateways. That's a policy to reduce the number of gateways from over 100 to some eight gateways across um, government by consolidating the gateway arrangements um, and thus reducing the vulnerability. That's it? Nice and concise? Well, I mean, that's what the policy is, yes, indeed. Okay. That's what we're doing. That's good. That's good. Now, in terms of point-to-point -point data transmissions, presumably uh, encryption technology has been deployed to protect information from interception. Chris Dale, uh, Government Network Services Branch. Point-to-point um, -point encryption is, is a matter for the agency uh, using the ICON network specifically. ICON itself as an entity is rated at a protected level from, for communications from point-to-point, -point, so no additional encryption would be required to achieve protected level end-to-end -end communications. Should an agency require an additional uh, level of, of national security across that point-to-point uh, -point link, they may take the option of encrypting data. So there is no encryption technology deployed across the entire public network? Not on, limited to the ICON network? Um, no, there is not. It's a passive network. Is that something that should occur? Like, is that something that's being looked at as, I mean... Um, it's a, a, again, it, we've taken the decision to, to rate protected, which is the, uh, which is the we, we secure through, um, uh, through non-encryption methods and, and physical protection methods. Um, the handoff is a business decision for the agency at hand whether they need something further than... So but does the agency at hand have the sort of expertise to, to be able to make those judgments? Well, really? they, know, they know when they can use the ICON network and when they've got something with a higher security yeah. level, they have to go outside that. Um, so there's always a trade-off in these things. You can build a thing sure. to a you know, very high standard for the common usage, or you can have a separate arrangement, and uh, the separate arrangement is usually for secret, top secret sort of material, not worth the candle to, uh, to upgrade your, your basic level system to do that. Just to be clear, Senator, on the ICON network, as um, my colleague was explaining, we provide the connections for agencies, but they can use that network for higher classifications by putting encryption devices at either end of the cable, the, the connection we provide them, and that has the effect of encrypting um, that channel. Okay. Um, now, now, moving on from IT, unless somebody else... I think there's got... some more yep. questions there. Okay. Oh, yes, Senator Moore. I'm not quite sure, Mr. Tune, who, to whom I address the question. It's about the oh. telepresence Mr. network. Mr. Sheridan can help you. Hello, how are you? Um, we've had answers before about the rollout 
of this facility. We've, most of us, I think, have actually used it at some time. I'd like to get some updates about where in the actual rollout it's at. Are we fully um, implemented? And also the data that you can give us about um, the savings that it's caused, because it's something we talk about all the time. So. Um, okay. Since 2009, uh, the National Telepresence System has hosted 2,805 meetings. This is to March this year. Um, we've got a calculated deferment of uh, travel savings of 51, uh, more than $51 million, uh, and 10,000 tonnes of carbon that's not been attributed to government travel. Um, the system itself was, uh, uh, is, consists of what we call immersive rooms, which you, you point out you've used yourself. They are, um, they are function specific facilities where you enter a room, a meeting room, you book them online and, uh, and take part of that meeting. To date, that uh, covers 38 sites. Um, the in, announced in the budget uh, recently was $19.3 million of additional funding. Yep. This is to take the footprint or the, the reach of the National Telepresence uh, Network uh, up to 150 sites right. um, uh, from the 38. That, that work is scheduled over the next 12 months. Um, the funding exists over the four years to operate the network as well. Right. The, we will be uh, the the 150 additional sites uh, use uh, the ministerial communications network that exists, and the intent is to replace voice communication uh, handsets that are, okay. that currently exist and are rated uh, the national security level to secret for communications with video facilities that are, will, will not only operate interoperate with the existing. Uh, 38 sites, mm -hmm. um, uh, but also allow ad hoc and point-to-point -point connections. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the geographical spread of those sites? All of Australia. All of Australia, yes. including TI? Yes. So, yeah. And I would imagine um, areas. What about places like Christmas Island and Manus? Uh, there hasn't been a call at this point to, for the system of okay. that island. But it could physically, this, could this physically process be could do. Yes. And what about the operating costs in terms of how that compares with other, other processes, just how much the, um, the system costs to operate? Uh, certainly, Senator. Um, give me a second. The, um, the original operating, uh, the existing operating costs were around, uh, I'm just looking at the numbers, around 1.4 million a year right. uh, to operate. Um, and that was in out of the initial MIFO estimates mm -hmm. for uh, the, the first system. In the new, new version, I'll just get the breakdowns. Um, we're operating at around uh, just under 3 million a year. Um, the Necessity of uh, existing of extending the geographical reach to 150 mm. uh, sites has actually put the uh, the headcount uh, or the, the effort required sure. uh, to to operate this system, and we're actually expecting quite a bit more uh, interaction from because we're adding the ad hoc function. Right. Okay. And the um, the number of people that can be involved in each um, meeting is that, are there limits to that? Uh, there are limits based on the physical room set. Uh, in fact, um, uh, some of our meetings have extended to. Uh, so up to 18 people in particular rooms, but it's getting crowded at that point. Okay. Uh, the 150 uh, are effectively personal desktop units. They okay. appear to be, they look like a personal computer monitor. Like this? Slightly larger then. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, um, you could certainly gather a few people around them and you can actually bring multiple people, multiple versions of them in to the, the same one. meeting. That, that was going to be my question in terms of just how it operates because, you know, the technology and the ability of teleconferencing has changed a lot. Mm. And I have to admit, I'm still focusing on how it was yep. a while ago and it wasn't great. So um, a link would go to the room or to the handset? Uh, it would go, uh, the, so the handset. The, not the handset, to the thing. <laughs> the link was, the handsets as they stand now right. will be replaced with a new monitor. Right, yes. okay, but yeah. the linkage would come to, the linkage would count from wherever it's going to this yeah. rather than to the whole room. Yes. So if a number of people wanted to have um, the machine, mm -hmm. that would be more than one link? Uh, we, we, we would deploy the, the desktop units probably into secure offices. So right. there would be uh, into people's offices, they'd be on people's desks okay. and or small facilities off, off, outside of offices. Yep. And if you've got multiple users in the That's one location, yep. you continue to use the existing system. <coughs> yeah, that, yeah, we don't intend changing the existing system. Or, or connect more of these desktop devices to a conference call. 
which would be right. the same so that would bring in the fact because it is difficult when you've only got one monitor with a number of people yeah. wanting to be involved. Um, recently, there was one where um, you had the one monitor and people had to keep shuffling around. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, yeah. So that's going to be able to not happen. So you could put it. You could, well, you could have it lo uh, located in the conference room, for example, mm -hmm. rather than an individual office, right. as long as you've got a clear connection to the MSN network, okay. and that will give you multiple users inside that room. So at the moment, the budget is covering the extension of the linkages to 150 sites, and the, full, the budget is fully funded for the fourth years coming up for the full operation of yes. however that op however that goes. That's right. Okay. Can, can, we, get a, Senator, can we get a copy of those sites? We won't. Would you be able to provide that information? As we to can provide that information. Yes. Yeah, Senator, may I mention that uh, although there is an investment in the budget uh, in the expansion of the telepresence network, it is um, an investment that is expected to be repaid over a short period of time through reduced travel expenditure. Sure. So the, um, the figures that we've got you gave us about what the savings have been up to date. Have there been um, presumptions of what uh, the savings will be into the future? It, we've done some presumptions. We are changing our calculation model because we're changing from room-based to personal-based, sure. but uh, we would estimate around $20 million in additional travel savings in the first 12 months. Yeah. Thank Senator you. Pratt, you have a follow-up question? Yeah, I wanted to ask um, how you were staying in touch with the smart services CRC in terms of some of the whether you were staying up to date with some of their activity around some of the new innovation in this kind of telepresence conferencing, including things like spatial voice, which allows um, groups to break away from each other and um, conduct conversations and that you can do that in a virtual way and um, uh, I assume that you know once this stuff becomes viable that government's actually going to have to rethink its meeting culture again in terms of how business is conducted because it's not just the technological change it's actually the cultural change if you like at a how we do business level that also needs to happen. Um, certainly, I'll just talk in, in, in context of the national telepresence system first. Yeah. Um, more than one video system exists across government, and uh, and the departments uh, uh, certainly have uh, started their own initiatives. Um, uh, the, the point for the national telepresence system is it, it, uh, it meets a business need and it has a national security rating to secret, which mandates right. that it can't have a uh, at today it can't have a, a connection to the outside world. So we can't do government to business relations. Um, that you might see in some of the more commercial aspects. However, the technologies that you mentioned mm -hmm. um, are certainly part of our consideration for the next generation of, of conferencing in, in the, uh, the 19.3 million in this, this budget. We'll be looking at the bringing our technology set up to date. Um, as I said, there's some limitations around both the physical room you can use, you can have a conversation up to up to secret in. Um, there's, mm. there's restrictions around that. And so that mobility and some of the technologies around spatial uh, awareness of voice is actually um, a, a bit of a challenge uh, in the secret space. However, um, I believe uh, uh, the other departments uh, uh, would be pursuing that. So we're not intending in this, this iteration to, um, uh, to extend to, to mobile devices or wireless devices. Um, at this stage, they still will be fixed and wired. Can, I, I can appreciate the security need to do that, but I, I guess at some point, in terms of the fact that you know we meet with the public and we have stakeholder engagements, um, mm -hmm. that to get true efficiencies out of that, we need to innovate around how we bridge that gap. Can yeah. you perhaps address that for me? Um, within the context of the National Federal Prison System, we, we're physically addressing that by bringing people into our suites and allowing access. So, so, uh, but. Further than that, we haven't got a technical solution to date. We are working on one. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Paul. Is there a link with other governments, like state governments in this area? Because um, I'm interested if you're in Queensland and you get called up. You've, state governments have got many more outlets across the state than we have. So what's the interrelationship with um, our network and what's happening in the various states? The the interrelation, we have outposts in all state offices, um, and uh, so you can access, the, the states can access the national teleprison system. Uh, the initial uh, business case around the national teleprison system in 2009 was centred around COAG requirements, yep. um, and that is extends, and it's probably the, one of the primary uses today. Right. Okay. So the, they are available in offices um, in the inside of the, the remit of the national teleprison network. Sure. 
Excellent. Any, anything further on, on, the, on IT? Okay. Actually, my question could be IT. Could be. Could Don't be, get excited. Don't be. move. I wanted to turn Centre to the, um, the web-based Australian Government Grant System. Is that in IT or is it? It's, it is. Oh, so, well, it's, 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 it's going to be IT based, yeah. yeah that's so. what I mean. So. We, we did have some questions yesterday yeah. on this, yes. Senator. Oh, okay. Who asked? Uh, because it was a budget um, measure. So yeah. I remember going I think it was, through it. it might have been Senator Moore. Moore. No. Yes, we did. No. Yes. All right, I'll <laughs> chase up. Senator Polly? Yes, I Government I Senator. All right, I'll really chase it up. Um, yeah. no, it's it's transparency, question. Senator, not All right, well, it was, uh, if it's been answered, just say answered, not checked. That's all right. Does this the, this particular um, web-based system that's going to decentralise the grants availability, does it allow for improved consolidated reporting as well? Like, does it capture the information to allow for... I know we've previously talked about grant systems going through different mechanisms. Yeah, OK. We can probably add to what we said yesterday. Sure. Um, yes, Senator. The system's based on the Tender system that we okay. use at the moment, so it does improve reporting. Based on Tender. OK. Oh, that answers questions I had. Thanks. Okay. I don't have anything more on IT. Senator Moore, I wasn't here, so I do apologise and say right. answered if you have. <coughs> One of the biggest claim issues we have with tenders is people who claim that they put something in mm. and it hasn't been received and, and all that kind of stuff. With this system, does it when you actually put your um, when you actually put your claim in, do you get a receipt of some kind, something that's physical to say that you've actually your process has been received, not just a just something to confirm so that there's no confusion about whether you got it in on time or not. Can I, can I just clarify, we haven't built the system no, yet, we've the just plan. received money in the I, budget to I do know, so, so it'll be a couple of years, about, it's but I plan. think your thought's a very good one that, uh, yeah, this will, this, you know, depending on how we build the thing, yeah. it could provide that capability, so it's a good, good just idea. Just that confidence element yeah. in the whole process. So we'll we'll take that on board, I think. I knew it wasn't there yet, I was yeah. just hoping it was in there. So okay, no, thank you. I've heard what you said. <laughs> Excellent. I think we might be moving on to new areas. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, just, um, I mean, not related to IT, but maybe related to the broader issue uh, around project expenses. Uh, can, can you provide an update on the cost incurred to date on finalising uh, the ASIO Central Office project? Cost to date? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I Senator, I might be able to help with that one. It's Greg Whalen, Acting First Assistant Secretary, Property and Construction Division. Just uh, pull up the, uh, the costing schedule I have here. In terms of the costings for the ASIO project, um, something I should make very clear up front because it's been misrepresented in the press uh, for, for a while now. Uh, back in August 2006, there was a proposal for the ASIO project that was approved by government and an appropriation of $460 million. That was based on uh, some preliminary estimates and it allowed us to actually then engage industry professionals to work through a planning phase and develop a concept design that was fully costed and to go back to government before any detailed design and construction was undertaken on the project. That, uh, that information, that proposal, went back to government on August, in August 2008. And it was uh, approved at that point in time that to provide the full functionality that was originally intended for the project, it would require $606 million. At that point in time, as I said, there was no detailed design, there was no construction undertaken, and <coughs> it was a point in time where the government could have made a decision not to proceed with the project and have minimal costs incurred. So that was the key decision point for this project in terms of budget. $606 million was approved. Shortly after that, ONA decided to, uh, to, to depart from the project as a subtenant, and the budget was adjusted to 580 million, I'll say that again, $588.7 million. And that, that adjustment occurred in May 2009. So for the purposes of what I'm about to explain in terms of the costings, in cost increase going forward, that is the basis by which the project is currently being uh, benchmarked. Yeah. In terms of the, uh, the increases in cost since then, the current uh, cost of the project uh, is $633 million. I'll say that again, $633 million. 
And so there has been a $44.3 million cost increase from the key decision point for the project. And in percentage terms, that's 7.5 per cent. So in terms of uh, media speculation about large cost blowouts, we have a 7.5 per cent increase in the approved budget for the project in terms of cost. So, so and just to remind me of the number, so 7.5 per cent blowout, and that is that's a 7.5% increase. <coughs> 588. 588. Yeah. Two. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, two, I'll, I'll just clarify. Yeah. So the approved amount was $588.7 million. Yeah. And it is the current cost of the project is $633 million. That's when, when is that the anticipated cost of completion or is that the cost yeah. to date? That's the uh, anticipated cost of completion. Yeah. Uh, we're very close to completing the project at the moment, and uh, it's, it is very tight, uh, but that, at this stage, that's what we're expecting to actually deliver it within. Yeah. And, okay, uh, the budget uh, for works in 2013-40, do you have a sp specific component in terms of, like, for 2013-40? For I don't think it actually appears yeah, in the... Uh, you're referring to a particular document or how much we're no, proposing no, no, to spend this asking, year? No, yeah, I'm just asking how much you're proposing to spend this year. Um, I'll take that question on notice if that's like... That, that's right, okay. Senator, I don't have that in front of me. But not, but not very much, Senator, because yeah. we're basically going to finish the thing by the June, end of June, we think, and then we've got a commissioning process handed over to ASIO yeah. to then do uh, their thing with it. Uh, just out of interest, uh, in, in light of recent uh, sort of, you know, publicly arisen <coughs> issues. What security checks are required for contractors working on the site? Uh, Senator, in relation to the security for the project, the security is a responsibility of ASIO. They provide the, uh, the standard and the oversight. And so in relation to questions of how security is managed for the site, uh, that's a matter that's best addressed to ASIO. Okay, no worries. Can now, I go back to your question, Senator, yeah. about how much is actually forecast to be expended on the project for uh, financial year 12-13? Was that your question? Was no, it 12-13? I asked 12-13-14. 13, 13, 14. 13, 14, 14. it's $17 million. And 12-13 was... It's nearly finished. You, oh. That's okay. Take it on, notice. Now, um, moving on to another project, uh, could you provide a costing of the work uh, completed and underway of the construction of the airport pavement on Cocos Island? Uh, we might have to take that one on notice. Yeah, we'll, we can get back to you about that one, Senator. Okay. Uh, um, and finally, in terms of projects, uh, can you provide us with an update on the cost incurred to date uh, on uh, refurbishing the lodge? Uh, we can, which is not very large. We, we're about to go out to tender uh, on that. Um, there's provision made for that in our budget, um, but I'd prefer not to talk about it because it might harm commercial negotiations. So we have a budget for it for the. So this is like work. So okay. So I thought it was already well no, underway. No, no, no it's, it's okay. No, no, there's been an agreement uh, across government uh, and uh, across the parliament. Yeah. I should say. But what is the expected time frame? For we'll, the start, we'll start. We'll um, start around. Uh, Senator, just the, the uh, as per the uh, former. Special Minister of State's uh, media release in December last year, uh, the works were, the refurbishment works, or the start on the construction of the refurbishment works was uh, delayed or deferred until late this year. And at the moment, uh, we're, we're finalising, uh, we're about to, we've actually started a tender process. Yeah. And so we will have a look at the programs that come forward from that. We're also working closely with uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet as the uh, responsible entity for the management of yeah. accommodation for the Prime Minister and, and staff at the Lodge to, uh, to arrive at an appropriate time to fit in with the tender or the, the preferred tenderer as to the start of the works. But at this stage, uh, the intention is to begin those works uh, later this year. So just, just at the moment, everything is business as usual at the Lodge? Is yeah, well, just, just to clarify, though, there is maintenance work going on at the Lodge, which, which has been done on a... You know, business as usual basis, so that's always there. And there's been a few extra things we've had to do in readiness for the big refurbishment will start later in the year. So, and you're responsible for running the maintenance project as well? That's correct, yes. Senator. So what sort of maintenance has been done? Uh, at the Lodge, uh, the maintenance is normal maintenance for the operation of a building, but because of the uh, 
the, the heritage implications yeah. of this particular building it's, and, and the age of the building, uh, the, the level of maintenance um, is at a higher level. So there are things going on at the moment to maintain the, um, for example, there are some, the roof's in a pretty bad condition. That's one of the major reasons for the refurbishment. Yeah. So there's been some work done to actually regularly inspect the roof and to actually uh, continually repair slate as it becomes dislodged and so on. Uh, there is work going on just keeping the, the internals of the building uh, working as well as it's uh, uh, at a very old age and, uh, and um, is requiring a fair bit of maintenance. So do, do you have like a, as a matter of course a, a regular maintenance budget for maintenance of the lodge or is this something you deal with even as it occurs? Um, it's a bit of both, Senator. We've, finance only uh, took on the responsibility for the lodge a couple of years ago, yep. having been transferred that responsibility. Um, with all new properties, we, we establish an initial budget, but because of the age and the condition of the, uh, the, the building, we are still coming to terms with what is the right level of expenditure for the, for the building. And um, it's, safe, it's fair to say that until the refurbishment works, uh, or once the refurbishment works are done, we'll be resetting that, uh, that sure. forecast level of expenditure. Yeah. And, and I, mean, I appreciate the point about you know, commercial uh, considerations in terms of the forward expenditure on the um, refurbishment, but what, what was the maintenance budget in 2012-13 for the lodge? Uh, Senator, I could... In terms of uh, what was spent there, I yep. could um, give you that figure. Yep. Can you just bear with me for a second. Does it to come to? Not the full detail, but what it was spent on, so just not the figure, but <coughs> whether it was roofing or yep. electricity, whatever. Thanks. Um, can I just clarify, so it was 12-13, Senator, you were interested? Yes. In? So for this financial year to date, uh, up until the 30th of April, uh, there was uh, $215,392 spent on maintenance for the lodge. So how does that compare with previous years? Uh, with previous years, if I can, I have, as I said, we've only been doing this for the lodge, finance has only been managing this for a couple of years, so in terms of the previous year, uh, the previous year's figure for the lodge, so this is for 11-12, uh, was $62,109. And so when did you start doing it? Sorry, so when did you start looking after maintenance for the lodge? Uh, I've got that exact date here, Senator, if you bear with me for a second. Uh, the property management and ownership responsibilities for the, official, the Prime Minister's official establishments, including the Lodge, uh, transferred to finance on the 14th of October 2010. October 2010, so that was after the most recent election. So does that mean that you can uh, provide us with the maintenance costs for 10, 11, 11, 12? Well, you've already given us 11, 12 and 12, 13. What was the maintenance cost in 10, 11? Uh, I don't have that in front of me, Senator, but I can take that on notice. Thank you. Um, I might leave it there. Senator, if we could just return to uh, the Cocos Keeling yep. Islands um, sure. runway re resurfacing project. That that work is complete. Yep. So you are after, I think, um, some information about the expenditure, which we will provide to you on notice. But that yep. work has been completed um, on time and under budget. On time, under budget. Very good. What we like to hear. Thank you. Are there? Oh, well, I have some quick questions in our come in this outcome. Can we um, go to government business enterprise and get an update? Um, particularly, I was looking at Australia Post. Uh, Chair, if it's okay, there was, Senator Cormann asked some questions yesterday uh, about property matters, and in particular the 14 square metres, and we took a couple yes. of those questions on notice. Sure. Would it be appropriate for me to respond you to those now? You can respond now. Yes, that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, Senator, the first question you asked, if I captured it correctly, was how many leases are involved in the calculation of the property savings around this 14 square metres uh, density target? And uh, in response to that, all of the FMA Act agencies uh, are subject to this process, this savings process, with some exceptions. Um, so in terms of the, the number of leases that are involved, it will involve every single lease being, at, at, when it comes, as each of the leases come to their uh, point of expiring, 
they will then be subjected to this uh, savings process. So all of the leases uh, that are subject to uh, so FMA Act agencies that are subject to the requirements of this process um, will be picked up. And that will occur over the next, um, uh, right through till 2030-31. Uh, so all up, to give you an, an order, it's about 400 leases are involved in the process. You also asked a, another question in relation to what portion of the leases were subject to this savings process in the ACT or in Canberra. Yeah. And, uh, fairly consistent with what I said yesterday, it's in the order of 50% of the leases are in Canberra. 50%, so 50% are across, across the remainder of Australia. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, sorry, just if I can as a follow-up, uh, what is the proportion of, uh, like, if you take your total property space across Australia, uh, what, what is the proportion there? Is it 50-50, is it? Uh, I'd have to check on that, Senator, because the, the, uh, we're talking about the number of leases, and depending on the size of each of those leases, it may not work out exactly, but that's, yeah. uh, that would be a fair starting point. We can check, Senator, but Thank you. Um, intuitively I would suspect that if you're going um, by square metres, it would be a larger proportion in Canberra, because I think um, the head offices of departments tend to be based in Canberra, so I think the answer would be that it would be a, a larger proportion by floor space. Which would mean that, like, a larger... Uh, a proportionately a larger level of effort will be required across Australia than in Canberra in, in terms of reducing the uh, used floor space. Is that well, if, if you've got a, I mean, if, if, you, if the proportions, let's say for argument's sake it's 70-30 by space and, and the, the uh, impact of the change is going to be 50-50 between um, Canberra and the rest of Australia than the effort in the rest of Australia from using less space is going to be more significant than the uh, Canberra-based effort. No, but I think the 50-50 mm -hmm. applies to the, to the stock. To so the square meterage yeah, as well. Yeah, okay. So in rough terms, as I yeah. said, we can provide, All right. we, we can provide uh, more specific details and so on, but as a, as a rule of thumb, it's 50-50. It's so it's proportional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, Senator, the figure for the Cocos Keeling Island um, runway refurbishment resurfacing project is uh, $21.8 million. Thank you. Uh, it, Chair, if I may, it may be worth just adding something else that we've been doing in the property space that uh, is uh, not directly related to the 14 square metres per work point, uh, but is around uh, better management of property, uh, particularly across the, uh, in the ACT with the public service. Um, as a result of sales of government property over a number of years, back in, the, you know, back in history, uh, a lot of agencies now lease through the private sector. Uh, and we have been collecting data on the expiry of those leases over a period of time. We now have a very good database, particularly around, uh, around the Canberra uh, uh, commercial property scene and what uh, agencies are doing and where they're doing it and when, uh, when leases expire. So we're working on a process whereby we're working with agencies to try and improve the allocation of property amongst agencies. So whilst they have the responsibility themselves, the chief executives have responsibility for determining their property needs, we're trying to see if we can assist them and over the overall, not just within the individual agency, but across the whole of the APS, get more efficient use of the stock. And I have some capacity to intervene if necessary to try and achieve that so I can uh, I think the minister just referred to it as being the czar. I don't see it quite that way, but uh, I do have that some. That was a private joke. I do have some powers <laughs> in that area that I can utilise if necessary to force efficiencies Canberra in the use of property. Canberra property czar is not a title. Well, it, it's it's trying to. Uh, it's, it's about efficiency. Encourage it, it, trying to uh, have a process which encourages accountability uh, with government policy objectives around efficient use sure. of the property base or the state. We're all in no, favour of more efficient use so, of property space, minister. Senator Moore has some thought on that if I can. Sure. In terms of the process, that, that whole property management has always been the purview of the CEO at each agency. So how are you actually bringing them together? Because I would have thought there would have been involvement perhaps in the um, Public Service Commission or something like that in terms of bringing this stuff together. Well, we, yeah, that's true. As I said, um, each individual agency is responsible mm. for their own property uh, uh, and requirements. sometimes quite competitive um, with each other, from what I've They seen. can be, and that can be an issue. Yeah. Uh, so without trying to undermine that, what we're trying to do is take a whole-of-government perspective on this, as, as well as just an individual 
agency perspective. And, so, and in, in essence, we're saying, if an individual CEO looks at their own property needs in isolation, they might be making quite rational decisions about the allocation of their resources and, and their uh, property uh, property management. But if you look at it from a whole of government perspective, mm. there may be inefficiencies there. So our role mm. is to try and bring that whole of government perspective to bear. So that, um, and to do that, you need a very good database because mm. you need to know who's doing what, when leases expire, what their plans are, what their likely staffing needs are. So you need to take a whole, you know, quite a detailed look at this. So, so we're not doing that in a, uh, a way of um, you know, forcing things. We're doing, we're trying to do it in a facilitative way, sure. working with agencies and saying, do you realise that you know, these people down here at Woden are going to be leaving this building in the near term? That that no, is vacant. Uh, your lease is coming up. Does this suit you? You know. So we're trying to bring the pull the pieces of the jigsaw together in a more coherent and efficient way. Mm. I can understand, certainly in a place like Canberra, where you have so many agencies yeah. together, there, there would be processes, but there does seem to me to be some um, positive aspects of taking this outside Canberra as well. And I would think that in regional centres, where you have a number of government departments working in the same region, mm. it, that could be a very useful mm. thing. And yeah, yeah. The, my own experience is there doesn't seem to be a lot of cooperation at the local level. Yeah. So is it something that could be extended in terms of best practice? Yeah, it would, it would, we're focusing on Canberra because a lot of the, of the expense yeah, yeah, is, yeah. is there, but the point's valid, yes, it, it can apply mm -hmm. elsewhere as well. You know, a big regional centre, I don't know what example, Townsville. Tamworth or Townsville or something Townsville. like that. Yeah, yeah. Senator, we do facilitate um, agencies working together, and my colleague, Mr Whalen, can speak further about that. Mm. But we, the department does provide advice to agencies, and we also facilitate agencies talking to one another. Mr Whalen. Thank you. Uh, Senator, at the moment, uh, and, and your point is, is very valid in terms of those opportunities that exist in the regions as well, and there's a, a body of work going on at the moment. Finance is not leading it, but finance is um, facilitating and assisting in some capacity, working with um, a range of agencies who do have uh, property uh, requirements in, in the rural and remote areas to try and identify ways in which they can work together to actually get efficiencies, um, particularly in terms of leases and uh, the development of properties and so on. But that's a, that's a piece of work that's uh, uh, in play at the moment. Who's leading that, Mr Wallen? Regional Australia, I believe, is, right, okay. or there's a range of agencies that are involved in it. It's more of a working group sure. than anything else. And again, in this area, is there any discussion with state governments? Because it seems to me there's a lot of potential, particularly in regional centres, where you have three levels, and mainly when I'm talking about state, two levels of government that are in this business of accommodation and property, that there, there could well be some cooperation there. Is there any um, intent or possibility of widening that to um, a cross-government cooperation? Uh, Senator, there possibly is. I don't have the details on whether that's occurring at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but we do actually, um, um, for example, in finance, we actually do work with um, some of the state governments mm -hmm. to, who, who have similar interests in property to actually mm -hmm. uh, share information, but also to have an opportunity to get across what are some of their property and accommodation pressures, what are ours, and uh, to identify if there are opportunities to work together to, mm -hmm. um, to do that. If there's any information on that, can, I, can we, the committee get it? It would be very useful in terms of how those interdepartmental <coughs> liaisons are going. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator um, Moore. Senator, whilst we're closing off um, questions that have been asked previously, may I also deal with one from Senator Boswell from yesterday where he was asking about um, funding to Animals Australia and the RSPCA. Um, funding to the RSPCA as a grant in aid was first provided in 1986-87. Uh, for various purposes and also uh, funding to Animals Australia or more correctly to its predecessor organisation, the Australian New Zealand Federation of Animal Societies was first provided in 1990-1991. Thank you for that. Wow. And, <coughs> and if I could now move on to uh, getting an update on um, Australia Post. Yes. If we need to bring any officers up for that. Yes. Mr. H and Ms. Hall. Thanks, Thanks very much. I was wondering if you could give us a summary of how Australia Post uh, is going and what the challenges that they're, that they're facing. Um, 
Certainly, Senator. Um, John Edge, First Assistant Secretary, Commercial and Claims Division. Um, uh, Australia Post is a, is a government business enterprise. Uh, the Finance Minister and the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy are joint shareholders in Australia Post. Uh, as such, we uh, work regularly with Australia Post uh, in terms of uh, the performance of the business, how it's, uh, how it's performing. Um, each year, uh, ministers consider the Australia Post corporate plan. And uh, as part of that process, um, there's discussions about uh, the performance of various areas of the business and, and how the business is performing. Um, Australia Post is um, a business that encompasses uh, mail delivery but also has a significant parcels business and, and other aspects of the business are, um, are also uh, are taken into account in terms of that but it's primarily a parcels and letter delivery business. Uh, the challenges that Australia Post faces are the challenges really that uh, similar entities all around the world are facing. There's, there's an obvious decline in uh, letter volumes occurring in postal services around the world. And uh, that is a challenge that Australia Post and comparable organisations are, are dealing with. So can you outline um, their, their strategy for, for dealing with the change in the market? Um, <coughs> well, obviously, uh, the details around the strategy are, are questions that I would imagine would be best directed to Australia Post itself. Um, but, but clearly there are a range of things that a business in that position can consider doing uh, to address um, mail volume declines. It can uh, obviously invest, in, um, invest in, in technology and other initiatives to, to take costs out of that business to a reasonable extent, whatever extent means that it still uh, delivers in accordance with its community service obligations. Um, it can also look at investing in alternative uh, means of effectively delivering information, so digital mailbox type services where information that would have been sent via uh, a postal service is delivered electronically. Australia Post has uh, has undertaken some, some initiatives in that area, but that's, I, I think, fair to say, an, an emerging part of the business um, and one which um, obviously requires uh, certain changes in the way consumers and businesses operate and how they communicate. Um, I imagine that Australia Post, um, as part of looking at strategies in this area, is looking at how it can maintain its uh, existing uh, sort of bulk mailing um, business with, uh, with various businesses and so on. It carries a significant amount of mail for business and would be talking to business about that. Um, so there's a range of things that the business is doing to, to address these, uh, these trends, but uh, in terms of more detail about how that is occurring, that, as I said, the question is best directed to the business itself. I think it'd be um, a fair summation to, to say that in the public arena there's uh, a lot of talk about the increase in, um, in the purchases by the internet, so one would assume that there would be an increase in, in parcels going through Australia Post. Have you, can you update uh, the committee as to whether there's what sort of strategy has been put in place there and if there is, has in fact been an increase in their parcel post business side? Australia things? Post has clearly been, uh, been um, uh, a significant participant in, in the parcels business and uh, there was a recent acquisition of the Star Trek Express um, business. So clearly Australia Post uh, sees um, parcels and the growth in parcels volume, um, driven by a range of things, but certainly people buying things on the internet, either in Australia or from overseas, as, uh, as a growth area for the business. Um, and, and that area of the business um, for Australia Post, and I think for comparable organisations overseas, has, has shown significant growth in terms of um, parcel volumes. And uh, that's parcel volume really um, been a significant uh, contributor to Australia Post revenue over the last couple of years. But they are seen as more than just a post office now with their the shops and the, the type of products that they sell. Any? Um... Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, they are. They they certainly have a, a very established retail um, network of, of post offices, which are also in themselves uh, small retail businesses. So they sell a lot of products. Um, 
in, in the post offices. Uh, they also offer um, uh, you know, collection points for, uh, for parcels and, uh, and other uh, things that um, are being delivered through the well, things that are being delivered through the parcel network. So it's a diverse business in that sense, yes. One of the things they've done in recent times, Senator, is, and Mr Edge mentioned it, these collection points. So they're trying to link up their physical network, which where, where they're very strong, of course, uh, historically very strong and continue to be, but also trying to recognise changing working patterns of people that, particularly with parcels, that not leaving parcels on the front doorstep when nobody's home. So using their physical network to provide these collection points where you can go in and click the parcel that's arrived uh, with you've purchased over the internet. So there, there's a bit of integration going on, which I think is, is a very sensible way to move. Absolutely. Um, uh, in terms of some of their, the, um, their business, uh, you'd be aware, no doubt, of the concerns that was raised in uh, my <coughs> local community in Launceston in relation to uh, the business community having concern about some um, lapse in, in the express post um, return. So uh, it was good to see that overcome, but certainly um, in rural and regional areas, having access to those sort of uh, um, drop-off points and collection points is going to be an advantage. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, in, if I could just move on to another area, uh, War Bank. Uh, can we get a, an update? in relation to um, my understanding was that this was a project that was being built and operated by a private sector, is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Okay. So the claims um, by some that this is an example of the, the government entering into commercial sector um, are untrue? That's right, Senator. Um, a government business enterprise has been established and uh, will be or is sure, in the process of calling uh, for expressions of interest for private sector involvement in the project. Uh, the, the board that's been established uh, is a board that has good commercial skills to oversee that. Okay. So there's nothing else you can add to that? Well, Senator, the, um, the Moorbank Intermodal Company, I think, recently advertised for um, expressions of interest uh, to uh, private, potential private sector operators of the Moorbank Terminal, and that process is, uh, is currently open for um, businesses to register their interest in participating in the project. And what's the timeline for that? Um, I think that the initial phase um, registration of interest period closes in mid-June, possibly the 14th of June or sometime around then. Okay, thank you for that. Senator, I should mention that um, the approach that's been adopted in relation to the Bull Bank project um, uh, has been uh, commended by the Business Council of Australia as a, a suitable mechanism for the establishment of um, uh, this important piece of infrastructure. Uh, there was a letter written to uh, Minister Wong, uh, I believe it was also copied to Minister Albanese, which um, commended the approach that's been taken to the project. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could move on to another area that we haven't touched on in, in the estimates um, in recent times that I can recall, but I think is a very important element, that is defence housing. Can you um, give uh, the committee an update as to how that's travelling um, in terms of the forward planning? And if you could just outline the nature of the investments in that area. Uh, Senator Stacey Hall, Assistant Secretary, um, Government Businesses Advice Branch. Um, as you're aware, Defence Housing uh, is one of our, our GBEs and, and uh, the Finance Minister is a uh, joint shareholder with the Defence Minister. Um, Defence Housing uh, as an organisation is uh, travelling very well. They're, um, delivering uh, by and large on the defence uh, requirement with respect to housing for, for serving personnel. Um, I would comment that the key challenge uh, facing that organisation is um, in relation to, to meeting the, the standard is the, um, it relates to the lack of, of uh, available land within an appropriate proximity of defence bases and uh, defence and the, and the DHA are working together um, to develop solutions to address that uh, in terms of looking forward with respect to the expectation um, around the level of housing and the standard of housing that will be 
uh, required to be provided by uh, for defence personnel. Okay, can you outline to us um, how the sale and leaseback uh, process works? Uh, yes, Senator, at a, at a high level. Um, defence housing uh, constructs a range, of, a range of properties and then offers those um, to private investors uh, with a long-term lease arrangement um, for, for 15 years or up to 15 years um, so that the, the investors have a secure um, guaranteed rental stream and uh, you know, fairly um, high quality tenants by and large and uh, fairly structured arrangements in terms of um, the repairs and maintenance process around uh, managing, managing the upkeep of the properties to maintain them to the appropriate standard. Um, DHA have recently um, extended that program uh, by establishing a, a, a unit trust to enable investors who may not want to put um, the level of capital in required to, to buy a whole property, um, just to be able to access that <coughs> program um, through a unit trust arrangement so they can uh, put in a level of investment into a trust that holds uh, a number of properties. Um, Built by DHA, and and uh, get access to capital to to fund the provisioning requirements through that mechanism as well. Thank you very much. Is there? Um, there's no further questions in outcome two. We'll move on to outcome three. And Senator. Well, we may have some questions that we'll put on notice in relation to women on boards. Senator um, Abetz? Yes. Look, um, thank you. i wait for people to come to the table. So these will be our general questions in outcome three. Well, depending on where, where they go, they might mix it up. There's an opportunity we will, because we want to go to ACC after lunch. Okay, sorry. No, no, no. Um, <coughs> when they're ready, I'll get started. Senator Betts, should we? Oh, if I may, yep. I'll get started. Yeah, cool. When Senator Ronaldson. Ronaldson comes in, I'll pull the plug and uh, defer. If that's agreeable. Yes. Yeah, and that's yep. fine, Senator Betts. All right. You have then, call. Thank we're, you. We're very cooperative here, as you well know, Senator Betts. If I may ask a general question, what's the timeline for responding to letters uh, sent out by the Special Minister of State in relation to potential breaches of... Um, um, or misuse of entitlements? I don't think there's a specific timeline, Senator, uh, to depend very much on the situation at hand. All right. To make All sure right. there's a proper investigation and it's done thoroughly. Right, because if uh, you know, somebody doesn't respond, do you have a what monthly update to send uh, out a reminder? We do have a periodic one. I don't know if it's monthly. What's, uh, all right, periodic. What's the period? Uh, Senator, perhaps if I could assist yeah. Stephen Taylor, Assistant Secretary, Chief Operating Officer Group. There's no specific. You've moved up. <laughs> there's, there's no specific period, Senator. So. Right, because uh, what I want to find out is the letter written by the former Special Minister of State, Mr Gray, to Senator Carr about his electorate office. Senator Bob Carr, Please Senator hear. Bob Carr, Very um, and uh, um, it took you, Minister Senator, Senator Bob don't, Carr. Don't you know the one that was written to Senator Kim Carr? Don't you know about <laughs> um, <laughs> how about I refer to him as Minister Carr? No, Although I hope that doesn't hurt no, you, no, Senator. No, you are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Senator Bob Carr, then. Um, You're so subtle, Senator. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, look, uh, it took Senator Bob Carr four months in which to respond, and I'm just wondering whether during that time any reminders were issued to Senator Bob Carr uh, about the issue at hand. 
Um, Senator, perhaps if I could uh, answer that in, in a, a slightly different way, and that's that uh, that if um, if the special minister of state, as you would well know, um, you know writes to a senator or a member uh, and doesn't receive a reply, it, it is routine that uh, that there will be a follow up of some kind. Um, well, I hope previous special ministers of state did that. And, and certainly um, a, a range of special ministers of state uh, have, has, have followed that same process on the advice right. of the department. So that's the general. Did it occur in this specific yeah. occasion? Well, so can we take that on notice, Senator? I will check for you. Or Mr Taylor might have, we might have it. Yeah, not sure. the information. Um, uh, my recollection is that, uh, that there were probably a couple of uh, letters that, uh, that were directed to uh, Minister Carr, uh, although my recollection is also that, uh, that Minister Carr responded um, uh, on more than one occasion. Ah. All right, because it seems that Senator Bob Carr was written to on the 6th of June and deigned to respond on the 5th of October, some one day short, shy of four months, which uh, seems on the face of it an arrogant disregard um, for transparency. But if you say that he did respond in that four month period, saying that he needed extra time or whatever, so be it. But the documentation I have in front of me would not suggest that that mm. was the case. I, I think you're correct, Senator. I'm just yeah. looking at the document that was released under the Freedom of Information Act, and oh, well, I think you're correct. Oh, well, we did, as you'd be aware, do an FOI on this, and uh, they were not disclosed, and hence my question. So, yeah. If Bob Carr had not, Senator Bob Carr had not deigned four months after, could this still be an ongoing is issue where Senator Carr would not have, Bob Carr would not have responded and the department and the minister would have just let it sail by? I, I do recollect, Minister, that there were certain statements made in the media um, and that is a little different to uh, the situation of many allegations that that uh, don't have that kind of attention. But this was an allegation of misuse of electorate office for his business, something that uh, was raised by the excellent deputy chair of this committee, Senator Ryan, on the 24th of May. And it's interesting that, call it serendipitous, call it coincidence, but the change to company details of the registered office of Senator Carr's business was signed on the 24th of May 2012. One cannot help but think that the signing of this document may have been related to Senator Ryan's uh, raising oh. of the issue. Senator, uh, I have not intervened uh, because I understand you, you have a particular obsession with this topic, but I think the... Oh, transparency, the, you are oh, right, well, I do well, have an obsession uh, with that. Well, I think you've asked um, this question a number of estimates and uh, the matter's been dealt with, but no, you, have, you have a right to, to ask questions, but I think you don't have a That's right... That's gracious. Can I finish? Well, I, I, I'm well, expecting I'm, a homily well, I'm, from I'm you waiting, and I think I'm right. Well, I mean, do you want me to start again? Uh, I don't think you have the right to uh, impute motive in your questions in that way. If you if you want to ask questions of officers uh, and elicit an answer, that's that's obviously your your right as a senator. If you're going to impute motive and make political statements in your questions, I, I I'm going to intervene. It's not an appropriate use of the way estimate should be run. All right, I said serendipitous, coincidental. Uh, if that is imputing motive. Uh, you do said you want more me to that, say Senator. it was done as a result of Senator Ryan's questioning embarrassing well, the so foreign there minister? Again. There you go again. I mean, that is, well, that is, if you have a political statement to make, Senator, go outside and hold a press conference. If you want to ask questions of officers, then do that. Well, if you stop intervening with your homilies, I'll do well, exactly that. I don't think that. it's a homily. It's reminding you that perhaps this is not the place for you to make right, unsubstantiated... Uh, I beg your pardon? 
Oh, if it's not a homily, it can be a Politburo speech. I don't know how you oh, want to Senator, describe that. Uh, oh, well, this just shows how ridiculous you are. I mean, are you seriously suggesting I'm making a Politburo speech? Why don't you look under the chair and see if there's a red there as well? I mean, really. It's ridiculous. Right. Senator Bates, have you got a question? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. When the Minister's taken a chill pill, I'll, uh, I'll uh, continue the questioning. So can I ask, did the Department, when they were finally provided uh, with this information, do any checking to ensure the verification of that which Senator Carr asserted in his correspondence? Uh, Senator, the, the normal process in relation to these matters is to consider any records that are uh, publicly available or available in the department, uh, and, and that process was, was followed in this as in any other allegation of this sort. So, mm. what we had last time, uh, and I'm sure the Minister will recall this, is that we weren't told the result of the investigation and as a result we had the FOI which has revealed a lot more and so one wonders why we are not provided with answers that are then available under FOI. I'm just wondering yes. if this is part Senator, of the... Senator, could, could I clarify, um, at the last estimates, uh, I think Senator Ryan asked the question uh, where this particular matter was, was up to and, uh, and I indicated to Senator Ryan that it was finalised. All right, look, I will. You sure? Oh, all right. So, was Senator Carr asked to provide any proof that he had requested his accountant to change the principal place of business? No. Right? So, when Minister Gray wrote to Senator Bob Carr accepting his assurances, it was simply on the strength of. Uh, Senator Carr's letter? On the strength of Senator Carr's letter and on the basis of material that the department obtained. Sorry, that the. On the basis of material that was available to the department, publicly available material or material that uh, was held within finance. Now, in the official public document that just happened to have been signed on the same day as Senator Ryan raised the issue, it then backdates it to the 19th of March. Were you aware of that? Was the department ever provided with a documentation? Um, Senator, I, I could only repeat what I've said, that um, in terms of consideration of these particular matters, the process that was followed in relation to this matter is the same process that is followed in relation to any allegation of misuse. Um, as has probably been clarified a number of times before the committee in the past, um, the attention that these matters uh, uh, get, the, the department does not is not an investigator, um, it considers the material that is available to it and it uh, makes judgments and decisions based on that and in this case, in the case of a less serious allegation, it uh, briefs the Special Minister of State accordingly. All right, so Buz, what we have here is a letter by Senator Carr uh, to Minister Gary Gray and this is four months, four months after the letter is written. It's a two paragraph letter, so one wonders why it took so long, but that's for Senator Bob Carr to answer. But he says, immediately after my announcement, I requested my accountant to advise ASIC to amend the address for RJ Carr Proprietary Limited and to remove me as a company director. This subsequently occurred. But one wonders whether the subsequently occurred was after his appointment to the Senate or subsequent to Senator Ryan's probing questioning on the 24th of May. And the department did not look into that at all? Well, that's a question which 
one wonders. I mean, by, by definition, you're asking the officer to hypothesise about um, a, a senator's intention and motive. Oh, well, and that's why I'm that asking question. whether it was investigated, because to blithely say this subsequently occurred, uh, if I might say with respect, weasel words suggesting that all this occurred after the 24th of May, but, but, I might be wrong. And I'm just wondering what the department did to verify other than, or the minister for that matter, other than to verify. Now, one wonders why it would have taken the foreign minister for months to respond if everything had been put in place immediately upon his appointment in March. He gets a letter on the 6th of June. Surely the response could have been pretty quick and uh, easy for the minister. Now, you can't comment on that aspect, but surely, given that the four-month delay and the words which, which are obfuscating at best, did that excite any interest in the department to further investigate that which Senator Bob Carr had asserted? OK. Uh, well, uh, there was a lot of commentary in that question. Uh, the officer uh, chair uh, is obviously not required to respond to any of the commentary. I think the one aspect the officer uh, uh, could p p potentially address, or if he wishes, take it on notice, uh, is I think the sequence, whether or not any further action was taken. Mm. Well, certainly um, uh, documents were considered, a, a company extract from the Australian Securities Investments Commission was, was considered, and, and that's referred to in the brief that's been released under the mm -hmm. Freedom of Information uh, Accident. So that was certainly considered in, in this process of advising the Special Minister of State. So the fact that there was a four-month delay to say that everything occurred immediately <coughs> did not excite any interest for further investigation by the department. <coughs> if it was all that simple, one just wonders why the minister took four months. It was either a highly arrogant disregard for transparency and his obligations or a lot of things occurred during those four months before which he could finally respond by saying this subsequently occurred. And I would have thought that the department might have had their interest aroused by such wording indicating that events may not necessarily have taken place in the order as they should have. But from what I understand, the department didn't follow up any further. Perhaps I could uh, add, Senator, that um, I think, as I previously stated, that where there are instances where letters uh, that have come from the Special Minister of State to the relevant Senator or member haven't been responded to, well, they are pursued. But that is not a, an unusual um, event. It, it, it happens if uh, a response hasn't been received, a, a follow-up will, will be requested. It, it, it's not something that is exceptional. Yeah, but this was a four-month delay without any follow-up with a foreign minister. And then he gives this very bland response, very unreassuring, highly unconvincing, saying this subsequently occurred, but we don't know at what date, other than that it was Senator Ryan's questioning that happens to be the same date that certain changes were made. But look, the department didn't look into it, and that's on the record now, and uh, I think that's a matter of some regret. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Chair. Can I just, can I just say, Senator, it, it is not unusual for this sort of occurrence to occur, for this delay. I would say it's probably the more normal situation for there to be reasonably long delays between requests for a response. Now, I don't want to go through every single situation that's outstanding, but there are a number and follow-up is made as appropriate. So we're not dealing with an exceptional circumstance here. It's probably the, more closer to the norm than the exception. So four months of non-response and the file just moulders away in no, the no, filing Mr. cabinet Taylor's and uh, everybody's a happy camper. No, Mr Taylor has explained that some follow-up occurs, but whether that... No, sort of response we were just told no follow-up occurs. There's a regular the process. FOI has Senator disclosed Vance, that. Senator can you just allow Mr there's a, there's a regular to complete his that we answer? Talked about. 
That happens periodically. Yes. Mm. And that happens, and we list them and we seek. All right. Well, in that case, tell me about the periodic um, follow up on this particular matter. Well, I think it fell within the periods, didn't it? Um, Senator, uh, you, you have stated that um, the first response from Senator Carr was that letter that you have obtained mm. on the FOI, mm -hmm. and that, that, that is correct. Right. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether any the efforts were made uh, within the office of the Special Minister of State to, to raise that matter. The department's only aware of the, the matters that, that it has responsibility for and the briefing that it provides to the Special Minister of State. So, so I couldn't categorically say that uh, other efforts weren't made within the, the office itself to, yeah. to raise the matter with uh, with Minister Carr to, to look, seek a response. Look, understand that, but one would imagine that um, the Special Minister of State correspondence or any messages uh, might have um, been disclosed in the FOI as well, but uh, the department, and this is my concern, the department thinks that a four-month delay in response in relation to an allegation of misuse of an electorate office is acceptable and did not warrant a follow-up letter or a follow-up brief to the minister suggesting that he should write again to remind this cabinet minister of his obligations under the Parliamentary Entitlements Act. I just find that astounding. Well, I'm saying that is not exceptional. There are yeah, a number of but cases. But Mr Tune, you are in charge of this show and you are saying to us that it is acceptable to you that a letter alleging misuse of parliamentary entitlements can be sent out and no response provided for four months without the department seeking to send out any reminders. I just find it depends, that... It depends on the circumstances, Senator. All right. What's the circumstance of an allegation of misuse of a publicly funded office for private purposes to warrant it not to be followed up for a period of four months? What's the special circumstance well, here, Mr June? Well, Other than it's a senior cabinet minister, well, Senator well, Bob Carr. As I said, periodically, and it depends on... You know, it depends. We would put a brief up to the... Up to the Special Minister of State saying, here's the outstanding cases, here's what we recommend you might do to, with them, in some cases further follow-up required. Other Excuse cases, me, where was that disclosed in the no, FOI? it didn't occur on this occasion because the period hadn't occurred. We might do that every the six months. The period hadn't months. occurred, so what is the period? The period can vary. It's a period. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're a Senator Bob Carr, Foreign Minister, the period is when he deigns to respond. Well, we no, that is the sense. only measure we have, well, isn't it? We generally, we generally put this brief up and covering all the cases that are before us at a particular point. Generally. In so why did the case of Senator Bob Carr drop off the general list? It, it, it was on the list. It's just that the periodic, Excuse me. The periodic brief hadn't been... Excuse right. me. If it was on the list... It should have been disclosed on the FOI, and it was no, not. No, I'm not saying Can you that, explain not, that? Can I'm you explain to, that to me? Yeah, I'm not trying to say that that, uh, that brief, that general brief, went up to the minister in that four-month period. I'm not trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is that that does happen periodically. Yeah, it may have happened. Yeah, but what's the period? It well, Senator Betts, if, if you just allow Mr Tune yeah. to complete Most, his answer. Generally every six months is, is, is done. Generally every six months? Since when has that been the practice? Um, I don't know, Senator. For a while. I Senator, think Mr Taylor and I uh, know each other from previous days where uh, these things were done on a lot more regular basis. And might I add, not driven by myself, uh, but by officials in the department. So, can I just invite, can I just invite the department to have a reconsideration of the timelines and the periodic times, whatever that might mean, uh, to ensure that some of these things are followed up more expeditiously? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Senator. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Betts. Senator Ronaldson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just, uh, 
need someone at the table who uh, has a, an intimate knowledge of the uh, printing communications uh, allowance and, uh, and the requirements of, uh, uh, of the accessing of that, is it? Um, Pitson, acting first assistant secretary. I can certainly try to help you in the first Terrific. instance. Thank you very Senator. much. Could I just ask you to put your name plate forward for hands? Thank, thank you. you. Senator Ronson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering, in relation to the use of uh, communications uh, allowance, <clears throat> and particularly when there's uh, direct mail to uh, uh, to a member's uh, constituents, and you know, by way of a, of a DL or uh, or something else. What uh, what requirements do, uh, does the department enforce to ensure that the information that's uh, given is uh, is accurate if, if taxpayers' funds are being used? There is uh, a, a checking regime, um, a, a post uh, prepayment pre and post payment checking regime. Um, I might invite Ms Moy to the table to discuss the, um, the pre- and post-payment checking that's done in relation to the printing and communications entitlement. <coughs> Sharon Lane Moy, Assistant Secretary, Chief Operating Officer's Group. Sorry, Senator, can I just ask the, um, for you to restate the question? Uh, well, I, I think your colleague said that there is uh, um, some checking pre- and post of material sent out by uh, uh, by members uh, and senators, presumably uh, uh, in relation to uh, to what requirements there are in relation to uh, uh, to that material. That's correct. So, for pre and post printing, when we receive the um, the article or the item that's to be printed, our concern is um, whether or not that <coughs> item um, is in line with the regulations for printing and communications, which goes to the type of um, uh, format of the uh, of the document that's being printed, for example, the the weight of the uh, paper, the um, whether or not it's parliamentary electorate, official business, the actual content of the item is not part of the regulations. Not not what, none whatsoever. So you don't check you don't check any of the material that's provided. So. Um, do you have a specific example? I'm about just about to give you a very specific yep. example. But I'm, I'm asking you some uh, uh, some questions uh, questions first. So, do you? Uh, I take it uh, the materials submitted. You look at it, and then tick it off. We look we look at the um, the type of item that will be printed, whether or not that meets the regulations. So, the content of the actual the text. The, um, what the message is, for example, we will look at things to say, does it say uh, vote one particular member? That would come outside of the um, regulations. We won't approve something that to be um, paid for either pre-printing or post-printing if that was the case. And so there are some items of content such as that. That's probably one of the only items of content that we will um, will determine comes outside of the regulations. In terms of um, other items and, or content or commentary or policies, we, we have no um, role in that area. So potentially um, taxpayers' funds can be used to uh, distribute blatant lies and there's no provision within the uh, department to uh, uh, to check that? Um, there's, there's no um, role within the department in terms of the use of entitlements to determine whether or not a statement Could is factual or incorrect. Could you just wait a moment, please? We're having, sorry. Could you, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. that. Sorry. I missed that because of the noise. Sorry. Would you sorry, mind? Senator. There's no role for the department to determine whether or not the content of a statement is incorrect or correct. And if, if a member was to uh, tell a blatant lie in a taxpayer-funded material uh, and you received a complaint in relation to that, is there any action that you can, uh, that you can take? In terms of looking at the um, approval process, we would ensure that our approval process was correct. We would um, talk to the, or write to the constituent and explain the role of the department. In terms of printing and communications, each time a printing and communications item is sent for approval, either pre or post checking, 
there is a certification by the parliamentarian to say that the um, printing is within the parliamentary or electorate um, entitlement and, and for the correct and proper use. So the parliamentarian is responsible for the content. Our requirement is to ensure that they do not go outside of the entitlement in terms of either the number they might print for some issues or the, um, or the size or the type of item they might print. So there's no certification for the accuracy of, uh, of material that um, is put in there. When the, when the member signs, uh, uh, signs this document, are they required to attest to the accuracy of, of information that's in the, uh, in the Not document? Not to my knowledge, Senator, no. They're, they're saying that their use is within entitlement. Uh, and within entitlement, is there a requirement um, uh, for uh, blatant uh, and misleading information no, not, not to be provided? No, no. Senator. You see, I, I have um, a DL that was uh, sent out by the member for Karangamart, which uh, landed on people's um, doors yesterday or the day before. And that document uh, indicates, and I'm happy to provide you with a copy of it. Thank you, Senator. Uh, that says that um, after September with Tony Abbott, uh, $18,200 tax-free threshold, and then in the box is the word gone. Now, um, are you aware, uh, so what was yesterday? That was the 20, um, 28th, 28th. 29th. Yeah. So uh, on the 28th, this uh, material arrived. Uh, are you aware that uh, indeed the Leader of the Opposition in his budget reply speech on the 16th of May uh, made it quite clear that the Coalition would be retaining uh, the, uh, the tax free threshold of 18,200? Can we, um, before the officer has to answer that, can we please get a copy of the, the document? We're just getting some yeah. copies. Thank you. Yeah, sure. if it's, I think just it's only fair if someone's going to be asked something. Copy of it. No, I'm, I'm very, very happy. When you see it, you understand why. So, <coughs> oh, I can't. To table this yes, I am so. thinking, yes. Yeah. You. you see... I, look, committee, uh, we need to just have a look at it. It's a bit hard to, to read down the bottom, but... Uh, no, no, it's not, a, it's not down. The, the, the bottom's the authorisation, so that's not the issue. The bit's up in the top right-hand side, can, Chair. Can we resolve as a committee to uh, receive? It's been, it's been uh, received. Thank you, Senator Rawlinson. Thank you. You see, that uh, statement uh, is a bald-faced lie. Uh, if you go under that, it says $1,000 for kids' dental. Gone. Now, that was actually some legislation, in my understanding, that went through the Parliament earlier this year, uh, that was not uh, opposed by the coalition. But I will, I will stick to the 18,200. Now that it's been brought to your attention that this material uh, has been distributed, now it's been drawn to your attention that this is a blatant lie and a deliberate attempt, a deliberate attempt by the member involved uh, to influence the outcome uh, of a vote at the next election. Are you in a position uh, to go back to that member uh, and indicate that it's been brought to your attention that it is an outright lie and indeed a deliberate lie? and indeed material, material put out 
uh, some, uh, some 10, 12 days after the Leader of the Opposition had actually reinforced the fact that this would not be occurring. So before the officer answers, just looking at the leaflet, yeah. it says, what, what will wall-to-wall -wall Liberal leaders do to local yeah. families? Yeah. Well, well, I've, well, look, read it all oh, hang on. Doesn't worry Senator, me. I've let you speak for some time without yeah. interrupting. Yeah. Um, well, under the state government, it says local TAFE funding cut, true. Yeah. Support for CFA cut, yeah. true. Help for apprentices no. cut, true. No. Westlink Road project dumped, true. Yeah. Local schools upgrades, true. Yeah. After September with Tony Abbott, school kids bonus gone, true. Yeah. Uh, the support for local jobs, I assume, is your policy to uh, discontinue support for the auto industry. So well, I think you, no, no, well, well, that you well, have a well, policy of discontinuing support beyond well, 2015. How, how you, how no, 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 just assume, hang on. But that is the, that is your policy. So I think there's there's a more than arguable position, more than arguable position that that's true. Your workplace rights. Well, we know that the coalition is. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of your DNA, work choices is right there. Your your oh, single so proposition. No, I, hang on, Senator Ronaldson. Senator Senator Ronaldson. Well, I know what your position is on penalty rates, and that's a workplace just right you want to take away. In fact, Senator Ryan, I think, is on the record as arguing for penalty rates, uh, a relief. Perhaps it wasn't you, Senator. It might have been another Senator for Victoria. There's a lot of things to blame me for. Uh, a, 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 the removal of penalty penalty yeah. rates for small business. So the one issue in a leaflet where there's quite a a lot of, uh, uh, I think, <coughs> accurate information about the cuts that yeah. Liberals would impose is, is whether or not the tax-free threshold uh, issue should have been included. Um, well, I assume the Department will well, have a look I at it. Well, Minister, can I, uh, can I ask you, seeing you know so much about this, uh, can you tell me how much TAFE funding was cut? Oh, oh, don't be Senator, uh, you, you seem to know so much about it. How much Senator, support I'm for the CFA was? Senator, I'm sure it's you, not relevant to these estimates. So how much was helpful for uh, well, I'm sure Senator Carr could probably have a chat about, about the Victor what the Victorian yeah, government's yeah, done to take. Yeah, Perhaps Senator Carr, Senator Carr, Senator, Carr, Senator, Carr, Senator sure Ronaldson, Senator Ronaldson. No, Senator no, Ronaldson, no, would you like to get back to questions that are relevant to the estimates? The question is the. Minister, can I ask? Yes, certainly. Do you think it is appropriate for the member for Karangamite to use taxpayers' fund, funds <laughs> to peddle a deliberate lie that our, under Tony Abbott the $18,200 tax-free threshold is gone? Do you, do you well, believe well, that I, is appropriate? I've had a front bench of the Liberal Party peddling a deliberate lie about me is, which remains is, on the, I, I, on the I'm Party asking website, you, Minister, so, does the government uh, and you as the responsible minister, do you think it is acceptable for someone to be using taxpayers' funds to peddle a deliberate lie? Yes or no? Well, you can't tell me how to answer a question. Um, I, I make the point that the leaflet contains a number of uh, factually correct or certainly politically arguable propositions. Ah. I recognise, uh, as I understand, what your proposition is, is yeah. that uh, the policy of the Liberal Party, which was until the budget reply to get rid of the changes on the tax-free threshold, uh, uh, was changed on budget reply night and that this leaflet postdates that. Uh, I'll take that question on notice. But in terms of the department, I don't know if there's anything to add in terms of the, vet, the process of consideration. So just, just to confirm with the department, clearly the... Uh, well, the I've, just, I've just thrown to the department, yeah. Senator, so perhaps yeah. they could un answer before you ask another question. Senator, the department has no role in censoring political material that's printed um, or communicated to constituents. Neither via legislation or process. It's a shame because the Liberal Party puts a lot of crap in our Liberal Party. You, 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 know, you know that your interventions are never terribly helpful, mainly for you, but certainly for the rest of us. The, can I just give an overview uh, of this? So, can I just be absolutely oh, sure uh, the department uh, has no ability to vet uh, lies and misinformation? Is that right? The department has no role yep. in censoring political information. Yep. Uh, and, uh, Minister, I can just <coughs> confirm with you uh, that because uh, you refused to comment uh, that the government and yourself as a responsible minister 
uh, believes it's acceptable for the member for the Crangamite uh, to distribute information uh, which is deliberately lie, uh, del deliberately a lie and deliberately misleading. That's no, where we're at, I'm no, sure, no, no. Isn't I've it? said I'd take the issue of the tax-free threshold component of this DL on notice. Thank you. I would make the point, Senator, yeah. and uh, I think Senator Betts has left. If you are arguing for a different uh, uh, method of uh, uh, taxpayer of assessing uh, um, political this sort of material uh, in terms of entitlements, I, I would make the point that. Uh, uh, a system that involved, I think, less scrutiny existed under your government, uh, and that I suspect a number of your backbenchers would not like it if we brought material into this estimates committee about some of the things which are put out by Liberal Party members. So, yeah. if you want to go down this path, that's a matter yeah, for you. I, I, but I, but, I, but I I'd I say to you, I, I have received material in my letterbox, and others have, uh, which would not pass the sort of test you're now setting in terms of its assertions. What? So anyway, so, I've taken that issue on notice, which is the one issue of the tax-free well, threshold. Could send me, and the perhaps you could send me material where there has been blatant, blatant misrepresentation and lies like that. Well, I'd be, be very uh, pleased again. I'm sure you would have sent it off to the uh, Special Minister of State if you had it. I mean, no, have you sent I, no, anything off? Senator, uh, I, I haven't. No. Um, no, I've been doing the federal budget. Uh, and, oh. and, so this uh, occurred recently, hasn't No, it? I'm making the point uh, that if you want to set this standard, I suspect, uh, that there would people in your, be people in your own party room who would be very concerned uh, about uh, the, the sort of standard that you appear to want to impose and that you don't have the support of your party room for it. Uh, I'm happy to take on notice the issue. I, I accept uh, that this references a Liberal policy which has been long-standing but has been recently changed, and I'll take that matter on notice. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Carr. I've, uh, I've got an inquiry. I've um, recently had cause to examine this issue of the communications allowances and accessing it, uh, Mr Chun, and, and I'm wondering how long it's been since the department's updated its processes for the uh, approvals for accessing the communications allowances, particularly in regard to digital subscriptions. Mm. Now, um, I raise I just put a little background here. Um, the uh, many newspapers uh, require uh, credit card details for the sub for the uh, engagements of uh, periodical subscriptions. They're often short term. They're not uh, long term subscriptions, and it's different from a printed newspaper, whereby you can have a direct relationship with a news agent. You have a direct relationship with the publishers of. Uh, periodical. I'm wondering what the department's processes are for the approval of access to the communications allowances for that matter. Uh, can you advise me? Senator, um, we can take that on notice for you and provide you with some clarity. There, there are differences between um, what, what can be paid for up front and some items that cannot be um, paid for up front. So if we could take that on notice and, and get back to you. Well, I think you make a good point though, Senator, that the modes by which people are accessing media, for example, are changing quite rapidly. Uh, rapidly. And I can mm. see a need for us to, well, if we haven't already, to you know, update ourselves in the way I'll, we approach I'll, it. I'll say to you, I've had recent cause to come across this problem. Mm. Uh, I can say to you, for the Minister, the departments will undertake subscriptions, uh, which are done on the basis of credit card arrangements. But for a member, the processes are incredibly complicated. Now, my understanding is that your current requirements are that a receipt is not satisfactory, independent receipt's not satisfactory, from my tunes or whatever, mm. that you require a copy of a bank statement, <laughs> which is a ludicrous proposition okay. when... Senator, I'll, that's correct. I'll, I will... I will um, I mean, you can continue to ask questions if you wish, but I will ask uh, the smalls to take it up, and I'll indicate the department we want to. We, we will should take, we'll take that on notice. That my, my point yeah. is, we've got to get in the 21st century, yeah, yeah. and, and more, more and more people. I, I mean, I, 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 I follow it up quickly, yeah. Senator. So, uh, Senator, if I could just add, um, it, it doesn't sound consistent with our current practices. If if uh, we have asked for a bank statement, yeah. so certainly a receipt would sound consistent, but there bank is statement no. is is a no. There is there is a receipt. Uh, iTunes will produce a receipt for you, but the yeah. department has rejected that as a as a validation 
for access to the communications allowance. Certainly, we'll look into that, Senator, and get back to you. Senator Ryan has a follow-up question. It's the same with online subscriptions. So a lot of us have replaced newspapers with yeah. iPad versions. Um, and it might just be <clears throat> there's inconsistent practice around the country. But one of my concerns has been security issues of handing over statements. I have no idea whether they're subject to FOI or not. So we're blacking out everything but the one line. Yes, we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll see all the flowers you bought in the car. <laughs> we'll certainly look at that somewhere. Probably not enough, though. Yeah. Uh, we'll these are all concerns. Sure. Pretty quickly. Senator Bush, we have. <coughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Now, I um, asked some questions in this committee of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet yesterday about some uh, use of planes. I'm not sure whether you're the right people because the information I've got doesn't actually delineate whether the planes were private jets or VIPs. Um, so that you might have a very quick answer for me and I might be out of here. Uh, on the 16th of April, I understand that Minister Plibersek and Minister Butler both flew into the Wynyard Airport. Uh, reports are that they came in on private charter planes. Are you able to confirm whether they were charter planes or whether they were VIPs? We can confirm that those, uh, those aircraft were um, defence VIP aircraft. Okay, no further questions then. Thank you. Thank you. Senator I Ryan. I needed to clarify that for you. Uh, thank you, Senator Polly. Um, could I? Can you pass, Speaker? Yeah, thanks. No, um, very, very funny. Um, could I? Oh, we we're going to have a chat about the CPO office in Sydney in Outcome 2. I just thought I'd start off with that now here in Outcome 3. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. I'll invite uh, Mr Miles to the, to the If table. I could, please. I thought I'd give him a chance to outline some facts before I had it, some questions. Uh, Greg Miles, Senator, uh, Assistant Secretary in the Chief Operating Officer Group. <coughs> um, can you provide an update on <coughs> the changes to the schedule? Um, I note there has been a <clears throat> Another change from the last estimates, which the facility is expected to open now on the 24th of June. That's correct, Senator. I think I very confidently told you last estimates that um, we'd be moving this coming weekend and, um, um, and that the removal was booked, which was, of course, uh, the case until just under two weeks ago um, when um, the site took uh, delivery of um, some glass panels, which in the main were broken. And those glass panels were central to um, providing the final security and fire system sign-offs in the building. So as a result of that, we've had to delay the opening for, for three weeks, to delay the practical completion of the, uh, of the facility for three weeks. Is that all that remains, the only work that remains to be done, other than moving people? Uh, at the same time, or about a day later, Senator, um, a small leak was uh, established that's of a a water type leak um, and it was traced back to a proprietary plumbing product uh, which was established under the tiled floor of an ensuite. Uh, upon um, checking with the, um, with the manufacturer we were told that they couldn't guarantee that there hadn't been a production problem in relation to that item um, and so um, given that we were going to need to delay the opening for three weeks we've taken the uh, that would take the action of actually replacing that particular piece of um, plumbing equipment in each of the en-suites during this three-week period. On its own, that wouldn't have delayed. In um, each of the en-suites? In each of the en-suites, because we can't afford a, something happening. When people are moving. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you say plumbing equipment, are we talking about pipe? It's, well, um, it's actually, it's connected to a pipe. It's basically sort of like a manifold where various bits run into. So it's a plastic box. Okay. And it failed. It's an off-the-shelf product, basically, and it failed. And has the department incurred any cost? No, of no, sir. Um, because I imagine replacing them is not a small job in that many. Well, we have to sort of rip the tiles up <coughs> and put it back in again, so it's no cost, um, to, the, no cost to the Commonwealth Center. Yeah. Now, does the, uh, does the new CPO run on a Wi-Fi network or cabled network? You know, if I bring my laptop in or if I'm logging in? There will be Wi-Fi throughout the CPO. Uh, but it's all, is it also wired for desktop computers? Yes, it is. Um, was there any need for work to be done re-cabling it at any point? Like, 
changing cables from part of offices to others it, it, after it had been done, sort of a correction to cabling work? No, not, not at all that I'm aware of, Senator. Um, and you don't envisage any delay past the 24th of June at this point? No, we've booked the removal list again, Senator. We, uh, can I say that touch wood, Senator? <laughs> Um, sure, if you're one of the you know, nice wood too, um, <laughs> laminate. Um, all right, that's all I have on the um, CPO. Um, could I ask uh, just a couple of questions about Comcar? Um, I just noticed on Oztender, does Comcar tender for work? Um, just on Oztender, there's a handful of contracts where. Um, Taxi services have been provided, or what are described as Comcar services, uh, sorry, Comcar service fees, transport services, and Comcar hire. Um, I can give you the notes if you like, but they're provided to the Australian Crime Commission, the ATO, the APSC, and the NH and MRC, um, and they're all in the amount for just over, or three or for ten thousand dollars, one's for thirty. Does Comcar do tender work for others? No, no, we don't. Uh, Jason Ford, Assistant Secretary, Comcar, Chief Operating Officer of the Group. Uh, no, Comcar does not tender for. for Can work. I give you the contract notes then? You might want to check up because the sure. um, uh, supplier is listed. I'll give. I'll go through them. Um, CN nine six three seven double one. The agency is listed as the Australian Crime Commission. It's dated the twelfth of October two thousand and twelve. The category is taxi cab services for $30,000 from August last year to the end of June this year. The supplier name is Comcar. We do, we do work for other agencies. Just, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Do you sorry, do, yeah. can you just, sorry, I missed where you're reading from, Senator. I'm reading from um, Oztender documents right. and my question... Which and Comcar is listed as the su as successful tenderer, is that yeah. right? Well, listed as supplier. Under, supplier, yeah. rather. Yeah, so you, sorry, my question earlier was, uh, do you supply services to other agencies I, on a tender basis? I should, maybe I should have clarified that. We do supply services to other agencies, but not on a tender basis. Okay. Um, they're just round numbers, that's all, like 30,000, 10,000. How does, how do you supply services to other agencies in that sense? We, we're asked to provide uh, services, for example, for guest to government visits or for uh, an, an event, for uh, typically for car with driver services. Uh, and I, I would imagine if, with, with uh, uh, the amounts that you're reporting, we, we have charged those agencies those amounts and because they're beyond a, a threshold, I think the, the agency are reporting that they've spent, they've, they've procured the services through Comcar, but we certainly do not tender for any work. Yeah, it's just they're round numbers, that's all. I mean, three of them are round numbers. Uh, if an amount for a service is... Well, the APSC, for example, is ten thousand seven hundred and seventy-two dollars and thirty cents. Senator, I suspect they're anticipating that's what they'll spend over a period of time. Okay, so it's yeah. done in advance yeah. rather than. Well, some on. some might do it that way. Yeah, I've, I've heard of those situations before where they, they they know from history they're going to spend about that much over a period of time, so they put it on. I guess there's a question about how appropriate it is to put it on Oz tender because I don't think it really is a tender; it's a procurement. Um, um, but. Um, and normally, uh, you know, Comcar would provide the service and send the bill, and they'd pay the bill. And this is for officers of the organisations that yeah, I'd are imagine eligible for it Comcar. Sounds like it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. agencies. Um, yeah. Some people have got entitlements. Some haven't. So, with, for example, the ATO, there'd be some particular level of officer would That's have an correct. entitlement to Commonwealth Car Service. That's right. Yep. Um, and. Well, just for your information, three are described as limited tender, one's described as a pre-qualified tender. Yeah, well, I'd question whether that's the... Yeah. We'll, we'll check it out, Senator, okay. but I've, I've got questions about it, whether it's appropriate. Mm. Sure. Um, could I turn... That's all I have for Comcar, Mr Ford. Thank you. I... Could I turn to the um, issue of the whole of government supplier arrangement for stationery and office supplies? Certainly. Um, 
Kim Baker, Assistant Secretary, Chief Operating Officer Group. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Ms Baker. Um, is there a specified saving from moving to a whole of government supplier arrangement? For the office, office and stationary supplies? Sorry, yes, yes for the um, uh, stationary and office supplies coming via office max. Yes, there is, Senator. We sent um, out a circular to senators and members announcing that we were moving to a um, whole of government arrangement. And um, in the circular, we talk about more competitive pricing resulting in savings in the order of approximately 14 per cent annum on items purchased using the office requisites and stationary budget. Is there a, um, because these are, these are now in a capped budget amount effectively for yes. members and senators' offices, was there a saving assigned to it with respect to government? Like, was there a line item saving um, yeah. overall because you've assigned that 14 per cent we could get pens and things on average that mm. much cheaper. Senator, I, I, well, you might know, but I will, I, we can take on notice, but my recollection is the better procurement pricing outcomes in, in savings measure in the budget includes a saving from this measure. Yes. Yeah, it does. Yes. Um, and but I don't know if, I, I couldn't disaggregate that. No, that's okay. I I, I, I'll pre if, it, if it contributes to that, I can understand. Yeah. Um, does that include um, the cost of in net terms, the cost of you know, extra transport and freight where people might have previously been seeking reimbursement for things purchased locally? Um, I'm not certain, Senator. Could I take that on notice? Yeah, but one of the reasons is that when we've looked into <coughs> printing issues before, not with, with, with respect to maps, but general government printing, one could often aggregate a contract and make it cheaper to print in one place, but then it's got to be trucked all around the country. And so the saving gets eaten up substantially. Uh, and also, aggregating contracts does limit the ability of MPs and senators to support businesses in their own communities. Um, so I'm always interested in the degree of real saving as opposed to a headline saving that might be otherwise eaten up through other administrative measures or needs. I, I can check on that, Senator, but the provider, um, when moving to the whole of government arrangement, um, the provider prior to that was um, Office Max and it was centrally done through Office Max, the procurement, um, and subsequent with the whole of government arrangement, it's also done through Office Max. So really for senators and members, there's, there's no difference in the way that they access sure. their entitlement. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, now, could I turn to the, um, the flight centre travel contract? It's me, yes. Senator. Yes. Yeah. Um, could you provide an update on some of the issues that I know there was a circular that came out yesterday when we were in this room, I haven't had a chance to read, or the day before, about reporting issues? Um, about there have oh, reporting. reporting issues and our need to comply. Could you provide an update on some of the implementation issues that you've had to address? Um, we commenced using um, Flight Centre Management, FCM, from 1 January this year for um, parliamentary travel, travel services provider contract. Um, there is a requirement, um, a Commonwealth requirement, a, a finance requirement that FCM um, provide to us the cost of travel, individual flights undertaken by parliamentary travellers. And unfortunately in the um, number of months, for the first five months of this year, there's been a, um, a, a blind spot in getting that, act, that information consistently from Flight Centre Management. There's been no detriment to senators, members and staff undertaking the travel. Um, but we require that data in a particular way. And um, up until very recently, Flight Centre have had difficulty in providing that data to finance. We're at a point now, though, um, touch wood, where we should be able to um, provide senators and members with a um, updated travel budget report um, in the next week or two. Okay, and <coughs> so the information that was missing was the cost of individual trips? Um, flowing through to finance, yes. Flowing through to finance. Flowing through now, to finance. The, the transition to flight centre, did that result in a saving for Cornwall? It was a tender process. It was a tender process, process. yes. Um, because there have been a number of other issues 
the flight centre, um, one of which was the publication of private information earlier this year after the changeover, which I'm not going to go into in great detail. I did alert the Minister at the time on the weekend. I'm aware of that, Senator. Um, it did take a few days for Flight Centre to act um, and obviously it wasn't publicised so that no one thought to download it. Um, what was their response to, firstly, the fact that numbers you would not want in a even a closed semi-public domain like this were published, but also um, the time it took to get rid of it? Um, there were um, a number of, um, or two issues in the transition arrangement from the previous travel services provider to flight centre management. Um, and both of those transition, transition issues, as you refer to, took place, um, I think, in the first week of January this year. Um, as soon as flight centre were aware of the issue, um, they sought to, to resolve the issue. Um, the managing director of um, Flight Centre Limited um, provided um, a letter of apology to um, the Special Minister of State, the then Special Minister of State. Um, the, the issue, and it was a transition issue, are, um, there were two issues arose from the fact that um, our contract is very, um, is an unusual contract. Um, the, the type of access that we want parliamentary travellers to have to an online booking tool is unique. Um, there are multiple people within an office who can potentially book travel for others. Um, but of the two issues, um, 26 parliamentary travellers who were given log-on access to book travel, amend travel and profile details, only seven of those 26 people actually accessed the traveller profile information and none of that information was amended. There were no false bookings made. There was... Um, no I'll be honest, I, one of them was in my office who did it inadvertently um, and I asked that person to do it again every day to see how long it took to come down. But we're not talking about... The, the risk here wasn't of false bookings being made, with all due respect. The risk here was the personal contact details of some very sensitive people being published. And it, this, so I, with, with all due respect, I don't think it was, I'm not necessarily blaming the department, but um, it strikes me as a, 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 a incredibly significant oversight on, on Flight Centre's part. Um, and I can't imagine a more serious breach other than if addresses were published. And we, we agree with that, Senator, and uh, I can recall discussions with uh, Minister Gray at the time where we were we spent a lot of time pushing and shoving uh, Flight Centre to get this fixed quickly and uh, and when we uh, felt we demanded a, an apology from the Managing Director rather than from someone lower down in the organisation because we recognised it was a very serious breach as well. Um, now, was there a reason take that this wasn't communicated to members after the situation had been solved, as far as I know? there was no communication to members and senators or other people on that list, and it was a big list, um, that there had been a breach and it had been attended to and there had been an apology. Um, was there? I, I, I might, if there was, I missed it, I'm sorry. No, there wasn't a broader communication. There was um, communication to those officers um, that made contact with the department. Um, can I, can I just, um, and I, I agree with you that it is a serious issue, but of the 113 parliamentary travellers who were given um, login access and who were able to see that company tab that you, um, you refer to... I have to, no idea how. I, I'm not as familiar with the detail of the system, I'll be honest. Um, only three people actually um, accessed that tab okay. and the information contained in that was the person's name um, and a contact um, number. And in some instances, that they were mobile numbers, and in other instances, they may have been the office number for the parliamentarian concerned. Of, true, but one of them was also for the lodge. You know, these were numbers. You know, but these were sensitive numbers. They, they were sensitive numbers, yeah. Senator, yes. Um, so this is a, a thing, uh, the reason I ask all these is that this is the, um, 
every few years we go to a tender. I'm not sure what the length of the contract is. It's three years plus one plus one at the discretion okay. of the Commonwealth. Uh, um, so, given that if we jumping between tenderers now, you said it's a, a unique um, contract. I, I'll be honest. I've worked in multinationals with global providers, and I, I don't think this contract is. Is, is, that, is that unique, other than in the wish for some discretion and probably security? Well, because I've worked for the public sector. <laughs> um, it's yeah, it, oh, but I've worked. But for someone like Flight Centre or HRG, they tend to have contracts bigger than this all the time with much more complex arrangements. The the I, I agree, Senator. The the issue with um, the contract that we have is that there yes, you know, there are multiple people travelling, and that happens everywhere. But there are multiple people travelling. They make multiple bookings for the same day for the same flight. Um, very rarely, um, for, for good reason, does um, a, a traveller make one booking, never change it, and then travel. So they are unique in that instance. There's a degree of intensity, and there's peaks yep. and troughs, I would imagine, in the travel movements. Yes, but um, yeah, it, it's unique from that point of view, and we have always worked very hard with whatever travel provider comes in and um, I have to admit I wasn't around the last time that we moved from I think it might have been um, CWT to HRG. Before my time. There were transition transition issues <coughs> at that time as well. Okay um, I, I think everyone appreciates that I think the department did quite well in terms of advising people of risks make your bookings before this date they'll be transitioned over this date transition phone numbers, you know, so if someone was unlucky enough to be working on New Year's Day, I think they were supported. Um, but um, what I'm particularly interested in is that this tender is going to come up often. Um, what's the department learned to make sure this doesn't happen again? Because, you know, I've just been reminded there were also names of family members published. And just people often go to some, to oh. some, some uh, effort to protect the names of their family members. Um, so what, what are we going to do from this point forward, next time we have a transition, to make sure or have a, a really robust testing system? Because the person who found this found it by accident. The, um, we, um, in my area, we're involved in a number of large tenders for um, parliamentarians. Yep. Um, and I can categorically say that we've taken a number of learnings from this process. Um, I'm confident that FCM will um, be a good travel service provider. Yes, there have been a number of um, issues, um, but we will take um, serious learnings from the, the transition from one provider to the other. Well, I'll just say that from the user end, the transition was managed very well. I don't, I, it was seamless from, 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 from my perspective with bookings being transferred over. So I, I don't want this to be taken as a particularly intense criticism at all. No. I, I think it was a, um, and as I said, over the transition period, I think it was handled very well. I've, yeah. I've been through them before in the corporate world and they were much, much messier. Um, but there were just some unique aspects to this. One of the things you can do, and this has a cost, so you need to be careful, is to have a sort of trial period yeah. where we test the new system, even on dummy runs with some live people. I would, you know, I, senators and members and say, would you p wish to participate in this? Just test run it, see, I, if, we, see if there's any bugs. But you, I, you've got to run a dual system for a, a period of time for that to happen. So I would, there's a downside there in terms of cost, but there's also a benefit in terms of you know, yeah. checking it out. Um, I would respectfully suggest that, I'm not sure how much it would cost, that there are probably people in electorate offices um, who have a, probably a greater awareness of how the system works than people in the department, because they have yeah. us on the phone at, you know, uh, odd hours of the day and night saying yeah. we need to get home or yes, get yeah. out. Yeah. Um, but this particular thing was, I think, more grave than yeah. than, than other yeah. transition yeah. issues. If a plane's late and you miss a taxi or whatever, it doesn't matter. But yeah. Yeah. I know we, we, use that, we did use that approach with the HR system, with the online HR, that we've, which we did internally inside, that it was not tended out, it's slightly different. But we did, um, uh, through the Smothers office, uh, get a number of people to test run it and make sure does it work, you know, because is it usable? And so forth. That was really beneficial, I think, because we sort of got the bugs out of it before we went on, on our life with it. Sure. Are you done? I've got a couple more questions. One more question. I was going to okay. ask for the document we normally get tabled, about sure. the staff yes. to be tabled, before please. Before you go down that, can I just go back uh, while Ms Baker's there to ask a question in relation to the office um, 
uh, provider in terms of um, stationery. Have you, are you aware of any concerns that have been raised in relation to the state in which items are being received <coughs> in some electorate offices in terms of broken boxes, paper, for instance, that arrives, it's not um, able to be used in printers and photocopiers because the state in which it arrives? <laughs> No, Senator, I haven't. Um, I manage the, the, the contract. My area manages the contract. Um, we haven't received that feedback, but we can take that on notice and, and speak with the provider. I, I think that would be good because uh, my understanding is that it's become a common problem okay. that uh, the state of goods, um, not only are they not uh, arriving in a usable state, but quite often they're over a number of periods of time when they come, so it makes it you know, an increasing job for electorate staff to try and reconcile um, whether orders are actually being received or not. So would you be able to take that on notice? Certainly, and Senator. Yes. That would be great. Thank you very much. Senator um, uh, Ryan, sorry. Um, I've got a, I may have a bit more, but I'm, I actually need to go yeah. see if my throat will come back after lunch. I don't have much more, but I'd like I to come back after lunch. I did call the AEC to come in at well, 2, Senator. Yeah. I've got questions coming back 20 minutes worth, Chair. So maybe Is it we go possible to, to do AEC and then so they can go and then come back to the department? Oh, yeah, we can. Yeah. Would that be alright? That would be good because there's a number of questions still. Well, can I yeah. say the AEC? I, I think we've realistically probably only got another app, no more than I've only got a couple of questions for the. the no, this. but Senator. Yeah, I know, but I'm thinking it'll only be it'll only be a, an hour, no more than an hour. Could I, could I ask you, Senator Ryan, just yes. through the chair, did, did you um, request the tabling of the, the personal classifications and the other documents? That... Yeah, I asked the standard. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I, was going to, I think it's, even if, a, even if a committee member doesn't request them, I think it's extremely good practice ongoing for these things to be tabled. And as always, Mr Chun, um, I think it's appropriate for the committee uh, to, to thank the department for preparing these uh, documents. It's, I've said this now over many years. It's, it, it saves a tremendous amount of uh, time. Um, I think exasperation on both sides of the table and uh, the work the department does to, to prepare this um, is, um, is appreciated. I wasn't, um, I wasn't aware, I, I, I didn't hear Senator Ryan request them, but it's obviously a good practice that they be provided anyone. So if you could thank yeah, no, no, those responsible, appreciate Thanks, Thanks Senator, that's appreciated. This I'm happy to wait to ask some questions after. Maybe Senator Ryan could conclude before just, lunch. Could we just have? Uh, can we just have a break? A, a, a break to we resolve the continuing of the agenda. Welcome back. Minister, you have something yes, for the record? Um, to, um, just to also reference uh, the, uh, this is all on the public record, but to put on record um, the change in the chair of the National Broadband Network, uh, Mr Harrison Young, who was the uh, inaugural chair. Um, his term expired on the 14th of March and he decided not to stand for appointment. The government has appointed Ms Siobhan McKenna, who becomes uh, to that role with significant experience, including as a commissioner with the Productivity Commission, director with Prime Media and a partner with McKinsey and Company. Uh, I want to place on record the government again the government's thanks to Mr Harris, Mr Young uh, for his considerable work in, in this role uh, and uh, look forward to continuing to work with Ms McKenna. Thank you very much, Minister. Senator Pratt, you have the call. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chair. This afternoon I've got some questions about parliamentarians' travel entitlements. Bear in mind, we'll cross over at 2.15 to AC. Uh, we'll, will I have time to conclude my questioning now or come back to it afterwards? We'll come back to it afterwards, but if you can get as much as you can done. Okay. I would like to um, begin with to clarify the legislative structure underpinning entitlements, um, noting uh, that Parliament enacted the Renum uh, Remuneration Tribunal Act of 1973 
to establish the remuneration tribunal and authorise it to, de to determine the allowances to be paid to parliamentarians by reason of their membership to parliament. That's correct, isn't it? On the 3rd of October 2012, the tribunal issued determination number 2012-04, which set out various entitlements for members of parliament. Yes, that's correct. I, I believe that's correct. Um, we'd have to check the actual date. But yeah, yes, there okay. is a, a determination by that, yeah. that name. So um, going back to the, that, those determinations and entitlements therefore um, have the authority of parliament um, under the powers of that act. So I'd like to um, ask about um, entitlements under 4.3 of the determination to use car transport at government expense in Canberra to access any reasonable personal services that are not available at Parliament House. Yes. Okay. Um, so the relevant section for the benefit of the committee is a senator or member may use the tra car transport in Canberra for the purposes of personal emergencies, such as dental and medical treatment, funerals, other compassionate circumstances, and reasonable personal services, such as religious services, banking, when these are not available at Parliament House. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. Now, that determination um, would uh, be interpreted more broadly in terms of the full range of things that people might need when they're living away from home, is that correct? I think, uh, are you able to give an, an example? I, I mean, know. each in each going circumstance, to... it would be t depend upon the particular circumstance. I don't know. I've, uh, if I needed to go to Kmart to pick up something at, in Woden Shopping Centre on a Friday after a sitting week because I was here for the weekend and I had no other transport, I assume I could do that under entitlement? It's not clear that you could in those circumstances, but then it's not necessarily to say that, subject to the particular circumstances, that you could not. Right, but I could go and have a meal in at in at K. Yeah. It's it's I, you could have a meal nearby there if that's where you chose to eat that day, perhaps. But not for the explicit purpose of going to Kmart. <coughs> No, Senator, I don't, I don't think it's that clear cut. All right, so I, I guess I'm trying to work out how one tells what is clear cut and what isn't. Um, so I'm trying to work out, uh, have I read the section correctly? So unlike other uses uh, authorised by the determination, the use of cars in Canberra is clearly not um, limited to travel on parliamentary or electric business and parliamentarians can use car transport for travel unrelated to their official duties. Is that correct? You know, we routinely do it. Again, Senator, it would always depend upon the particular circumstances. And if you have a particular circumstance that you would like explored, then that is what we would urge you to contact your relevant entitlements manager and they can give you advice on those particular circumstances. The car transport entitlement is incredibly complex. Um, it's drawn from several sources, um, and you're right, there is the remuneration tribunal determination, um, but there's also an entitlement in the Parliamentary Entitlements Act as well, and they've always provided for broadly consistent but slightly different purposes. Usually it's for parliamentary and electric business that car transport is for, but as you've identified, there are these other nuances out there. Um, so if you do have, it is an incredibly complex entitlement, we'll absolutely Well, I grant do you have that. some specific questions in it, but you know, it does leave me rather concerned when, you know, essentially people live in Canberra when they're not at home, when they're here for a sitting, and when they don't have other transport, they're likely to have uh, a full range of non-work related 
transport requirements, whether that be going to visit people, uh, et cetera. Is that correct? I mean, is it your understanding that that is the case? The, well, I, I mean, I could go through in, in, in detail the sort of the, some of the... To, to give you an example of the, of the complexity, I mean, there is, you're you know, able to t undertake direct travel between the Senate or member's home base, electorate office or place of business and the nearest airport or railway station. Um, you know, and that, for example, is provided under Clause 4.1a and Clause 4.11 of the Remuneration Tribunal mm. Determination with reference to procedural rule. There are other uh, entitlements where services uh, are not available from the airport or railway station nearest a Senate or member's home base. A senator or member may be entitled to car transport for direct travel between his or her home base and the nearest airport or railway station, which does not, which does provide a reasonable service for that journey. That again, that goes to clause 4.1 of the remuneration travel determination. Mm -hmm. There are a long list of circumstances about in different circumstances in which it may be within entitlement. It's probably one of the most complex entitlements that that we have. Okay, so trying know. to answer a simple yes or no, that's in or out, is it, it can be difficult. It, it can indeed be difficult and it's difficult for, um, I can certainly tell you, given what you've said, it's difficult for me to determine which of my activities would be in an outside entitlement. Um, I understand that it's a limitation that is for services that can't be accessed at Parliament House. Is that correct? Sorry, the car transport, can I clarify the yeah. question? Is the car transport entitlement for services that cannot be accessed at Parliament House? Is yeah. that the question? Again, I mean, I think generally if I could just, the car transport is entitlement is for parliamentary or electorate business. Generally, that's the provision on which you need to be engaged in when you're accessing the entitlement. Okay. Well, just, just a, Michael, this is an age-old question. I know the answer to the question I'm going to ask, but just for the record, can you tell us, uh, Ms Pitson, what the definition is of parliamentary and electric business? No, I cannot tell you what the definition of parliamentary and electric business oh, is. Oh, I'm surprised to hear that. But can you explain why you can't? It's, that is because it is for the, uh, each senator or member to determine what is parliamentary or electric business. So if I could use the senator's previous example, mm. if there was a parliamentary or electric purpose for you to go to Kmart, I think that you indicated that, then you may be able to justify that. But if there was not a parliamentary or electric purpose, okay. then... So then I'm sorry, I only, I only interpolate mm. there and interrupt Senator Pratt because I just thought that might <laughs> yes. help. Yes. I mean, it does appear to be an element of the story that we are we're not okay. um, addressing. So Thank you, I, I, I apologise for asking a question to which I knew yes. the answer, but I just thought yeah, it might help. Sense, Thank you. There's been a gap in the, in the uh, arrangements since day one almost. I'm sorry, I missed that. It's been, it's been a gap. And we don't have de clear definitions and therefore we're in, into interpretation all the time. Yes, no, no, I, I, I'm as well aware of that, I can assure you, as I think you probably know, Mr Tune, as you are. Uh, and, and I think it's a... I thought it, it was, might have been helpful to ask that question, mm. even though I knew the answer to yeah. it, given... Given, oh, the, the, me, given, the, given <coughs> the questions that yeah. Senator Pratt... In, in essence, it's the source of the uncertainty. Yeah. Now, I do have further questions, but um, I understand you want to talk to the Australian Electric Commission now. Yes, we will be coming back to it. So we will be calling forward the AEC and we've got no. Senator Rhiannon coming. Yeah. Yep. You after the AEC?
Thank you, uh, everyone. I'll call you to order, and, and I'd like to um, welcome the Australian Electoral Commission and Mr. Killerstein, Electoral Commissioner and other officers, back to estimates. Officers called upon for the first time should an uh, answering a question should state their name and position for the Hansard record, and witnesses and senators should speak clearly into the microphone. Do you have an opening statement? No, Madam Chair. Okay, we'll go to Senator Faulkner. You got the call. Oh, have I? Oh, thank you, um, Chair. I, I appreciate that. Look, um, I don't know if you'd uh, noticed, uh, Mr. Killerstein, but there's been a little bit of debate um, in the Parliament here, and um, more broadly around the uh, some proposed uh, electoral funding legislation, um, and. I appreciate that uh, it's likely that you may not be able to help me at the table, but I thought for uh, what I would ask of you, uh, first of all, whether it would be possible for the AEC to provide the committee with some information in relation either to uh, raw numbers or proportions of donations that appeared in, and I'll say, four categories, from up to $1,000, from $1,000 to $5,000, from $5,000 to the current uh, um, indexed uh, amount, which I think is a little over $12,000. You might be able to provide mm -hmm. that precise figure uh, to us. Uh, and then uh, above that limit. Now, uh, I don't expect you to necessarily carry that information in your back pocket, but what I'm asking you first of all, is it possible, um, uh, would it be possible <coughs> for the AEC in one or other uh, jurisdiction to be able to provide that sort of information to uh, the committee? I'm not interested in a massive make-work exercise. I'm interested to understand whether that sort of information might be available in the first instance. Uh, Ed Killerstein, Electoral Commissioner. <coughs> Senator, we have a number of uh, systems that have been used to record donations over, um, I guess, the last 10 years or so. And uh, we have done some work previously to try and estimate donations according to various ranges. Um, but what I might do, if you would allow me, is ask a subsequent question back to you so I can refine the search criteria, so to speak. Well, I, I haven't asked you to do it. I'm just merely asking whether well, it's possible. Well, and I'm saying we, we can do it, but yeah. it'll be subject to some of the system requirements that we have. So, for example, we didn't have any electronic systems um, that recorded donations. Uh, prior to 1999, we microfished all of those. So to go back prior to 1999 would require a much heavier uh, exercise to go oh, through I would those electronic be, I, records. I would only so be interest, interested in what, what the current or recent patterns are, uh, if, it were if it were possible. Yes. Uh, well, I, I think it is possible um, for us to do that. And as I said, we have done some work uh, previously a number of years ago uh, to try and make some estimates about those ranges. Mr Pirani may have some further information on that, but I think we can do something for you. Uh, Paul Pirani, Chief Legal Officer. Yes, Senator Faulkner, we, we do have um, some information available. We have been um, taking it from the forms and actually entering it into our computer system. So if it's only, I've, I've, I've say, the past two or three financial years, we should be able to extract that for you. Can you either, you or the um, Australian Electoral Commissioner say, is, is this a major make-work exercise or is this something that is would be comparatively easily uh, Look, uh, I'll have to take that on notice. I'm, I'm assuming that it probably is relatively easy because we do our Section 17.2 report, which is the election funding report after yes. each election, and there is an analysis that's done in those <coughs> reports. So um, hopefully it won't be a, a major task, but uh, we'll take that on notice mm -hmm. and uh, respond to you. Well, the reason I say that, um, uh, Commissioner, is because if, if, uh, if it is uh, a, a, a major make-work exercise, I'd, I'd be more than happy for you to come back uh, and, uh, and see if... Um, so take that on um, yep. no, we'll uh, further advice, because I don't actually want to ask a question that is a major um, uh, 
make work exercise, particularly at this time of the electoral cycle, when I know there's a considerable amount of pressure uh, on the AEC. So, uh, Thank you, Senator. We'll I'm, come back to it. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly um, happy to be flexible in that. And if, uh, as, I, as, as you would be aware, um, uh, some of these matters of proportionality of donations have been in the public arena um, in comparatively recent times. Mm -hmm. Um, from figures provided by the AEC, so I thought it might be uh, it might be possible. Uh, my next question is: What was the question you wish to ask me? It was more about the <laughs> range of information, the, the years range, and if we've established that might be a little that out of order. But um, no, no, if it's uh, if it's just the last few financial years, then that's not a problem. Oh, look, it's quite uh, just. Uh, I, I'm just interested in understanding yep. uh, the pattern, if that's possible, and certainly, I think. The only thing of relevance here is recent electoral behaviour, and uh, as I say, I'm trying to limit certainly um, uh, an exercise that would uh, put unfair and undue, um, uh, or have uh, unfair or undue resource implications uh, on the AEC. Particularly, as I say, we're we're at the um, at the um, uh, right at the coal face in terms of the. Uh, the electoral cycle and, and in terms of the AEC's work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No further questions? Oh, there might be, but not, not about the that, moment. Chair. And I, I, can see, I can see Senator Abet chomping at the bit there. Well, Senator Rhiannon has a call. Oh, well, Senator Rhiannon <coughs> almost chomped through the bit, so away we go. Uh, thank you. Interesting analogy. Uh, just further to Senator Faulkner's uh, question, could that data be provided from 1999 on a yearly basis? So it would then be helpful to um, analyse if there's any change in um, the pattern over time and just get a sense of the quantitative data? Well, as I responded to Senator Faulkner, we will have a look at what the um, resource requirements are to produce that data. Our systems have changed uh, over the last decade. I think, indeed, we've had a couple of different computer systems, so we'll go back and have a look at that. Uh, I've started on the basis of the last few financial years, but Senator Rian, and if you've extended that for the last decade, then we'll see what we can do over the last decade. Mm. OK, thank okay. you. Mm. And uh, just, just through the chair to Senator Rhiannon, I think we've got to be a little sensitive here, Senator Rhiannon, about the sorts of um, uh, pressure that the AEC is under in just literally a, a couple of months to an, ele to, uh, yes, to an election. And it may be possible for some of work to be done in terms of um, the recent period and perhaps then after the election, after the electoral event. and, and uh, uh, for, for that to be uh, concluded. I think we ought to be a little sensitive, and I'm not suggesting you're not, but we need to be a little sensitive and flexible to the, to the, to the, the time of the electoral cycle we have and the work that the, the AEC has uh, at, at, um, uh, with just literally a couple of months to go to an election. Yes, no, very much so. But, and, I, and I would agree, not only agree with you, um, Senator Faulkner, but as we don't know the level of work, to be also mindful of it, because we've talked before about sometimes you don't have the, all the resources that you need, that if it came down that you're not able to do it from 1999, what I'd then be suggesting, requesting, is that there's some years before 2006 and some years after 2006. Mm -hmm. I think that's what would be then very useful in terms of helping us to analyse any trends. We'll do our best. Thank you. Uh, just to move on. Um, We've spoken before about online, <coughs> online returns. Mm -hmm. I was just interested in how that's going. There's some, uh, previously, you said that it was going quite well. There was a good take up from both do donors and recipients and would appreciate an update on that. Uh, Senator, I don't have the exact figures with me. Um, in the election report, my recollection is that we had um, a very good uptake from the political parties, and, uh, but we had less of an uptake from donors. But I'll take it on notice and actually give you the exact figures uh, for this financial year as compared to last financial year. 
Yes, it was at the beginning of 2012, so a year, um, more, more than a year ago, and you said that most of the political parties are now using it and a number of donors, particularly large corporations. So if there's been any shift, like any, if any people are dropping off because it's, it's, you know, it's obviously a great advantage um, and just really interested in how it's going. Uh, we totally agree with you, Senator. Um, having it done online means that we have to use less, less resources in transposing it to make it available to the public. Rather than having to search the PDF documents themselves, we're able to extract the information and put it up on the website. If it's lodged online, that extraction process is uh, very, very simple. So um, certainly we advocate the use of the online lodgement uh, facility and with most of the new parties who apply for registration it's something we actively advocate for them to do. And just staying with the issue of disclosure to um, move on to this issue that I think we've talked about before, certainly come up in different forums, is a discrepancy between donor disclosures and party disclosures. Uh, so could you just give us some an update on where, are you still finding a high level of disclosure? And is there, are you coming up with recommendations on what needs to happen about this? Senator, there, there are two issues in what you've raised. One issue goes um, in relation to the fundamentals and a provision in the Act itself. We have a provision in the Act whereby the political party's disclosure obligation does not require them to accumulate to us donations below the threshold. While for a donor, the Act does require them to accumulate donations above, uh, below the threshold. So you will never, um, under the current legislation, you will never be able to fully match a donor declaration uh, form with a recipient declaration form because of the provisions in the Act. So that's issue one. Issue two um, is that, yes, we uh, now have um, an IT system that enables us to uh, quite quickly identify apparent discrepancies. Um, the last time um, when we did this, uh, we ran through it in uh, uh, January and February, and I think we ended up with 24 discrepancies out of all the returns. 24? 24. The number was extremely small oh. and of that number, the last advice I had was the, except for one matter, my recollection is that they had all been resolved. Right. That we had pursued the persons with the uh, uh, reporting obligation as well as with the parties and we were satisfied of the information that was provided to us. There is one matter that, as far as I'm aware, that we haven't resolved, but I will take that on notice, Senator, uh, just to ensure I'm not misleading uh, the committee, uh, as to the numbers of discrepancies that remain outstanding from the 2011-12 financial year. Thank you. And in recent days, there's been a discussion within this um, parliament and within the wider community and in the media about possible changes to electoral funding laws. Were you asked by, um, asked by the government for any advice on this? Senator, we um, provided recommendations to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters that uh, looked at uh, various aspects of the funding and disclosure laws. You might recall that uh, I think we put forward uh, 17 suggestions for, uh, for change. Um, beyond that, um, we've not provided any further uh, or not been involved, rather, in any of the matters that have been uh, discussed uh, between the government and the coalition in reaching uh, the position that they uh, they reached in the in the bill. So, um, obviously, we've been involved in drafting, um, but uh, as to the contents and the final policy matters, that was not for the AEC, and nor have we been involved in those discussions. So, in the recent times, with the latest possible changes your involvement only went as far as actually assisting in drafting? That's correct. As I said, we made uh, 17 recommendations uh, for change. Uh, some of those were in the, uh, the draft bill, uh, some weren't. Um, but as to what got in and what got out, um, that's not a matter that the AEC was involved in. So if you, you have concerns about draft legislation, 
does a point come where you convey that to the government? Well, we convey it through uh, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, as we have done on many, many occasions. And in fact, uh, the 17 measures that I've referred to was, uh, was part of the submission that we made to the Joint Standing Committee on aspects of the current legislation that we thought were of concern, including the issue that you've just discussed in relation to the differences in accumulating donations between political parties and donors. I mean, that was one of the issues that we pointed to. So uh, yes, we'll continue to point to areas of the, of the law that we think uh, need further consideration by Parliament. So all your feedback goes through JSEM, is that the process, is it? Well, it's the primary vehicle by which we're making recommendations to Parliament to uh, um, effect change. Now, that doesn't mean we don't provide advice to the Minister from time to time about the particular interpretation of existing legislation. Uh, it doesn't mean that we haven't suggested to the Minister also that there are particular aspects. Um, but I don't think you'll find that any of the um, submissions that we've made uh, through the Joint Standing Committee are in any way different than what we're saying in other fora. So that's the primary vehicle that we use and will continue to use. But apart from the primary vehicle, because uh, I was interested in this current situation, have you given any advice in recent um, days, weeks or months about the possible changes to the electoral funding laws? Only, in the, context, the, only in the context of drafting uh, okay. the measures that were agreed by government. So only, only in terms of drafting what, that, what was requested to you? Uh, about understanding um, what was being asked of us, that's all. Thank you. I'd just like to move on to the, about the associated entities. Um, we've spoken about this a few times. Uh, so I'd just like, I think probably just to get an update in the first instance of where, um, If you think that the, um, there's a need to rewrite the definition of associated entities, if, the, if this is still something that you view as a shortcoming within the legislation, and how, and the degree of urgency or seriousness that you would give it, what weighting would you give it in the need for changes that are required? Like, well, look, what's your uh, judgment? Yeah, associated entities and the clarification of the definition of associated entities was one of the 17 measures that we submitted to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. Um, we have a view that the current interpretation uh, is difficult. Uh, it's the subject of considerable discussion almost at every estimates um, in relation to particular organisations that may or may not be associated entities. I think the recommendation we have made was to find a more objective test for associated entities. Um, and that will still be our view if the legislation um, as it's currently drafted, as, as it currently enacted rather, continues. Do you know of any other jurisdiction where this has um, been successfully dealt with? Mr. Perron. Uh, Senator, our actual recommendations have been that we would like to abolish the definition of associated entity and to adopt the processes similar to what they have in um, Canada, the UK and the US, where any third party who gets involved in incurring electoral expenditure above a certain threshold is required to register with the relevant electoral authority before they engage in that activity. So um, our, our difficulty at the moment with the, the current definition, is I think we've, we've been through this with uh, GetUp, with um, various other uh, organisations, Coastal Voice, uh, etc., is that the, the definition of uh, substantially acting for the benefit of a particular political party is a test that's imprecise and it causes difficulties. So the way the, um, the overseas jurisdictions have dealt with this matter is they do not have a concept of associated entity. They have a concept of third parties engaged in incurring electoral expenditure, and they have a threshold um, that if you incur expenditure above that threshold, you are required to be registered. And that is a process that uh, the AC has previously recommended to JSCEM, um, and that would um, alleviate, in our view, some of the current difficulties with the, the definition of associated entity. It was recommendation number five of the 17 number measures five. that we made to uh, the Joint Standing Committee. And did you define in terms of the activity, like does electoral activity mean saying vote one 
Does it, no, no, how, do you, how do you define what the, they could It is get? electoral expenditure. So electoral expenditure is currently defined in section 308 of the Electoral Act and it lists things like uh, advertising that requires authorisation. There are a whole range of things that are listed there in section 308 of the Act for electoral expenditure and it's similar to what currently applies for that other category that we have in the Act in section 314 AEB of the Act which is third parties who incur electoral expenditure. We, we just don't see the necessity for a distinction between a third party who incurs electoral expenditure and an associated entity who incurs electoral expenditure. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Could I just ask one follow-up to um, if I can? But it, it, it is true, isn't it, Mr Killerstein, that it's been a very long time since the AEC made a recommendation uh, to uh, or gave um, a submission uh, to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters in relation to a dollar amount for a donation threshold? Uh, yes, it is, Senator, and, and we've, I think, tended to adopt a view that um, for the AEC to um, um, set a particular amount for a disclosure threshold... It wouldn't be the AEC setting, it would be the AEC uh, recommending. Recommending, certainly. Thank you for that uh, correction. Would would not be uh, appropriate for us. I mean, there's no fundamental law that establishes exactly the right level of disclosure. If you look around jurisdictions right across the world, the disclosure threshold is, you know, varies all over the place. So how we could come up with a particular view about the right amount of disclosure threshold, I think would be difficult for us. What we would say, of course, is that disclosure is an important principle, uh, that a lower threshold uh, facilitates disclosure, and the lower the better. However, against that you have to balance the imposition on organisations as well as the AEC. If you have an extraordinarily low threshold and the workload associated with that and the practicalities of it becomes uh, um, unwieldy. So it's finding that right balance between disclosure and reality of what you can practically do. Yeah. Um, but why, but why uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my recollection is that in 1998, um, the Australian Electoral Commission, well, I think that was the last year in submissions and in writing when the AEC actually uh, proposed or recommended a disclosure threshold with a dollar limit. Can you confirm that? I can't confirm it. I'll take it on notice, Senator, but unless Mr Prani's got well, a Well, I'm very on. confident that yeah. I've... You don't think that's right? No, no, Senator, I can't confirm that either. Uh, but can, can I say, if, if we have changed our position, it is probably because we have been exposed to the international experience. One of our submissions to the JSCIM inquiry into political donations, we went through and went through all the jurisdictions in the United States to give details of what the disclosure thresholds were there, what their reporting obligations were, etc. Did the same in Canada, did the same in the UK, and did the same for the relevant Australian states, so that JSCIM was fully informed here was, was what the disclosure thresholds were around in comparative jurisdictions in Australia and around the world, and we remained of the view that, that the actual setting of that threshold was a political decision that should be made by the Parliament. Well, my, my recollection is that, that the AEC's funding and disclosure report of 1998, um, recommendations one, nine and ten did actually uh, include, it was the last time we saw a precise um, uh, figure, so you, you certainly please check that on notice. I'm quietly confident that, um, that that's correct. Uh, and, but I, I acknowledge that what you say, Mr Killerstein, about the principles that the AEC has argued for have been um, consistent uh, over time. Um, but um, I do, uh, I have wondered and, uh, why the change of policy um, uh, at that time, and, and uh, I think I might have previously suggested in 
this and other forums that it might have been because of the then government's um, hike in the uh, disclosure uh, threshold. Uh, however, uh, what, why do you think it's not appropriate for an electoral commission, um, given your uh, the importance of uh, your role in our electoral system, to, to, to have a view beyond principles, to 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 with with given the electoral commissions in the unique position of being able to make an assessment of um, the number of uh, donations with the constraints that exist, which I, I appreciate, uh, the amount of donations, um, and uh, try and balance those issues of uh, uh, transparency uh, along with um, uh, reasonable um, uh, administration uh, logistics which you point out as being the, the balance that we have to take account of. You're in a unique, the AEC is in the best position to make that judgment, surely. Yeah. Look, I, I think in some ways you've answered the question for me. Um, as I said, when you look around jurisdictions, not only in Australia but across the world, you see quite differing levels of, uh, of threshold from some that are uh, comparatively high, uh, such as Australia, uh, and the UK through to those in Canada and the US which are comparatively low. Uh, and all of those thresholds have been, uh, I guess, developed through a political process that's existed in those countries. And so ultimately, it's the political process that I think uh, determines what the final disclosure uh, threshold would be. Uh, however, it doesn't mean that we won't say that the lower the threshold, the better, because that aids transparency, that aids disclosure. Yes, but I, suppose, I understand that and I appreciate, as I say, the principles and they haven't changed. And I accept that and I acknowledge it. But there's a whole lot of areas where the AEC is willing to really nail its colours to the mast with more confidence than it has been since 1998 on the disclosure threshold. And um, some might think that's a little perplexing. Yeah. Well, I'd have to... Um well, you know Go. that. I mean, there's plenty of areas where the AEC is very strong in, in its recommendation and it's very strong and consistent position it's taken in, in some critical areas, not always, by the way, embraced by, by, by government of any political persuasion. Indeed, and uh, often that gets us into a, an argument about whether we're partisan or not. So, um, but I'd have to take on notice, if you wouldn't mind, Senator, going back to the 1998 position and trying to understand what it was that led to the AEC at that time, as you say, making a view or expressing a view on what the appropriate disclosure threshold was. I mean, I could imagine a, an argument that says, well, wouldn't it be good if all jurisdictions in Australia had the same disclosure threshold? And that might drive a particular view, simply because it would be easier for all donors and political parties to have a, a consistent threshold right across uh, all well, of do their you think operations. The different, do you think the different thresholds across different jurisdictions, state, territories and, and Commonwealth, leads to particular administrative problems, perhaps not necessarily for the AEC, but maybe for the, um, uh, the uh, participants uh, in the electoral um, process itself. Well, at first blush, I would think uh, th that's a reasonable proposition to start with, that the, the differing amounts uh, may cause additional uh, administrative burden on, on political parties. Are you able to say what the lowest is in terms of state and territory jurisdictions? I might ask Mr Pirani if he knows that detail. Slight, slight interregnum. It's all right. <laughs> Sorry, Senator. Um, Paul Pirani again. Um, the, there was... Uh, these were listed in a attachment to the JSCM report. Yes. Um, on funding on political parties and election campaigns. And the, I think it is, um, it was certainly now submission to the JSCM, so I, I actually don't have it with me. But um, they go through here with the reporting things within Australia, but I just can't see. Uh, I've got New Zealand, Canada, US, UK. 
But you've got, for example, a, a, a major jurisdiction like New South Wales, you, you could say what the limit is there. You can if we can find it. Uh, $1,000 New South yeah. Wales, $1,000 Queensland, yeah. uh, 2100 Western Australia, $1,000 ACT. So let's just go through it slowly. It's 1000 in New South Wales, yeah? Um, sorry, this is as at the date of this. I, I can't confirm yes, so, in so let's, relation so, to this. So, so for, the, for the completeness of the record, I appreciate that. What date are we speaking of? Um, this report was November 2011. Yeah. So and as of November 2011, it's $1,000 $1, New South Wales, yep. $1,000 Queensland, yep. $2,100 Western Australia, $1,000 in the ACT, yep. $1,500 in the Northern Territory, yep. um, and no uh, thresholds in the other two yep. jurisdictions. Sorry? Indexed. Um, they appear to be flat, Senator, but I'd have to take that on notice. My recollection, if it assists um, uh, Senator Betts, is that I think in these cases they are not in indexed, um, um, Senator. So um, thank you for that. Um, uh, and uh, that represents a, a pretty substantial uh, slice, obviously, of, um, of the jurisdictions in the Commonwealth. Sorry, Western Australia does appear to be indexed. Does it? Okay. Thank you. Um, perhaps that's why it's 2,100. But um, but uh, so 1,000 New South Wales, Queensland, the ACT, 1,500 Northern Territory, and 2,100 Western Australia. And for the completeness of the record, the other states, um, uh, Victoria, South Australia, and Tassie, okay. they don't have a, uh, a threshold. That's correct, isn't it? That's correct, sir. Yeah. And the Commonwealth threshold, which of course is 10,000 indexed, can you just give us what the current figure the is? The current there? figure for this financial year is uh, $12,100, and for the next financial year will be $12,400. Next financial year is $12,400. That's correct, sir. When, when's that worked out? It's um, worked out on a CPI. Uh, figure it's section 321 of our act and it's worked out once every 12 months as opposed to the um, some of the other amounts that are worked out every six months yeah but uh, when do you but I, I, it was a when question if you like a timing question um, yeah it's, it's based on the CPI figures for I'm not sure if it's March over September yeah. and uh, th there's a formula in and do you make a public announcement about we that? do we make a public announcement yes. and it appears on our website yes and so when was that announced uh, I'd have to take that on notice senator but it would have been after the um, CPI figures came out for March it's comparatively recent, though, isn't it? Or it's comparatively recent, yes. Yeah. So twelve thousand four hundred, and you put that on the website, and and do you may get no, no. It will be twelve thousand four hundred for the next financial year. Twelve thousand one hundred at the moment. Which me, yeah, for the next financial year, we're talking about the financial year starting the first of. From 1st of July. July two thousand and thirteen. That's correct. The figure will be twelve thousand four hundred dollars, compared to. 1,000 in New South Wales, 1,000 in Queensland, 2,100 indexed in WA, 1,000 in the ACT and 1,500 in the Northern Territory. That's correct? That's correct, Senator. Thank, um, thank you for that. Do you make efforts uh, when... Oh, I appreciate you play, put so many of these things on your website, which is always difficult for people like me who are so hopeless with websites, but. But uh, do you formally communicate with registered parties and others uh, in relation to this, or is this an accepted process? We, we, do, we don't send out formal letters as such. We do it on our website. We do it in our guides. We right. produce every financial year. We produce documents such as the overview of the Commonwealth Financial Disclosure Scheme, uh, the Financial Disclosure yes. Guide for Political Parties. That's on the website, and we direct all political parties to that um, because it has all the relevant details of what the threshold is and the relevant obligations. And this gets updated every 12 months and gets put up on our website. Right. Uh, 
we, when we also send out the returns, we also draw their attention to this information as well? Yes, well, be, be, because of course um, it won't affect, I, I suspect it's a very small number of donations, for example, that might fall between uh, 12,000 100 and 12,400, but nevertheless, if there is, it needs to be captured. That's correct, Senator. Yeah. So, so we, we give that information Or, or not captured, as the case might be. I, I suspect would be more accurate. So, but we do give out that information when we update the forms every financial year for the returns as well. So the information is actually on the returns. Good. Uh, well, I thank Mr Pirani and, the, uh, and Mr Killerstein for that, and sorry to have interrupted, though. I just wanted to follow that through. Uh, thank you, Senator Rhiannon. Uh, it's oh, I'm sorry. Uh, voting more than once at a particular election is against the law. Is that seen as a civil penalty or a criminal penalty? Senator, you're, there are two offences in section 339 of the Act that relate to voting more than once. There is uh, an offence in section 3391A where a person is guilty of an offence if the person votes more than once in the same election. The penalty for that is 10 penalty units, which a penalty unit at the moment is $170. There is a further offence in section 339, open brackets, 1 capital C, close brackets, where a person is guilty of an offence if the person intentionally votes more than once in the same election. The penalty for that is 60 penalty units or imprisonment for 12 months or both. Now, under the Crimes Act, both of those amounts, because they involve either a fine or imprisonment of less than 12 months, are regarded as a summary offence, not an indictable offence. Right. But nevertheless, a serious matter, you would agree. So can I ask, what advertising or communication does the Australian Electoral Commission engage in to warn people against multiple voting? Uh, that's part of our uh, electoral advertisement suite, if you like, uh, Senator, that operates at election time. We go into a three-phase process. The first phase is around uh, the enrolment phase, as mm -hmm. we call it, to encourage people to enrol. The second phase is around um, the day of voting and where mm -hmm. they can vote. And the third phase is around voting itself. And in that suite, uh, we um, alert people to the fact that it's only... Uh, There's never moment. on a radio ad or a TV ad or newspaper ad, is it, that I've seen or heard or listened to? Uh, that's probably correct, Senator. Yeah, so how do you say it's part of your suite when it's not reaching the uh, community? That would be in the, uh, the householder guide that goes to, uh, to every elector, or to every household, my apologies. There's a householder guide that goes to every... Household. That's these why days, regrettably. That's why it's called a householder guide. But, uh, as opposed to an elector guide. That's yeah, correct. Which is a matter of regret, but uh, that's... Uh, by the by... But say, uh, if all these important matters are all in the householder guide, why do we bother with radio and TV and other advertisements? Well, I, I guess, Senator, it's a question of focusing on uh, the primary message. Mm. And the primary message is around, a, in that case, a formal ballot and how yeah. to, uh, to conduct your ballot correctly in accordance with the full preference system. Can you remind me how many cases of multiple voting we suspected after the last election? Uh, we've ran through this before, yeah, Senator, but uh, in terms of the number of electors who admitted to voting... No, no, not months, admitted, because if you're wise, why would you admit it if you're of a criminal mind or a... Well, I withdraw that, but of a mind to vote more than often, uh, more than once, and you were asked by an official if you were so minded, it would be highly unlikely that you'd say, oh, yeah, I voted. Well, we did have a number of people you, who, oh, when yeah. they were asked, did admit to yes, voting twice. Yes, and, but and they were still not prosecuted, and I, I regret that, but that's... Well, I can run through what we did in relation to taking action oh, against... Well, we, 
We've been through them, yep. but uh, I think you're dealing with the smallest number first. Yes. Yes. How about the biggest number well, first of the actual occasions where we might suspect multiple voting actually did take place? Uh, what I will give you is the number of people where we found that there was more than one mark against their name. Yep, yep. Okay. Uh, so 16,107 were marked twice. Yeah. Uh, 77 were marked three times. 16 were marked four times. Six were marked five times. We had one marked six times. Uh, there was one team. One marked eight times, one marked nine times, and one marked ten times. Yeah. And with all of those cases, as we've explained before, we go through a process oh. to determine whether it is a multiple vote in the terms that Mr Pirani has explained, that is a, an intentional multiple, multiple mm. vote, or whether it was a circumstance where uh, a person oh, accidentally it, multiple voted. Or indeed an electoral official accidentally crossed off the wrong name. Yes, and, uh, that's And correct. I accept the chances yes. are that might possibly even explain 50 per cent of them, but yes. we don't know. And but I can also then give you, of the number that we finally determined were multiple voting, there were 676 that were male, 782 yeah. that were female, and uh, mm. of, the, of the 1,458 who admitted to multiple voting, I can give you an age demographic So women as well. have really taken to the vote after they were granted the vote, it seems. Uh, uh, I can, if you want the statistics, 19... It was a long time ago, Senator. <laughs> I know it was, I know it was, uh, Senator Wong. Um, and I give these statistics for a reason, I, if you just uh, um, bear with me. Uh, 19 were aged 18, 23 mm. were aged 19, 12 were yeah, aged look, 20, and so forth. But by, far the been, yeah. Yeah, but by far the majority were in the aged brackets of six, uh, 56 to 65 were 147. Mm. 66 to 75 years of age, there was 141, and 343 of those multiple votes were for people aged 76 and over. Mm. And look, there are, and I accept this, uh, quite possibly genuine, innocent um, uh, explanations such as a mobile polling booth, rolls past an aged care facility, and then a mm. um, citizen who is civilly minded thinks they should be taking mum or dad to the polling booth on election day and the communication isn't that the mobile polling booth had been passed during the week and so unwittingly um, a parent votes twice. Look, understand all that, but it just seems to me that if a bit more publicity were given to the importance not to vote twice, it might encourage let's say the son or daughter that is thinking of taking mum or dad out to vote on polling day actually does check up yep. um, as to these issues and also that you know, people cannot claim after the event, oh well nobody told me that it, will, it was against the law, I didn't know that you were allowed to vote. Mm. Uh, I know that polling uh, officers ask you have you okay. previously voted etc but uh, it clearly didn't discourage the filler that went round yeah. ten times. Well, just in, ma in that particular case, Senator, it was one of uh, a number of cases that we referred to the Australian Federal yeah, Police yeah. for action. Um, uh, and I, I guess I'm trying to um, assure you that the AUC does oh. take multiple voting seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, we um, prevailed upon the Australian Federal Police to have a what they called a day of action. So all of those cases that we thought were potentially um, grievous or egregious mm. instances of multiple voting were referred to the AFP. Uh, in their day of action, they uh, visited, I think, all but one of the 19 cases, including uh, that case uh, where allegedly there were 10 multiple votes. Mm. And um, uh, on the basis of their report of that day of action, there was no prosecution action that was yeah. available oh, to them. Um, the police there was force, publicity yeah. uh, around that issue. Uh, regrettably, it wasn't taken up as much as we would like. Mm, mm. Um, but uh, uh, that was important, and it also illustrated some of the difficulties around mounting a successful prosecution for multiple voting. 
Well, I suppose that remains to be seen, especially in circumstances where people have admitted to doing it. Uh, one wonders why uh, police warnings were issued rather than the, as, as I understand it, that there is how some, some of them were yes. resolved, mm. rather than the cases actually prosecuted, because uh, you know, democracy to survive actually relies on a huge degree of trust and goodwill between the citizenry and all the authorities that exist. And uh, unless attempts to undermine it are stamped out quickly and forcefully, um, people can start to lose faith in the democratic system. And when you see 16,107 votes, uh, never been much good at maths, but you divide that by 150 electorates, um, I dare say whatever the figure is, some people have got into the parliament by a smaller margin than might have been the multiple votes in their particular electorate. And so, uh, yeah, we really, and I recall the uh, celebrated case of Fran Bailey in the seat of McEwen. Um, so, yeah, sometimes this multiple voting can, chances are it has once or twice, uh, change the makeup of a seat. Chances are never the makeup of a government, but nevertheless, uh, you know, we do have to be careful. Um, and I accept the AEC does what it can. It's just a pity the AFP haven't done more. And so I'm just wondering whether, yeah, raising it in the public consciousness might be a good idea. Look, I'll leave you with yep. that thought, if I may. And. Uh, turn to that wonderful topic of associated entities or not, and my favourite topic, get up. And uh, you will recall that I have uh, put a number of uh, scenario, not scenarios, factual circumstances uh, to the AEC about get up's activities, and uh, we're always told that it's not really an associated entity, it's an independent operator, etc. And uh, yeah, indeed, in 2009, we were even told that to try to distance get up from the Labor Party to remove the ALP taint for good, they appointed as their director Simon Shake, that we now know had been a member of the Labor Party for four years and was a member of the Labor Party at the time of his appointment. And is now a Greens candidate. Oh, yes, yes, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you lose them, don't you, well, Senator Wong? I just think, you know, getting, you know, <laughs> Sometimes you lose should, them on the way through. I, I, I think that, but, you know, but I'm not just, going to go very far saying, you know, that demonstrates Labor bias. <laughs> no, but a left-wing bias, which we have always asserted in favour of the Greens and the ALP. And so, you know, we are told even by the AEC, well, you know, the, this is an independent body, etc. and the ALP, uh, uh, Mr Evan Thornley, who I think was in the upper house in Victoria, now no longer so, but uh, he had been on the board of GetUp and uh, it was trying to remove the ALP taint on GetUp for good that Mr Sheikh was appointed. Now, you know, how cynical can you get when that is sort of thrown out there into the public domain, when at all relevant times, Mr Sheikh was actually a member of the ALP. And I'm just wondering whether that might interest, um, you know, the Electoral Commission to have another look at this organisation, which, which just always has a one-way traffic, and in case that of itself doesn't make you, just in case that doesn't make you uh, too interested, and let me say it made me, well, I've always thought there was a close relationship between GetUp and the ALP. It's now even closer than I had ever thought, uh, given what has now been revealed by Mr Sheik's uh, well, uh, membership Senator, disclosure. Senator, can I just, I'm not sure that this is, I'm going to assume at some point you're coming to a question, but I, I would... Make the point, if you have a look at uh, GetUp's campaigning, 
uh, I would suggest to you that, that uh, any uh, inference or accusation that they're somehow just a pro-ALP uh, organisation is, is, is really, that. really a long that. way from the facts. Pro I mean, I, I've been, I have been uh, very wing. aware of a range of, and it's entirely their right to, but a range of uh, highly critical campaigns of uh, uh, the government as well, Senator. Uh, so. Against Labor and then in favour of the Greens. And we have always asserted well. that it's not one party political, but two party political. And uh, they sort of wax and wane whether the Greens are flavour of the month or the ALP, but uh, are more than happy with a Green ALP majority that uh, has so far guillotined 161 bills through the Senate. But if we have a look at uh, the uh, Get Up um, campaign, um, they're now having local get togethers as they call them, your local event. And we've got a Get Up event at Knott Street, Canberra, where they were promoting Simon Shake, Al Sheik, is it Shake or Shake? Shake? Shake, thank you. Simon Shake uh, as the Green Senate candidate. Now, yeah, how much more evidence do we need that Get Up is pushing a partisan political barrow for electoral benefit for the Green Labor Alliance that, in fact, after the 20 election, formed a formal alliance. Or um, this one under Get Up from hosts Bob and Rosemary Douglas, so we can plot strategy for the local MHR and Senate candidates after having said that um, they were deeply disturbed at the failure in this case, Senator Wong, you'd be pleased to know of both major political parties. I don't know if I'd be pleased. And so, yeah, and so, you know, once again, <laughs> you can read, you can read Green in this, and Get Up is using all its facilities for this purpose. But still, no interest by the AEC to say the one-way traffic and the personnel and the hiding of the fact that one per very important person was actually a member of the ALP. None of this evidence uh, indicates that they might actually be an associated entity. Of the oh. ALP, no, from, uh, with uh, a bloke who ran it, who's been, you know, is no, running no, against no, the No, not of the ALP. Um, I've said of left-wing politics. Because well, we're, we're all the same. It's a bit like the Reds under the chair thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He, you missed the interchange. Really well, the point was. Mm. Oh, I don't, obviously it wasn't a very good joke if I have to explain it to you, Senator. <coughs> Senator, if I can say the AEC monitors all the media reports. Um, when the article came out about uh, Mr Sheik's membership of the ALP, we reviewed the matter again. But as you were aware, we have two difficulties. The first difficulty is the only relevant part of the definition of associated entity that could apply to get up is that it operates wholly or for a significant extent for the benefit of either the ALP or the Greens. That's issue one. Mm. So we have to look at what the activities of GetUp are, not who are the personnel who make up GetUp. GetUp's an incorporated body. It is separate from its members, as uh, we know from corporations' so, law. Yes, so, 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 the the fact so the fact that they so. campaign against us rather than for us a lot of the time would be an illustrative factor. <laughs> That no, is no, it's only that you know, if you're 50% left wing, it's not good enough. You've got to be 75 or 80% left wing. Oh, but that's but typically... So is the IPA in associated as Given that they're uh, people appear here. on television you, you, backing you, you said, all the time, you just, you is said the Australian? We have, you said, Mr Pirani, we have... I think I'm quoting you um, correctly. We have two difficulties. Then you went on to say two issues. Sorry. I mean, they're issues, aren't they? I mean, we, I think that's a better word to use than difficulties. Yes, um, Senator, I, I accept that. So we, we have yeah. two issues. The first one. that I have any, you know, I, I'm, I don't want anyone to misinterpret why I say that. I just think we just, we, you mentioned the first issue, and I think we should uh, be appropriate to mention the second issue. I'm just concerned that the record says difficulties. When I know I knew it's just I know it's just a use of language, but someone, if it's not pointed out, will misinterpret it, and it will mean that you'll be left with an agony into the future. So. 
Thank you, right. Senator. So the first issue, of course, is yes, that Senator definition Senator. of associated entity. The second issue is that the, a corporate entity is separate from the persons who are employed in various offices within that corporate entity. So the, the question for the AC to resolve is, are the activities of the corporate entity known as GetUp, do they fall within the definition of operates wholly or for a significant extent for the benefit of a particular political mm. party. And at the moment, we um, still don't have any evidence that would satisfy us of that. Not any evidence, sufficient evidence. We have evidence of various activities of mm. GetUp, I accept that. Right. We also have evidence of previous associations of various office bearers mm. within GetUp, I accept that. But what we don't have is evidence that they operate wholly or for a significant extent for the benefit of either of the left-wing parties. Oh, you see, you and I disagree on the issue of significant, uh, but look, and accept that. And um, I understand you do so in good faith and that there's no agenda there, I respectfully disagree, but, uh, but sorry, um, if I could one just it. wonders how much evidence we yeah. need to present each and every time there's more and more evidence provided, but we never yeah. seem to get over that threshold of significant. But it is a high threshold, and it's a threshold that was amended back in 2006, I think mm. it was, to increase the threshold. So it's one of the reasons that we've made the point before about trying to move to a more objective test uh, to remove this difference of opinion that seems to be uh, at the root yeah, of the but debate. But it's never been tested, has it? Um, so that third I don't parties know. incurring political expenditure? No, 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 Senator? as to whether that threshold test um, is going to be accepted or not by It has never been court. tested no, by court. No, it's never Senator, been tested. You are correct. All right, look, can I move on? Um, donations from overseas have to be disclosed. Sorry, there, there is no difference between donations that are made in Australia and donations that are made right. from overseas. Right. The, 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 the practical difficulty, though, is that if the donor is located overseas, there is concern that the Commonwealth Electoral Act will not apply to that donor. So that's mm. correct. Yeah. So that, so does it isn't the answer to the question. They have to be disclosed if they're above the threshold. That's what I was saying, Senator. They have to be disclosed by the recipient, but if the donor's overseas, there is no extraterritorial operation of the Act to apply to that donor if they are located overseas. Yeah, I accept that, but clearly if they're below the threshold, what is the circumstance? If they're below the threshold, no disclosure yeah, on so either. I'm just saying, I appreciate what you're saying, but, but it's also true to say they have to be disclosed above the threshold That's and correct. they don't have to be disclosed below the threshold. And the threshold after the um, uh, after the first of July will be twelve thousand four hundred dollars. That's correct, Senator. So, if somebody obtains the services of somebody from overseas as a volunteer, does that have to be disclosed? Uh, no, Senator. Volunteers are excluded from the definition of gift. Right. And if this volunteer, however, is promised free board and lodgings and food and other things, would that be considered the purchasing or obtaining of a um, you know, electoral... So if you spent that amount of money on advertising, you'd have to disclose it. So if you spent that amount of money on having somebody around that, let's say, goes door knocking for you for a month, would that have to be disclosed? Are we talking here about a donation in kind? I want. I'm just, just asking. asking. Look, look, Senator, um, I'd have to take that on notice. Mm -hmm. If you've got some details um, and if it's uh, a real situation, I'm happy to have a look at it. If we're just talking hypothetically, I just think there's a danger here. There are so many variables that I'd end up giving you an answer that could be mm -hmm. misleading. Oh, look, look uh, um, I accept that. It's uh, you know, the situation where uh, uh, GetUp announced that uh, they were getting one or more professional organisers from the US organisation Move On to help its campaign for the upcoming election. So, you know, um, once again, GetUp, uh, 
I don't know who they're campaigning for. I know it's not my side of politics, well, but, um, <laughs> but um, you know, call me perceptive, call me perceptive or whatever you like, but um, I don't think they're doing it for that, but well, they're I, I clearly the recruiting people to campaign for the upcoming anything. election. And uh, they said we have a gentleman's agreement to reciprocate in kind at some point in the future. No money changes hands. But, but Senator, the so, difficulty with that, GetUp's not a donor or a political party that would have reporting obligations. At best, GetUp uh, would be a third party incurring political expenditure under Section 314 AEB of the Act, and there are limited categories under 314 AEB of what they would have to disclose on a return. So they wouldn't have either a donor obligation, and because there's nothing going to a political party, or would they have a recipient obligation in uh, relation to not being a political party or engaging mm. in political expenditure, but if they were involved in actually incurring a political expenditure under 314 AB, they'd have a return. So I, I'm just not quite sure how that would fit in with any donor obligation oh, well, definition look, of gift. We are back to where we yep. started. Yeah, one guess uh, of GetUp's uh, professional organisers uh, working for the upcoming election campaign. They're not going to be working for the Liberal Party, not for the National Party, not for Christian Democrats, not for Family First. Um, I wonder who they're going to work for, but still not significant evidence according uh, according to you and uh, yeah nothing else we can do but accept that but uh, I think the picture is being painted more and more that uh, these people are actively engaged and uh, do exist for a specific purpose that's why they were initially bankrolled by the left-wing CFMEU and the list goes on but despite that mountain of evidence um, we are told that it's still not significant all right. Look, thank you, Chair. Excellent. Any further? Yes, I've Senator got that. I might just oh, share yeah. a yeah. couple of documents. If, um, this one we're familiar with. We usually have them tabled. Yeah, I'll table them now. Sorry. They're... Sorry, I don't mean it's not a stunt or anything. No, it's a copy of the same page. material. I've only got two. So you not a sure it's already been. Um, you wouldn't be interested tabled. then, Senator Abetz? Um, no, it's a it's a little. I'm trying to. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, we had a. Um, um, just, just just a moment, Senator. I'm trying to. We, we had a, a question to an earlier department regarding uh, lies, so called lies in authorised uh, election material. And I'm try, I want to ask the Electoral Commission how they deal with um, those particular questions using the two examples that are before so, us. Okay, so what we need then is a resolution. This. Um, which date is, is okay? So my to understanding is some that that poster was um, distributed at the Lindsay uh, election in 2007, and clearly it is unauthorised election material. That you know, I don't personally know the source of it, and it's kind of the reason why election material gets authorised. So the first document is the document that the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters considered in their report into the events in Lindsay uh, following the 2007 general election. Okay. It was also the document that led to the uh, prosecutions in the New South Wales courts. Then, with that information, then uh, we can resolve as a committee to have that document tabled. And the other doctor, Senator, your uh, other document that you're referring That's to, Senator, been, yeah. has already been tabled. Yes, so That's correct. You have the call, Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Chair. I appreciate that. Um, so my question is to um, uh, understand, I guess, how the context of authorised material and the question of truthfulness in um, material that is distributed. Clearly, the department gave evidence this morning, and this is not uh, not relevant to my question, because um, but, but it's important for background in the context of my question to you. The department gave evidence that it does not consider 
um, are the truthfulness of material, rather that uh, it's the amount of material they distribute and are under parliamentary entitlements. And that the question of whether the material is truthful or not um, is not a question that they deal with. So my question is to, is to uh, the Electoral Commission the extent to which those questions apply to um, election material and indeed material that's distributed by members of parliament, which may or may not fall inside um, uh, an election period, noting um, that my question is, to my mind, it would seem the key question is um, not necessarily the truthfulness of any document, but rather if it be authorised, that you have that accountability for the, for the sourcing of that material. Is that correct? Senator, the AEC actually produces a document called the Electoral Background mm -hmm. on Electoral Advertising, and our powers are very, very clear. Our powers uh, in relation to these sorts of documents is to require that the person who authorised the document, their name has to appear, plus the street address where they can be contacted at during normal business hours, plus if it's printed by a printer, the business uh, name of the printer and their address. So the provisions of section 328 are aimed at ensuring that people are made aware of the source of the electoral advertising and accordingly if they have a concern about that they are able to contact the person who authorised it and if necessary commence legal proceedings and serve them at the relevant street address. The AEC has not been given any role in dealing with the contents mm. of electoral adv advertising with one exception. And that one exception is section 329 of the Electoral Act, which deals with misleading and deceptive advertising that affects how a person casts their vote. That only operates during the writ period. That's mm -hmm. the period between the issue of the writs for an election and polling day. And the High Court has read down that power so that virtually it can only apply to how to vote cards. So the, the, the whole schema of that part of the Act is on the basis that it is up to electors to determine the truthfulness of the contents of electoral advertising. It is not our role to deal with that, and the electors make up their mind as to how they cast their votes on polling day. Okay. And it would seem that parliamentary entitlements are dealt with in a, in a consistent way in general. I know that's not a question uh, for you, but it, you know, it, it seems that, in a sense, parliamentary entitlements require a similar authorisation so that um, uh, at election time they can proceed and be accountable in a similar way. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Ryan. Oh, thank you. What a range of issues to go through, Mr Killerstein. Um, could I turn to your reappointment? I asked some questions the other day of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, now, if I'm correct, your term was to expire on the 4th of January next year? That's correct, sir. There was a press release from the Special Minister of State on the 12th of April this year uh, that announced your uh, reappointment from the 5th of January next year for a further term? That's correct, sir. Um, and, Minister, you may be able to answer these questions, because um, I was directed here by Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, they outlined the process that would normally take place for this. Uh, and so I was wondering, when did the Special Minister of State write to the Prime Minister to commence the reappointment process? Uh, I'll have to take that on notice, Senator. Uh, um, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, I think uh, you were probably referred to the fact that the Cabinet Handbook does uh, are, require that ministers advise heads of statutory offices uh, in writing at least four months for the, before the expiry of their appointment as to whether they intend to reappoint. Um, we obviously have a merit-based process um, and Mr Pillerstein is a very experienced administrator who's served both um, governments of both political persuasions and the country um, very effectively. Uh, but I don't have details of the dates of process. Okay. Happy to take it on notice. Because it, you know, it, it did, I think, fair to say, surprise a number of people that an appointment for a term expiring in January next year was announced in April of this year. Um, and 
as far as I'm aware, um, the guidelines that you referred to about the notification, which I think was due on the 4th of September, um, were... Which would not be an opportune time to decide whether or not you're reappointing the head of no. the Electoral Commission, no, no, that I was the point I was making. No, I, know, I appreciate that. But the, um, those guidelines, I mean, the Cabinet Handbook also says, I'm just trying to find the right window, um, that... Um, as a general rule, proposals should be submitted for consideration well in advance of the time the position is to be filled, but usually no more than three months in advance. So the guidelines which fall under that, which require the, or which set a target to let the appointee know that uh, five months beforehand, so four months beforehand, which is September. It strikes me that you know we're only a couple of weeks from there be being able to be a government able to make such an announcement of one persuasion or the other, and statistically that government is more than likely more likely to be elected with a majority in the House of Representatives, just because that happens much more often than not, and the mathematics work out that way. Um, but the, but we have drawn it forward so very far merely to avoid what would be a, a 10 or 12 or 14 day delay. What is your difficulty with the appointment, Senator? My appointment is, I, I'm wondering, I, I'm the, I have not I had mean, a, heard a... The pr process is... I've not heard a persuasive well, argument as to why a term expiring best, in January. Well, because we thought he was the best person for the job. So, and so what is, the, what is the limit on how far forward the government thinks it should be appointing people? Well, I, I'm happy to take on notice. Um, the dates you've asked for, uh, I have to say, uh, it would seem to me to be a, a sensible thing um, to give the Commission certainty over a period which involves uh, an election, the finalisation of the results of an election and a referendum. Uh, I think that's, there's a public interest there. And as so I all, said, all of which and, will be resolved in ja uh, by and, January. And, oh, and uh, the government's view is uh, Mr Killerstein is uh, uh, an extremely experienced administrator. He served governments of uh, both political persuasion in this statutory office effectively. Uh, and uh, there was there is a, a public interest to ensuring uh, he continues. This now, is... I'm happy to take on notice some of the details about process. If you want, I don't have those to hand. Well, this is... Um... Not our reflection on Mr Killerstein, that's why I'm talking... That's why I'm asking you, is it? Well, I'm making it clear it's not. But well, that's good, a process then you won't worry that... about the appointment then. No, I'm actually worried about the government's behaviour. Well, if, you, if you're happy with the outcome... No, no, process Senator. matters. I know the no. government doesn't think it no, does. No, no, I no. do. Well. Um, so <laughs> let's... To meet the various timelines that were, that were outlined to us, because this is an appointment that goes to the Federal Executive Council, uh, it is clear that... Um, the process for this commenced well before April, you know, somewhere, a, a matter of weeks, uh, but the timeline to give notice of something for a meeting uh, of the Federal Executive Council meant that uh, it was more than likely more than a month. Now, that would mean a process for an appointment that came up in January, well after the period where, you know, if the appointment expired in October, I could take your argument, Senator Wall, um, but the by January, the election and the referendum are out of the way. We, one way or another, there's a government, the referendum result is clear. The AEC is into its non-election phase. Um, this process of commencement, had the process of reappointment, had to commence 10 months before the term expired. Well, uh, you're, you're hypothesising over the time frame that I've taken on notice. And so you don't see any particular issue with, type, with, with eight months plus? We know I, it's eight I months. I see no issue with the appointment of the man on my the left. The process, I'm asking. I see no issue with the reappointment of the man sitting to my left. He served the country well. You, see no, you have no issue? I, you're not I, commenting I, on the process? I, 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 I repeat my previous answer. OK, so you're not commenting on the process? No, um, I, no I have told you I will take that on notice. I've asked you whether you whether you have a view on the process. Do I think it was wrong for the government to reappoint the Electoral Commissioner? No. Oh, that's not what I'm asking. Well, you know that's Senator, Senator Wong. Uh, um, I, I I'll don't. take that as a typical non-answer. Now, Mr Killerstein, what was the extent of the contact 
if any, between yourself and the minister or yourself and the prime minister regarding the reappointment, your reappointment? One of the things about the way in which the commission is treated is we try, we have both tried as political parties to make sure they are dealt with in a non-partisan way, and you are really walking very close to the edge. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be threatened Seriously, by you, Senator. You Wong. really are. I'm asking very reasonable, factual questions. And there is a there I, is a public interest and a national interest to to not allow that to occur. Stop. Get get off the soapbox well, for once. Well, you get off your soapbox. No, I'm actually asking factual well, questions. Everybody, no everybody in, my in voice. this room knows what you're trying to do. Well, what is that? Peer into my soul. No, I try not Peer to into my side. I try not to do that, Senator. Oh, you try not to. You'll just sledge. You'll just make allegations. Senator According Ryan, to you, can Senator Wong, I can't ask factual Ryan, questions. Can we go back to some questions? There's been no explanation as to why this appointment was made 10 months earlier. And there's been no explanation and as to why you have such difficulty with it. I have no difficulty with well, the, with the think, Commissioner. The public, but to you, the, the outcome the is the only thing that matters, isn't no, it? No, the public the process statements, doesn't matter the public to you. statements of the Coalition make very clear. This government's disregard that, the process know, has made ha, you did, is there clear. Are some, I don't know if you're amongst them, but clearly some of you your colleagues didn't yes. like the outcome, and that's why you're this. focusing on process. So don't pretend it's you're not... pure in this. Don't pretend. Don't, don't you allege, uh, Sen try and tar people Jackman, merely because you don't like the comments. Senator Ryan, why are you so sensitive? I'm not Senator sensitive Ryan, at all. I, I, I am far from sensitive about, about your Ryan, allegations. Can you uh, resist um, um, responding far from to sensitive. objections and just um, put your question? Please. I'm asking factual questions. Um, was there, I mean, the, the, the extent of the contact I asked Mr Killerstein, if there was any, I have no idea about this process, um, between yourself and the Minister or yourself and the Prime Minister regarding your reappointment? Well, I'm not uh, the controller of the process, uh, Senator. Yeah, I realise that. It uh, may so be entirely reactive. Um, I was asked to provide um, the, the normal declarations of conflict of interest. Um, uh, CV, uh, which I provided, and that was fed into the, the process. Uh, that was around uh, March, uh, is my recollection, um, Senator. So um, obviously I indicated to the Minister that I was um, um, interested in continuing uh, my appointment. Um, that was on the basis of um, what I thought was an important issue of continuity around some pretty fundamental reforms that we've been taking forward in relation to the AEC's organisation and its organisational structure. And beyond that, uh, the process, um, I had no further contact uh, with, uh, with the Minister or indeed with the Prime Minister. I think that would be unusual. But yeah, I, that was a genuine query, so yeah. whether you had any contact with the Prime Minister. So uh, following that, you were effectively advised of the outcome or That's the recommendation correct. slash outcome. I'm not sure what the process would be. Well, you receive a letter from the governor, uh, sorry, from the minister, uh, indicating that the governor general had uh, had signed off the appointment. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so if we go back to the, the first stage, you did mention there, Mr. Killerstein, that you had notified the minister of your interest in um, continuing um, in the position, and you mentioned a number of, of reasons when was that? Uh, Do you have re regular meetings with the minister in, in that and this? Um, well, um, yes, you have uh, regular meetings with ministers. That's fairly common. Um, it would have been last year sometime. Um, the particular initiatives that we are focusing on are what we call larger work units. Uh, what, sorry? My larger work units. I know it's a, a, um, a fairly um, uninteresting phrase, but it reflects some pretty fundamental changes to the organisational shape of the AEC, uh, where we're bringing together the small divisional offices and uh, creating larger work units. So it's an amalgamation of, uh, of those divisional offices. Uh, that program has just started. We um, started in South Australia uh, late last year. Uh, with um, the opening of our, what we call the Adelaide Metropolitan Office, which brings together nine offices. Um, <coughs> and we have now plans for uh, that to roll out. We've just, we're about a halfway through WA, uh, but there's uh, significant changes also for your own state, uh, Senator, in Victoria, uh, where the, the, the plan that we have is to create uh, 
uh, four hubs of six offices uh, servicing the um, inner metropolitan uh, divisions. Uh, they're quite fundamental changes. Um, and they are replacing the, the old divisional office? Uh, they replace the divisional office uh, footprint, if you like. Yeah. The, the electorates are still there, so as obviously, as, uh, as distinct the entities. members in the other place get quite passionate about that, probably more so. Oh, indeed, and, and we've worked very carefully to try and um, consult with, uh, with all of the, the members that are affected. Bearing in mind that this process is one that I guess started back in 1972 with some fairly small amalgamations, some co-locations as we were... I wasn't were born called. then, Mr Killestine. No. Um, uh, and uh, it's now uh, rolling out in a much wider uh, way, but um, you know, it's going to take us uh, quite some time uh, to finish that off. It also has some pretty uh, significant implications for the staff in the AEC. Um, so uh, uh, I believe that uh, you know there was a sense in which I'd like to see that through. Um, I appreciate that, Mr. Gillestein. So you said last year. Could I safely assume late last year? I... Uh, look, I, I can't recall was it a conversation? precisely. Uh, yes, it would have been a conversation. And you heard no more about it until earlier this year when you were asked to provide those forms? That's correct. And there was only that one conversation about it? Um, the Minister and I had had a number of conversations about the larger work unit strategy. Um, more, so, yeah, particularly and it may have been in that context, I think. Okay, that, uh, okay. Uh, thank you for that, Mr Killestein. Um, that's all I wish to deal with on that issue. Um, but any, I'm moving to another issue unless... Um, the call, Senator. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Killerstein, last time we spoke, we had had the announcement of the election, proposed election date by the Prime Minister. Uh, and I think there was some discussion about that. Um, while not being 100% reliable in a parliamentary system, there could always be an early one. The truth is it gave the AEC time to plan probably more than it normally would with a specific date in mind. Um, do, where are you at in that? In, in your planning phase for September 14? With, you know, logistics I'm, I'm talking about here. Yeah, I mean, we're pretty confident about uh, the election, but let me just uh, um, go back a bit. Um, the AEC always operates on the basis of being election ready, uh, irrespective of whether a date is known or not. And uh, as I think, as I've uh, said before, uh, to estimates, or it may have been the Joint Standing Committee, that you know, given the uh, the state of Parliament and its somewhat precarious position from time to time. Uh, we accelerated all of our election preparation plans uh, almost immediately uh, after the 2010 election. Yeah, I, I and so we've that. been we've been effectively ready at any time, and we're still ready. The logistics are well in place. Uh, paper orders have been made. Paper stocks are there. Um, Booking. Uh, bookings, uh, polling places, uh, polling staff are being engaged progressively. Um, <coughs> and the fact that we have a 14 September date actually is to our advantage, particularly with trying to recruit something in the order of 70,000 polling uh, officials. That's the number now with the referendum thrown in. Uh, 70,000 so that we can say to them, look, it is the 14th of September. Can you tell us if you're available or not? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very confident um, about our logistical preparations. We audit that uh, every few months um, to make sure that we haven't overlooked anything. And with respect to um, polling places, excuse me, um, uh, when will you be in a position to provide uh, locations of polling places for September 14? Uh, can I ask the Assistant Commissioner Elections Branch to answer that question, please? Marie, Marie Nielsen. Assistant Commissioner Elections. Yeah. Uh, we're expecting to load... We're just doing some final testing on our systems to make sure that this stuff can load accurately up to um, the AEC website. Um, and at the moment, we're planning to have the first load mid-June, and then that's of all the polling places <coughs> that we've got earmarked for um, Election Day. We'll do an update on 1st of July and an update on the 1st of August. 
Uh, once the writ's issue, we'll then, um, we're expecting to upload that information daily and also at that stage we'll be able to confirm pre-poll voting centre information, mobile polling information and that will also be uploaded daily throughout the election period. I've just to follow up to that particular thing, I understand the Senator Chipotle wants to go to break. Um, the pre-poll... Oh, sorry. Senator, um, oh, sorry. Um, Ms Nielsen, the pre-poll locations, you won't be in a position to announce until, I understand mobile requires, a bit, is different, but um, this situation probably allows more planning for pre-poll. Um, you won't be in a position to provide information on pre-poll locations until the issue of the writs? Um, that will be loaded up to the website once the um, information is confirmed in our system. So once we've got the schedules finalised and we've got the premises confirmed with the venue owners, then we'll start uploading that each day. So confirmed information will, as soon as it's confirmed, will be uploaded that night. Um, so when would you expect to have confirmed information for pre-poll locations? Fairly not... soon after the writs issue. Um, oh, okay, because... so no earlier yeah. than that for pre-poll? Beg your pardon? No earlier than that for pre-poll, as no, opposed to September thinking. 14. Okay. Yeah. Um, and how many <coughs> pre-poll... Are you expecting there to be a... In the last few elections, have seen an increase in pre-poll locations. Do we have a, a target yet or uh, a, a set criteria for the determination of the number of pre-poll locations if there's going to be a change from last time? No, we don't have those numbers yet. So how are you determining whether you know, Higgins gets three and Kuyong gets two uh, because you know, they may have you know, areas in common, you know, with, or you know, sort of transport routes that are in common, um, you might be able to put one for two there, but how are we determining how many pre-poll locations? Senator, we, what we, if you'd like, we can take that on notice and get you information about the pre-poll locations that are currently being planned. There's a question of being sure. gazetted versus planned, and so I think a lot of that information is is available to you, uh, to us. Um, bear in mind, however, that um, most of the polling places and pre-poll centres are likely to be pretty similar to yeah. what we've had in the past, so I'd be very surprised if there are major, major differences that you wouldn't be, um, that, that would cause you surprise, if I can put it that way. Can you remind the committee uh, sign of the date for Gazettal? Because we... Yeah, I, I don't know uh, that. For pre-poll voting centres, there is no set date. Uh, you might be thinking about... Um, well, I mean, well, I'm just I'm picking up on the Commissioner's use of language of Gazettal. If it's, a, if it's gazetted, there must be a date of gazettal. They haven't been gazetted yet. No, so, I, yeah. no. Um, no, I appreciate that. Yep, so we'll, we'll find that information for yep, you. So well, I don't let me, know. Let me yep. take it back a step. Does a pre-poll place, a pre-polling place, require gazettal? It requires publication now, not gazettal. So it's published on trial. Okay, so we should, the, the technical term we should use is publication. I'm using old language. Yes, my apologies, uh, yeah, and, that, that, I'm, yeah. and I'm just exploring yep. your use yep. of old language. Yep. I'm not critical. I just, yep. just want to be clear about. So it, hence the question about the requirement for gazettal. So it's publication, but there is a requirement in terms of timing about publication, is there not? Uh, generally, pre-poll centres have to be published before polling starts, yes. unless um, for some emergency reason yes. they need to be set up fairly, and then they have to be gazetted as soon as possible, uh, published, sorry, <laughs> as soon as possible afterwards, so. Yeah. yeah, any information that was available on the planning would be yep. appreciated, and the reason I say that is that um, the involvement of volunteers is, yep. you know, one of the better features of our electoral system, I think, comparatively, and that, because the, the length and scale of pre-polling now requires, I think, probably more planning for those volunteers than does the Saturday itself, which the, many people have already sort of marked, as you had. But I'll come back up. Did you want to go to a break, Senator You'll Pollock? go to a break. We'll come back at uh, 4.05. Thank you. With the AEC. With the AEC. Yeah. I can call you to order. Senator Ryan, you have a call. Uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> could we turn to the... Uh, just to clarify, 
The AEC has nothing to do with the National Civics Education Campaign for the referendum. That's all entirely regional Australia, isn't it? That's correct. Yep. That focuses on just the yes-no case. We reproduce the yes-no case in the booklet. We also have an advertising campaign that goes to the formality of the referendum ballot. But in terms of the various pros and cons of uh, that people need to consider in relation to whether they vote yes or no to the referendum that's question, all. Yep. that's uh, for the Department of Region. Now, uh, is it a... I can't remember last... I only, like 99. Do you write yes or no or do you tick yes or no on the ballot paper for a referendum? Senator, the Act actually says you have to write yes or no. However, in 1999, there was a federal court decision that said you could, uh, that a tick on a cross was able to satisfy the formality rules. But the Act says yes or no. So a federal court decision in 1999? Yes. What, does, what case was that? Um, no, if you, you, you almost know these things off the top of your head, Mr Barani. Extra points. But if you don't, feel free to take it on notice. No, look, I will have to take it on notice. But um, it was a single judge of the federal court and uh, it was taken by one of the um, uh, people who were uh, opposing the Republic. Yep. Um, it was one of the groups from Sydney. Um, oh, OK. Well, is it um, Benley? Uh, look, I'll I have to take Benley it on notice. from the Australian Monarchist League. That's the name of the case. OK, I'll get emails occasionally. Um, so a tick and a cross, is that interpreted? The, the federal court held that, that there is provision of the Act where uh, the formality rules apply, which says as long as the intention of the voter is clear, then that could be taken into account. And the court construed the uh, two different requirements in the Act between the intention of the voter being paramount, plus the requirement to do yes or no, yep. and they held that a tick or a cross was a valid vote in a referendum. And a tick and a cross? Um, because look, that could be interpreted either way, yes and no as well, I suppose. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll have to take that on sure. notice. But, but the court did go through that in some detail okay. because the formality rules that we had published prior to the referendum were disputed by Mr Benley. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I'll look that up. Um, so where it's Benwell and... Philip Benwell, it would be. Philip Benwell yep. is the uh, name of the person. Um, thank you. And um, it's Benwell and Gray and the Electoral Commissioner and the electronic citation is 1999 FCA, which is Federal Court Australia, case number 1532. Thanks. That's very handy. Senator, if I can just clarify, yep. um, you asked about a tick and a cross. Um, since 99, there's only been a single question on each ballot paper. So if it was a tick and a cross, it's likely it's informal. Sure. Yep. Um, where is the um, Commission at? with respect to uh, preparations for the referendum, even though I understand the bill was introduced in the House this week, the actual formal Section 128 bill? Um, well, obviously, we've been aware of the prospects of a referendum for uh, some considerable period of time, and, and we've taken some decisions, for example, to um, procure uh, relevant paper stocks and to make sure that they're available. Uh, it's a relatively low risk decision because we can always, use the if the referendum doesn't happen, we can use the paper elsewhere. Uh, right. We've made all the um, estimates that we need in terms of um, uh, polling officials. Uh, so because there's an extra uh, uh, ballot paper to issue, that increases the um, table loadings, if you like. Uh, so that generates additional staffing. All of that's been communicated to our uh, divisional officers and they're currently in the process of securing staff. Um, the advertising suite is being put together. Uh, we're doing market testing on a range of issues including the design of the yes no booklet. Um, so various concepts are being tested and we hope to be in a position to be able to conclude that uh, very shortly. What, uh, I, I'm only familiar with the one from 88 and I've pulled a few old ones out well, of the library. Um, yeah. What, um, what are you testing? Up? The world's changed a bit since the last sure. Yes No book. Was um, so we've tested uh, basically two versions uh, of the Yes No booklet. One is where the um, Yes case and the No case are presented uh, together on the page, bearing in mind that it's likely that both of the yes-no cases will be in the order of, you know, it could be up to a dozen pages, mm. so it limits 2,000. Yep. So one of the designs, which was the one used uh, in 1998, was that each page is 
together, and so you move across the, the pages. Yep. The alternative uh, one that we're testing is that you do the yes no case first and then the no case first. So there's considerable market testing. We haven't yet reached a view on what the best one is um, about uh, those two designs. Yeah. Historically, <coughs> it's been the former, hasn't it? Historically, it's been the former. When have been the um, Let me engage the experts on this. Perhaps um, uh, Cathy, yeah. uh, Cathy Mitchell, who's our Assistant Commissioner, Education and Communications. Um, Cathy Mitchell, Assistant Commissioner, Education and Communications. Senator, at the 1999 referendum, the uh, yes-no cases were presented in a side-by-side -side format, so that the yes case was on the left-hand page and the right case, uh, the no case was on the right-hand page. Um, and this time around, we're testing whether um, the, the way in which people consume information has changed considerably in the intervening 14 years, and so we're testing different formats of the yes-no case booklet to determine which is the most logical presentation and the most readable presentation for people at, at this point in time. And as the Commissioner just uh, described for you, we're te we've tested both a side-by-side -side format mm. and a one case following on after the other format. Is this solely a matter for your decision, Mr Gillestein? Uh, yes, we, uh, there's no legislative prescription no, um, as my recollection, but we do print uh, guidelines uh, for the way in which the yes-no cases are presented. I think it's a position that the AEC has adopted quite appropriately in my view uh, to um, remove the potential for uh, any apparent bias in the yes-no mm. cases by specifying uh, principles and guidelines and templates for the production of the, of the yes-no booklet. Uh, and so... In 88, I think it was done side by side as well. Uh, I yes, don't know, but... My understanding is yeah. that in 88 it was presented in a similar format, but we did not dictate um, the typeface and no. style no. at that point in time. We did, after complaints in the, uh, the 1988 referendum about uh, the different uh, presentation of sure. the cases, we <coughs> implemented a process where we were... Um, much more guiding in the way in which we expected the um, cases to be presented to us. It is within the Commissioner's purview because he has, uh, it's his job to print this product for him to determine um, some... Sure. Um, I suppose I've never heard of this proposal before, Mr Killerstein. Which proposal? To, to have them, the yes case at the oh, front and the yes, no case at yes. the back. I've only ever seen them mm. side by side. Um, it, it, it may concerns some that the side by the status quo is the side by side option uh, and it does have the benefit of people not only seeing one side of the argument at any given point in time unless they're folding it um, and I rarely use the word conservative to describe myself but you know in constitutional matters I think there's a um, the hi history others is might. sorry others might and not anyone who knows me <laughs> um, lots of other names but usually not conservative um, the lesson has been that, um, and this is probably not as much of a consideration for yourself, that changing things is, you know, tends to promote suspicion when it comes to referenda. Mm. Uh, would you take into account the views of those, or uh, sorry, take a step back. As I understand it, the cases that are submitted to you for publication are prepared by a majority of those members who voted yes for the proposal in the parliament and a majority of those members who voted no. That's correct. Uh, there's no minimum numeric requirement on that other than I gather it's plural. Is that correct? Because it's, it's, the act seems to be say plural. When I was I dealing with it just refers to a committee. But, uh... no, it, it actually refers to members of parliament. Mem but yeah. yeah, section 11 I think it is. I, I, we, we dealt with the Machinery Changes Act. So there's no minimum there. So um, my rough guess of what would be at the moment is there'd be more voting yes, a lot more voting yes than no, so um, the, the no group would be smaller. Yeah. Um, would you take into account views those groups had on change to the booklet? Uh, uh, yeah, look, I'm more than happy to, to take those views into account, but uh, I mean, our interest, as I think everyone's interest, is in ensuring 
that a booklet is readable, it's understandable, it's easily digestible. You know, they're the broad principles that we're looking at and that's the sorts of things that we're trying to, to test with the various designs. I should say that some of the initial testing is showing that people don't like the side-by-side -side format. Now, they find it confusing. But your point about the presentation and apparent bias that might be... Putting one at the front bias, and one at the back. Exactly, yes. That, so, and that really can't be tested. Well, there was another alternative uh, version which I think we did in one case where it didn't matter. You could turn the booklet over so that you either started with a yes in front or the no in front. Yes, yeah, so you have uh, one upside down yeah. and counterfacing. Yeah, so, so, but that um, makes the reading of the whole thing as a booklet more difficult because you're flipping it upside down and closing it. That's, that's correct. That's correct. So we're just trying to test all of these things. But um, So what yeah. are the criteria you're going to use to make a change? Because my, my, my personal view would be that the absent a, a, a reason to change, this is a pretty long-standing you know, method we have of informing yeah. our voters um, in Australia. I mean, I, no secret I objected to the changes to remove every elector from receiving one. Um, but to change it further, you know... It... Yep. Uh, look, I haven't yet made the decision about change. We are trying to ensure that whatever we produce is the best document for purposes of informing uh, electors generally. And so the criteria will be around what the market testing tells us in relation to readability, understandability, digestibility and so forth. Um, um. And so, all right, let's go through what the market... I mean, I'll be honest, I consider this to be a very serious issue. Because, and so do we, sir. Um, I, and I, 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 while it might sound strange coming from politicians, market testing doesn't answer every question. Um, what are you doing... Like, what, what is the scale of the market testing? Which groups are you using? Is it... Um, uh, I'm assuming there's going to be an age and uh, demographic spread. But, you know, what are the consultants we're using? How many groups are we doing? Sorry, I, just cons I wasn't yep, aware that this change, change to this was under consideration. Um, well, I'll actually have to take some of the answer to that question on notice, Senator Ryan. We have done two um, phases of testing, and the most recent phase of testing has just concluded. And I don't have with me the detail in relation to the number of groups and the number of attendees um, in relation to that testing. There was initial testing done um, in January 2012, and 12 groups uh, across Victoria, New South Wales, and South Australia were involved in that testing. There was uh, the full age range of from yep. 18 to, to how, however old we could um, in interest people in attending these focus groups, and um, there were uh, a couple of formats that were presented at that testing. Um, so. At that stage in time, there was very clear views in relation to um, the side-by-side -side testing. And my understanding, based on early feedback from the latest round of testing, is that uh, the views presented by uh, people attending the testing are the same. And that is that they actually find it more confusing to have the information presented side-by-side. -side. They expect um, that the information, the yes-no cases would um, counter one another when they're presented side by side. And of course, they don't do that because they're prepared separately and independently. So at this stage in time, the indications are that people understand it better when the case follows one after the other. Now, as the commissioner has indicated, this is early. Um, he, he will take into account a range of factors. So if the researchers let's say, leading one way, what are the other factors that are going to be taken into account? Um, the degree to which it's... So one of the things that we need to get back from the research, which was only just completed last week, so I don't have all of the results yet. So part of what we need to take into account is the degree to which that, that was a prevalent um, result from the, the, the testing. So if it's close, if there's not that much difference between what people think, that might be a factor that's taken into account. Well, I was, yeah, I was going to say... But, Senator, the, the, uh, the factor that uh, you've referred to, that is the impression of whether there's any inbuilt bias as a consequence of the design of the booklet is something that I will take into account, and I've already expressed that view. Uh, 
uh, in our uh, discussions on how we take this forward. It's an important factor that, uh, that we need to, to take into account. Um, Senator Abetz's point is exactly right about trust in the system. And so, uh, you know, how we engage that and, and leverage that trust is important. And we don't want to do anything that a perception could arise that we have, uh, we've done something to try and generate a particular bias in one direction. So, um, so when, do you, when will you be making this decision? Well, we've got to make it fairly quickly because... Um, the bill's got to be through within three weeks. So. That's right, yes. Yeah. So um, our instructions are, my instructions to, uh, to the office is that we have to finalise these guidelines so that as soon as the bill is passed, we can be engaging with the various members of parliament that are forming the yes-no case on what we expect in relation to um, the yes-no case that they're preparing. Do you plan on making a public announcement or just informing the members of parliament that vote uh, reads Look, I hadn't, I hadn't turned my mind to that, uh, Senator, so uh, um, I'll give it some thought. I don't think there's been... In the past, I'd have to look at whether there was anything in the past about I just, I, 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 yeah. As someone that's more informed on these issues than most, because I have a sort of a sick yep. obsession, um, the truth is that I think consider the fact that you are considering change will come as a surprise to a great many <coughs> of people who share an interest. And I'm not making a judgment about that, but it surprised me, and I think it will surprise a lot of others. But I expect if you go back in history, the uh, issue is considered every time there's a referendum. Yeah, I don't think people realise it's yeah. been considered. I think they've just seen the booklets. And sure. we don't have them that often. There's been, yeah. you know, one in my voting lifetime. Yep. Um, so people's memory is really going to be, you know, 77, 88, well, or 88, well, in, 99. In fact, Senator, the, the research is showing that people don't remember. Yeah. Um, mm. In fact, the, what the research is showing us is that they don't even understand what a referendum is let alone remember having seen a yes-no case booklet yeah. in the past. So, um, so actually, I think we're probably starting with a relatively clean slate. So other than the booklet, which I assume this time will be up on a website as well as I think it was in 99, yep. um, the yes-no booklet, what other inf as yeah, if referendum directed information campaigns that aren't, of course, related to the proposal is the Commission considering? <laughs> so, Senator, we um, conduct an advertising campaign at every electoral event that, and the Commission has indicated previously um, today that that has three phases to it. So there is a close of roles phase, what we refer to as a voter services phase, which is about um, if you can't make it to a polling place on polling day, there are early voting options available, and a formality phase which tells you about how to complete your ballot papers. The close of roles and voter services phases are being updated, of the advertising campaign are being updated to mention that um, the referendum as well as the election. So if the referendum proceeds, we would roll out advertising that reminded people that they needed to get enrolled, not just for election, but for the referendum. And the same with voter services. The additional advertising that will be, is being created at the moment is about how to complete your referendum ballot paper correctly. So we will have advertising at, uh, about that um, Normally we would have that a one week phase of formality advertising because of the addition of the referendum, uh, the possible referendum, we're looking at expanding that advertising to two weeks. The advertising that we do appears across television, radio, print and um, online. So we are looking at the best mechanisms to reach the different audiences. We also translate our material. We've increased the number of languages in, into which we're going to translate, and that will be 28 languages for this electoral event. Um, we are also uh, focusing ahead of a known date for, well, hopefully a known date for an uh, electoral event on um, uh, enrolment stimulation at the moment. So we, we have actually this week commenced digital advertising, promoting the need to update your enrolment ahead of the electoral event. And we will be um, <coughs> engaging in some PR activities uh, closer to the, um, plan, the planned election at this stage in time to so promote enrolment. The additional um, advertising, and I'll, I'll turn to the um, 
amusing, the, the strangely named pre-election enrolment stimulation thing I noticed in the budget papers um, in a minute. But the advertising for the referendum is focused on the event itself, formality and enrolment. Is that effectively the three? You know, and by the event itself, I mean it's happening. You've got to vote, to, you've got to vote twice on the 14th. Um, there'll also be some advertising that relates to the availability of the yes-no case pamphlet. Sure. Now, the referendum machinery provisions changes that went through a couple of weeks ago, Mr Pirani, I'm just clarifying, in terms of the impact that has on the, the conduct of a referendum, it means the booklet no longer goes to each elector, it goes to a household at which an elector is. Is Sorry, the actual amendment refers to <coughs> an address, an address so that we have um, from the roll. So, so the, the starting off point is that we will be examining the address information that we already have in our database to attempt to ensure that it goes to every address. Then it escalates to the electoral commissioner is able to send it to any other address which he believes appropriate. Then it escalates a third level to enable it to be done by email. So, so the basic one is sent to an address that's based on an address that we have in the electoral roll at the moment where an elector resides. Then it goes to any other address that the electoral commissioner um, deems to be appropriate. And then the third tier is that it can go by email if a person so requests it. I was going to say, if approach. they don't request it, I don't have much expectation that it won't end up in the junk mail folder. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but if I could just stress this email issue, because I know that was the subject of some debate in Parliament. Uh, it's not, um, for us, a mainstream um, vehicle for distributing the yes, no information. It's, it would only be where a person requests that yeah, information. Was, that's handy to know. It was more debated in the House in the Senate, I think, that particular yep. issue. Yep. Um, now, I'm just trying to reassure that we're yeah, not appreciate. using emails as the mainstream vehicle. So have you given, like, you know, previously this was done by Aus Auspost, this was mailed to every elector. This is quite a different change, um, quite a big change. How do you plan to deliver it? Is it going to go through Auspost unaddressed mail? Are we using CellMap to go with the Coles catalogue? or? Uh, um, <coughs> Senator, we'll be using Australia Post for the delivery and we'll be using a combination of mechanisms that Australia Post has available to it to ensure that we actually get to every enrolled address. The householder uh, drop will be the first process that we will use, um, but that does not guarantee delivery to every enrolled address. So we've actually started conversation with Australia Post to do, uh, undertake a, a dress matching process by make... householder drop, you mean the Australia Post unaddressed mail service? Yes, so, so it will be the unaddressed mail. Then the next option is their semi-addressed mail for those addresses at which um, the householder drop does not reach. And then after that, we will be looking at parcel delivery for those addresses at which there are multiple res residents. So places like nursing homes where you know, one per household might seem insufficient for the needs of the particular yeah, address. Sure. Uh, and with uh, Auspost unaddressed mail, that doesn't get blocked from no junk mail or anything like that. It goes in. No, yeah, that okay. doesn't. They still deliver. Sure. So it's it's considered official mail. Sure. Um, so, Mr. Kill, uh, just to sort of emphasise this, um, uh, 9.4 million addresses that are currently uh, on our electoral I, roll. Uh, We've had this discussion before. I think to the householder has a very big, dip, different impact than to the address to the person. I mean, we've had that discussion before. Yeah, and but there's also some that. research that suggests that uh, the householder guide, as it uh, for election purposes, is actually very well received, and so the evidence suggests that the uh, yes no case to the householder will be. Um, have that equivalent. It might mean the next householder guy at the election they think they, re they think is actually political propaganda and that might not open it in 2016. But Senator, unprompted at our research, um, the people who are attending the research actually suggested that in these days and times it was appropriate for it to be one per household. Can I respectfully suggest I've done a lot of that market research, I've done it in the corporate world, and one can be so easily misguided by five focus groups of people. It's this is why past practice has, you know, been past practice for a long time, and there's more danger in change than there is in doing it the other way. But people say that, but 
Indeed, we'd be, we'd be criticised equally if we just made a decision and didn't consult with uh, the community. So, I mean, I think we're doing our best to find the, the most informative vehicle for getting this. I was referring more to the discussion around should it go to the householder or to the individual Mr. elector, and you and I have had that debate before, yep. Mr Com <coughs> uh, Commissioner. Uh, so, in terms of if we assume this, uh, uh, the Section 128 alteration bill is passed in the second week of the sitting fortnight, you know, last week of June. Um, what's the timeline from there, Mr Pirani, for Mr Killerstein to consult with the members of parliament that voted yes and those who voted no uh, for the preparation of the materials? We yes. don't consult. It's 28 days. No, no, I think they, they get to speak to Mr Killerstein because he has the final say. I mean, they can't produce something that's... No, they have 28 days, as I understand it, to produce the yes, no yep. uh, cases we will provide to them the broad template that we would expect, sure. you know, font size, uh, margin size, yep. all those sorts of things. And that would include the format of the booklet, wouldn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, whether you're going to go side yes. by side or whatever. That's correct. Uh, <clears throat> now, I think that's all I had with respect to the... Well, it's... Now, it's, is it 16 weeks this Saturday to the referendum? I'm just trying to count. To the referendum or to the election, or both? Yeah, I'll be referendum. <laughs> um, mate, your, um, your submission to the uh, Joint Standing Committee on the Recognition of Local Government, Mr Killerstein, said there are significant risks associated with campaign development in such a short time frame. This is referring to a 17-week campaign. For example, the period for market testing included is too short to provide assurance that the advertising materials are fit for purpose. Uh, for mainstream and a range of special audiences, the truncated timeline includes suppliers working across weekends and public holidays. Estimated costs will increase as a result. So what are the issues you're running into now sort of that reflect that in terms of increased costs um, and compressed timelines, which I imagine are applying to some of this testing that Ms Mitchell's been talking about? Yeah. Look, I'll get uh, Ms Mitchell to, to answer further, but I should make it clear mm. that we... Um, in putting forward a 27-week time frame, we were judging that on the basis of the government requirements for <coughs> conducting uh, campaigns. Uh, and so that's an optimal time frame, if you like. Um, we've never said that uh, doing it in less time frame actually provides, um, you know, that, that means that we couldn't do it. No, you said it had risks. Yeah, that's, it had risks. That's, all, that's, that's why I decided to read the direct quote well, rather than try to assure you. Because there's been some suggestion that the fact that we haven't got 27 week, weeks means that we can't do it. Oh, I don't think, well. Senator, we've mitigated those risks by actually um, sitting the advertising that we plan within our existing advertising framework, which has been used at the last two elections, is well market tested, um, well researched and well understood by the electorate both um, market testing beforehand and research at the time of delivery has indicated that people fully understand the messages that um, we are delivering. So we believe that the uh, referendum advertising being situated within that same framework of advertising will convey the messages appropriately, but we will be market testing. We'll be in the field market testing the concept for the formality, uh, the referendum formality um, advertising coming in the week commencing 3rd of June. Sure. Um, could I turn now to the um, measure in the budget papers, the $7.3 million for pre-election enrolment stimulation and information campaign. Um, what is the... Now we're in the world of automatic enrolment, which I'll turn to next. Um, uh, and I'll say direct enrolment before you correct me again, Mr Killerstein. Um, what is the, the purpose of that particular measure? What, what, what are you going after that you're missing with direct automatic yeah. enrolment? Well, I, I think I'm only repeating myself before about direct enrolment. Uh, I've never, ever said that direct enrolment or direct update is the panacea for the level of under enrolment that we're experiencing. Uh, direct enrolment is based on uh, information that we obtain from Centrelink and from driver's licences bureaus around the state. So it, it, it has a limitation in the sense that it is only the clients of those organisations for which we are getting data and for which therefore the opportunity presents itself uh, for uh, some sort of direct action. There are still 
many, many thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of people that are not going to be caught by those provisions. And, and therefore, feedback to my office from automatic enrolments, any truth, with some very unhappy people being caught. Uh, and indeed, and, and some of the complaints that we've had are people that have adopted a, an ideological position about, uh, about what we're doing in putting them on the roll. But um, the, the law is that you will enrol. It's compulsory to enrol. So I, I, I have to accept those complaints, but we move forward. Um, a small number of complaints, mind you, out of the thousands of people that we have taken direct action on, but there's a small number of complaints. Uh, so, in, against the background of uh, um, uh, a significant number of people still unenrolled, against the background of direct enrolment activities, which is not the panacea, um, it is simply one of our toolkit uh, for improving the levels of enrolment, we are still in the mode of doing as much as possible to promote voluntary uh, enrolment uh, by uh, citizens. And so the program that we, that the government has, uh, has uh, provided funding for uh, is aimed at that. Uh, we start in a low key way, uh, as uh, Ms Mitchell has said, with some digital uh, promotional activities. But at the end of July, I think, we start with a traditional large scale media uh, approach so this, again. Yeah, so this is what we would normally see in, the, in, in an election year, the enrolment campaign. Um, exactly, yeah, but so what, we've, hadn't... what we've done is moved it forward so that it comes out of the period that starts on issue of the writ and it starts two weeks before the issue of the writ. So it's trying to uh, take advantage of the fact that we now have the date uh, and start the, the campaign two weeks before. That's good for um, getting as many people on the roll as possible. It supplements our normal uh, close of roles period, but it's also good for us in the sense of managing the workload because it, uh, it will smooth out the workload over a longer period than having it concentrated in a very sm short time frame. Sure. Um, well, could I turn now to automatic enrolment? Yep. Um, and it's obviously been rolled out in Victoria. I'm not sure. And I was, uh, quite widely. I wasn't sure where we were, how far you had rolled it out over, since the start of the year, because I know last year you were using it in, in, in parts to test some systems. So is it being rolled out right across the country at the moment? Uh, yes, it is now. What we did was progressively roll it out state by state, sure. starting obviously very small with Tasmania, and then progressively we've added states so that you know, in the first cycle, and I think we're up to five cycles now, the first cycle might have only, only included one state, which is Tasmania. Uh, by the fifth cycle, I think we now have all states being incorporated, and we have three more cycles to go before we um, stop direct action, and they will all include uh, all states. But again, entirely dependent upon the data that we get from Centrelink. I appreciate that. And, and, uh, and, and I'm just comparing for a couple of seats in Victoria, the numbers from April last year to April this year, which was, um, the numbers were quite striking. So uh, for the seat of Jagger Jagger in April last year, the cycle had 392 um, new enrollees into the electorate, and this year it had 1,031. Um, in, and and the, uh, some other seats broadly reflected those proportions, give or take sort of 20%. Um, this, of course, we get the information through the cycle of new enrollees. Um, um, are, are, does that, are we seeing similar numbers of people removed, or, you know, cleansed, for lack of a better way of putting it, from the roll or moved to new addresses? Because I'm not sure what the proportion of people being added through automatic enrolment was people who weren't previously captured versus people with updated addresses, which... Uh, I'll ask um, Andrew Gately, our Assistant Commissioner of Role Management, to answer that. Uh, Andrew Gately, Assistant Commissioner of Role Management. Senator, we're seeing about, uh, of those numbers, we've seen about 95,000 uh, people either uh, directly enrolled or re-enrolled, so yep. people that have been on the roll in the past. Um, that's about 20% of the overall number of transactions we've done through the direct enrolment process. So, so you've done half a million, just under half a million by now? Uh, about, that's about right, 480... Wow. 5,000, give or take. Um, and over what... What period is that? So that's over the period uh, commencing, we commenced, as you mentioned earlier, in Tasmania um, late last calendar year. 
December. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was. So would you expect that, you know, you're capturing a lot of people who have slipped out of the net either through falling off the roll, through never enrolling or through never updating their address? So I can understand why at the start there might be a, uh, a larger number than you might have two or three years later with a regular automatic enrolment process. <coughs> Excuse so, me. <coughs> So, Senator, uh, I guess the answer to that is yes. Uh, so, the mix at the moment that we're um, in terms of new enrolments and re-enrolments. So, the I don't have the split uh, in front of me, but there's a um, re-enrolments. Uh, we rely on some of the historical information we've got about the individual, um, and so we are picking up a number of people that have been uh, on the roll in the past at various points. Um, and then there's a proportion of that uh, a group that is actually uh, have become entitled in the past we hadn't picked up previously and have been picked up in this process. So wouldn't there be a third category though? You've got the new enrollees, I think that is those who have never been enrolled. That's correct. You've got re-enrollees which are those who have dropped off the roll. How many people are you catching who might still be on the roll at their old address but have never been stripped off the roll? I in the sense that shouldn't that be a third category because... But if they're on the roll... Sorry? If they're on the roll already, is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, they're on so the they're, roll. So they're effectively a change of address? Yeah, a change yeah. of address. Um, is that... So that's the that's yeah. the category that I spoke about is the 80%. So okay. it's about yeah. 380,000 transactions yeah. out of the 480,000 that are changes of address, so movement of people. And that's... Uh, that's still a real, it's, it's only a proportion of the overall movement that we're seeing in the role. So we still see a lot of action in terms of self-starting activity, people getting online and changing yeah, their sure. address and things like that. So that, that split is not unusual either. I mean, when, I, when we look at the vast bulk of transactions that we do, uh, enrolment transactions, it's always changes of address, yeah, sure. which by far outstrips new enrolments. Oh, yep. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, do you have a list <coughs> that you, you, you could probably take on notice of databases you are drawing upon to you know to start the data matching checking process that you do internally you know Vic Roads database New South Wales RTA I know one of your databases you were using was um, year 12 graduations and then no you could, I, oh sorry I thought that was one you were going to use and you could match it with no the, the, there are two primary data sources that give us information about individuals that we compare against the role, yep. and that's Centrelink data and driver's licence data. Like, okay. But we then compare for purposes of confirming the person's identity with a range of other databases. They're not used to determine whether a person is or on the role or not, or whether they've moved, but they're used to compare identity issues uh, and that includes births, deaths and marriages yep. and we're progressively uh, engaging with the various state registrars to build that data in. We've got passports data and we've got immigration data. So, but they're only... The source databases are... They're confirming their databases yep. rather than driving the number yep. of people so that we might... The, the source databases to instigate the updates or changes are driver's licences, Centrelink, and then you Centrelink. have a range of verification databases. That's correct. So if someone comes out of a driver's licence database and... Um, uh, they've changed their address, uh, then how many of those other databases do you sort of check them through? Or is it, at, d depending on the purpose, like if it's a change of address, you might check one database, but if it's a, another activity, like a new enrolment, you might check another database to ch check they're a citizen, whereas if they're on the roll, you can probably assume they're already a citizen or otherwise eligible. How does that process work from... So we apply, Senator, we apply the same rules in terms of... So we don't... Uh, so, for example, we don't uh, take the Centrelink and the driver's licence information and um, only take action if the person is represented in both. So we use those as, as fundamental sources. But then for all activity that we undertake, we cross-check against the other information that we've so got. They're all so they That's right, yeah. Um, and what do you do... Presumably it's more than, it's not uncommon to have a, an alert pop up which is spelling mistake in the name or in the address or something. Um, how do you resolve those? So you've got someone from a driver's licence, uh, it's spelt differently, you know, than a similar name in a similar suburb uh, to someone who's got a similar birthday, which you've found from other databases. 
How do you resolve those and where do you? So Senator, we have a, um, much of the work that we've done around the direct enrolment program is built on the 15 years or so of uh, what we've called the continuous roll update program yep. that you might have heard about in the past, where we built some fairly sophisticated approaches to um, taking all of those data sets that we're using for direct enrolment and a broader group uh, and and managing the same sort of process in terms of cross-matching information between uh, the electoral roll and all of those information sources. So in broad terms, where there's a, a clear match between the information that's appeared um, from uh, the external data source, uh, Centrelink or the driver's licence databases against the role, um, and there's no uncertainty there, so that includes information about the identity of the individual, so name and date of birth, um, as well as uh, the addressing information uh, in terms of its correlation to our existing address register, which is a, um, a reference resource, I guess you could say, is another data set that we, that we create and hold. Um, if there's clarity there, then we will progress to action. If there's some uncertainty in turn within certain parameters, if there's some uncertainty, so uh, there might be, um, and as you can imagine, there are some vagaries around the way people represent their names, so their, their, their first and middle names um, in different data sets. If there's some uncertainty uh, within certain parameters, we will throw that match to our staff across the divisional office network for a, an eyeball to actually make a decision as to whether sure. or not it appears um, that the match that has been proposed is accurate. The staff have the opportunity to either decide whether or not that should be included and matched and progress, or whether it should be removed. So it might be removed and become just a letter that is sent to the elector saying, we know something about you, please get online and fill in a form. Sure. So there's a, there's, a, there's a number of different steps in that process. Are you keeping data on the number of you know, after you've enrolled someone, you can send you send them a letter, don't you, to inform them they've been enrolled? We do, Senator, just and like we do for any other enrolment, yes. Um, the, I won't recount the differences again, but we've been there. Um, so do you keeping data on the percentage of those being returned as inaccurate, if uh, any? We keep, well, we keep stats across a variety of different circumstances. <coughs> so obviously, in some cases, we get returned to send a mail, just like we would in any other process. But in this case, it's different because you've enrolled the person. No, we don't, no, so maybe it's worth just reiterating the process. We don't enrol the person until we go through the process of, one, determining that we think we should take action, and then writing to the elector, giving them 28 days to respond to us, um, and then post that 28 day period, then we'll progress to take the enrolment action. So, so uh, if you, uh, have you enrolled people for whom you've had returned to send a mail? I uh, suppose this, is, this goes to, um, you know, you send them the letter, if you don't hear back in 28 days, you can enrol them. What happens if you do get a return to send a mail in 28 days, or indeed a return to send a mail outside that 28 day period? Senator, so if we get a return to send a mail during the 28 day period, we cease action in relation to that proposed action, so we don't progress it. There are some instances where we do get return to send a mail post 28 days, um, and then we will um, go through the process of either, either making a determination in terms of whether we've made a mistake and um, reverse that action. We back or, out, Senator. If, what's that, if, sorry? If it's a return to send a mail and we've applied the direct enrolment, we back it out. In, in other words, we revert to the record as it was. Sure. That's okay. a clear... And that applies to a new enrollee and a... Yes, yes. So if, if the return to send a mail happens while we're in the middle of the process, we stop action. Yeah. But if it, if it comes after we've applied the direct enrolment, we back it out. Do you have data on the number of times you've had to do that through this process? Oh, I'd have to take that on notice. It's quite I'd appreciate a lot of data. if you had data on the both separately, uh, you know, during the 28 day period where you stopped or paused or whatever the process, um, and secondly, where you then had to particularly revert and yeah. amend the role to reflect as the Commissioner we'll said, we'll where see it was we can get that data for you. Um, I, I would assume that particularly around the latter one, you would keep, you'd be very careful about keeping statistics because you'd want to keep a record of the accuracy of the role. Mm. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's more about whether that has been recorded in our notes, if you like, or in the, in the, in the sure. record. So uh, um, let me check that. Yeah, I appreciate that because I would imagine, given the discussions around this bill um, and the implementation of this, I think there'd be a bit of disappointment if there wasn't a number of 
And I think we've had discussions about whether there would be data around errors collected. Data around errors. You know, if errors, you added someone, right. I, I think yep. you know, to not have data on the number of errors, I think would reopen the whole debate. Whereas, you know, we, I lost my side of the argument. But if you are adding people like this, you surely would have to keep data on. Sure, and and exactly the same applies. I know we've had this debate, as you said, yep. about errors that were made previously yeah. to object people off when they yes. shouldn't have been objected. Yeah, off. but we had data around it. Yeah. Um, so, if I could turn now to a question on notice that you provided to the last estimates. I'm just trying to pull it up now, which was F42. And it was with respect to the announcement of election date and postal oh. vote applications. Yep. to the application of <coughs> the election announcement to section 99 capital B 1AI and 1844 of the Commonwealth Electoral Act. Yeah, so that's um, enrolment and postal vote applications yeah. were the two provisions. Um, and um, I think I was just looking at section 184 when I asked the question. Mm. Section 184, and I, I appreciate an explanation of how the legal advice came to this conclusion. Mr. Pirani, I know I don't have access to the legal advice, but um, you're particularly on top of this. But section 1844 says an application for a postal vote may not be made until after the issue. Um, no, sorry, it's 99B I'm referring to. I'm just checking my. 99B is provisional, Senator. I yep. think you are referring to 184. 184. Well, in that case, I don't need to ask the question. So that's, uh, I'll move on to my final issue, which is with respect to associated entities. Now, Section 287.1b, um, which you were discussing with Senator Abetz before, uh, talks about associated entity means an entity that operates wholly or to a significant extent for the benefit of one or more registered political parties. I don't wish to, I, I listened to your explanation before. You did talk about monitoring the media though, and at various points, um, I, I can't remember your exact words, but you would investigate issues or have a look at issues to see if something was an associated entity, if you saw something of note in the media. Um, so I was wondering, um, I noticed in the paper, in the age, back uh, earlier in May, a commentary around a fund called the Industry 2020 Fund, which was, um, uh, it's been in the paper a bit, but it's a fund that was managed by a person who was a union official who is now a member of the Victorian Parliament for the Labor Party. Um, the article in the age on May 19 was headed, Labor Silent About Sat Status of Secretive Slush Fund, has a paragraph Last year, Mr Mellum took control of Industry 2020, which he acknowledged in December had been used to bankroll the political activities of his right subgroup within the ALP. Uh, and it also said, including a, a factional fight over the control of the Disgraced Health Services Union. Now, we've had a discussion before about these slush funds or funds that operate for the purposes of activities inside political parties. Um, at what point do you look at an, something which may, in this case, to a significant extent, operate to the benefit of one or more registered political parties. Um, because these are in a unique, darker place of the law. They're not explicitly captured. But if you've got people who are openly saying they're used for political activity within a political party, it wouldn't be too hard to say that is, you know, to a significant extent for the benefit of one registered political party. Have you looked at that fund? Um, Senator, no, we haven't looked at that fund. The the, the sort of things that we would be looking at is, firstly, is it involved in federal election activities? So uh, the fact that it might be involved in something with uh, state government matters, etc., doesn't address the first issue that we look at. It. Second issue that we'd look at is, okay, what is the prima facie material that's been included there? So normally if we uh, have an allegation or there's a complaint, yes, we would look at that, or there's been an inquiry, that would generate um, uh, alarm bells for us to have a look at. 
The third thing we need to look at is an associated entity is not just paragraph B or the rest of that, that definition. You've also got to go across to the definition of an entity, which is also in section 287, subsection 1, which means an incorporated or unincorporated body or the trustee of a trust. So we've had a number of examples that have been brought to us in the past where all it was was a fund and a bank account that had been established. And uh, to give you an example of yep. one that was recently in, in the media was the Craig Thompson Fighting Fund. Yep. That that is not an entity that would fall within the scope of 2871. Well, this, this one's a, a company limited by guarantee. Well, if we so had I, some information about that, I'm more than happy to take it on board sure. and to have a look at it. But I, at this stage, we haven't. <coughs> My, 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 I will forward you the information. My query here is about um, if uh, what the test is for operating to a significant extent for the benefit of one or more political parties. So I, I accept your carve out with respect to state politics, uh, but if an organisation was, for example, um, funding activities within a political party that were integral to that political party, that could be deemed to be of a benefit to that political party. But, Senator, the whole test, the, the test has the other word in there, yep. wholly or substantially. Yep. Uh, or wholly or to a significant extent. Or to a significant but, extent. But, that, so but that's so a test on the fund. It's not a test on the party. It's a test on the fund. Exactly. So even if the fund is only a ten, twenty thousand $20,000 fund, as opposed to a million dollar fund, yep. the test is the significant extent of the activities of the fund. Not, that's correct. Yeah, not how big a contribution that that's makes correct. to the test of the party. Yes, Senator, I agree with you. So. In this case, um, uh, what, what are the tests to, that you use to determine, because I'm not asserting it, it's holy, um, and in fact they're easy to classify, um, but what's the test that you determine to use to determine whether something is operating to a significant extent for the benefit of a registered political party? I mean, is it, is it Sen proportionate the revenue spent? Is it, you know, it would be the, the revenue expense would be the actual activity that was shown in relation to um, the actual uh, entity and their activities. So we, we quite often get allegations raised about activities of various entities, but it's still an issue about, okay, what's the turnover, where's the money going, what is the activity relating to, and those are the sorts of matters that we would have to look at okay. to determine so, whether it is an associated entity. Yep. And so I'm not sure if there's a legal mathematical definition of significant. Um, Senator, we, we have had um, advice that was reflected in, for example, the material published on our web website about GetUp, uh, about the Wall and Gatta Fighting Fund and other matters like that. So we have reflected what significant is in terms of holy. It's the connection between the two words that causes the, 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 the difficulty. Wholly or to a significant extent. That's right. So, so it appears to be that to a significant extent is one degree removed from wholly, yeah, not that it's just over 50%. No, okay. Okay. So you're, uh, that's very helpful. You're, the construction of that is that it's not just over half, it's got to be, you know, it, it's got to be close to Further whole. on the continuum. That's right. Um, a lot further on the continuum. Sorry? A lot, a lot further, further on the continuum. On the continuum. Um, yes, I've long looked at this section and thought I might have drafted Soft it differently. Reason. Um, the, so how do you, um, do you simply trawl for the public documents and available to make this determination? We look at public documents. Um, in some recent cases, we've gone to um, um, ASIC and uh, obtained financial records that have been lodged that weren't in the public domain sure. and a range of other material to try and ascertain where the money is going and what it's being used for. And I know we had this, I wasn't party to the discussion, there were long discussions about this following the 2007 election and various funds. In, in shorthand again, what are your powers to seek information from people, if any, and do you essentially have to rely on if you ring someone and tell them and they say, no, no, we, that's, because a statement of account doesn't tell you what they do, it just tells you how much money they've spent and that's all ASIC records will pretty much tell you. Most um, times we've been able to write to people and they've cooperated. If they don't cooperate and we are looking into whether an association is an associated entity, we have the power in 3163, uh, which is the power to um, 
approach the financial controller yep. where we have reasonable grounds. So where an authorised officer has reasonable grounds to believe the person is capable of producing documents or other things uh, in relation relating to whether an entity is or was at a particular time an associated entity and the person is or has been the financial controller or an officer of the entity, the authorised officer may by notice serve personally on, by post on the person requiring them to, to produce certain documents. Sure. Now, my our experience <coughs> over the past couple of years has been that most organisations, when we approach them, they willingly provide the information sure. that we've sought. But if they don't, there is that power in 3163A for us to approach them if we've got reasonable grounds. And so that's the threshold test that we're looking at. So not only have I got uh, the associated entity test, I then got this threshold test about reasonable grounds that I can use our coercive powers. Sure, thank you. Now the last question I have is regarding the registration of um, new political parties and the timeline. That's time me lines. as well, Senator. Sorry? That's me as well. Most of it's you, Mr Pray. Um, so could you, what are the timelines you've got in front of you now um, for the final consideration of registration? I've looked at, like yep. you've got quite a few in front of you. Um, Let's see, since the Prime Minister's speech at the press gallery, we have received 28 applications from political parties seeking registration. We put a um, media release and there's information on our website where we said that the, uh, the indicative time for processing an application is three months. Therefore, if you wanted to ensure that your political party had a chance of being registered <coughs> by the indicative date for the issue of the writs, which is the 12th of August 2013, okay. you needed to have your application with us by the 13th of May. And does that give... Um, you've also got some name changes we have, proposed. We have name changes, we have uh, registered officer changes, yeah. there's a whole range of material. I suppose the name material. changes and the registrations are, can be more contentious than a registered office, officer change. That's, that's true. The, but the, it's the registration process because we're required under section 132 to publish a notice in yeah. national newspapers and on our website and give people one month to object to the registration of the party and therefore that process um, uh, in, has built into it a three-month period. What happens if, with respect to registration or thinking probably name change, they tend to have been a bit more contentious, at least in my recent knowledge, um, they are sub the AEC decisions are subject to review, are they not, if someone they wishes are. to? So what happens if the AEC makes a decision and then that an application for review is made? and I don't know if there is there a guarantee that that would be heard by the relevant authority before the writs were issued. And uh, in fact, Senator, I there is a shaking his head. Senator, there is a prohibition yeah. on it being heard. Section 127 yeah. of our Act does two things. Firstly, it suspends the register, so no new names on the register after the issue of writs. But it also goes further that they're not able to take action to amend, and that includes by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which is the body, the, the process that we have is the delegate of the commission makes the decision. Yep. If the person's not happy with that, then they've got the right of review to the full commission yep. that considers the matter. If they're not happy with the full commission's decision, then they can seek uh, merit review by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, that's section 141. Yep. And then if they're not happy with that, then error of law, they go off to the sure. federal court. We had this instance uh, happen in the 2007 election with the Fishing Party and the Fishing and Lifestyle Party. <coughs> and um, un unfortunately, um, after the decision had been made, uh, they weren't able to have it resolved before the election. So in effect, the decision stands upon the writs being issued, whatever decision has been made until that point. That's correct. It doesn't revert to un it Unless was. they've got to court before that date or the AAT and sought a stay and been granted a stay. You must, yeah, okay, you must seek the stay, okay. Um, with the number of parties that have been seeking registration, um, how much of a problem if they were all to nominate is the New South Wales Senate ballot paper? Good question. Um, it, it is going to be an issue. You're going to hand out magnifying glasses with ballot papers? It's one of the challenges and of course it's, it's led Parliament to make some amendments to increase the nomination fee and nomination requirements uh, to try and avoid uh, those um, candidates and parties that have got 
limited chances of, uh, of getting up uh, from being on the ballot paper, but we'll have to just wait and see, Senator. Just are you still stuck with that 90 cent, 92 we cent are, middle limit? We are. We've looked at uh, and consulted industry if there's a way around this, but just at the moment. There's not. Uh, no. Industry in Australia is not capable of, uh, of dealing with uh, variable sizes of uh, ballot papers. So I think we're going to have to be forced to go down in font size. Hmm. That'll be mm. interesting for some. Um, mm. And how do you, I mean, do you then literally have more assistance or magnifying glasses to lend people? I mean... Let me take that on notice. Okay, <laughs> just something we discuss. That's all I have, Chair. Excellent. Um, then uh, we thank you and the officers. We'll see you at the next estimates. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we will um, welcome done. back Mr. Tune and officers from the department. <laughs> yep. You don't have anything else? Okay. Uh, well, we're going to have lots of company. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bit more spot on. No, 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 it's Senator Pratt and myself. You, were, you didn't want to go out to. No, no, I said I might need to. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. No, Can no, we, we have less personal classifications. Sorry? We have fewer personal classifications. <laughs> so it be Senator Pratt and okay. myself. Okay. <clears throat> I welcome back uh, Mr. Toon to Departmental Officers. We'll resume now in outcome three. Uh, Senator Pratt, you have the call. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, it's been some hours now since we were um, discussing this issue. So just to recap, uh, I was trying to get some clarity around reasonable personal services such as religious services and banking when these are not available at Parliament House in terms of transport services that members of Parliament um, may use. Um, and I note that the examples in the determination, attending religious services, conducting personal banking, are unrelated to the official work of an MP or a senator. Um, likewise, parliamentarians can use transport to travel to bars, restaurants, purchase food and beverages, and to attend to a myriad of entirely of other private affairs and functions. Is that correct? The bars and functions, Senator, but certainly um, the um, religious services and banking is one of the examples given. Okay, so can we only go to religious services and banking using these vehicles? What other services might we be able to attend to? <coughs> you know, yesterday morning I used a, a car to go and meet a friend so that we could go for an early morning run so that, you know, when I'm away from home I can do normal things that you need to do in order to maintain a, your lifestyle. Is that an appropriate use of a vehicle? I think the uh, entitlement provides that where these reasonable personal services, such as religious services and banking, and the, one of the key points here is when these services are not available at Parliament House. That is one of the key terms of the entitlement. So a social engagement like I had yesterday morning, which was exercise because I'm not at home, you know, the things that you need to do to maintain your existence when you're away from home are not part of those personal services? It would not appear to fit within <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the limitation. Well, the reasonable personal services, it gives two examples, such as religious services and banking, 
when these are not available at Parliament House. That is what it is contemplating, services that are not available at Parliament so, so House. So if she'd gone for a row, it would have been fine, so because you can't row around Parliament House. I'm obliged to catch the, take the car to Parliament House to run on the treadmill rather than take a car to a friend's house so that I can run around the lake. Is that what you're telling me? The, I, th I think, as um, we've sort of canvassed before, the, the car transport entitlement is, in the broad, intended for parliamentary and electorate purposes. There are some situations where it contemplates reasonable personal services, where these are not available at Parliament House and ultimately will be within the discretion of the senator or member to determine what are uh, parliamentary and electric purposes and indeed what are reasonable personal services given that okay. personal services for one senator or member and what is reasonable may be different to another. Yes, they may be reasonable and I guess if the department discovers that someone is doing something unreasonable in their view, um, the tradition has been to bill people for that car service, hasn't it? Uh, um, well, for example, uh, 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 an example given to me was a, a, a new MP that uh, puts their family in a second car and puts other people in the first car and didn't realise they weren't entitled to that second car. You know, I think that in the past people have been billed for those kinds of things or if people have used a car when they didn't know they weren't entitled to, they've been billed for it? Certainly if we become aware of entitlements being accessed outside the boundaries, um, we do have mm. processes for raising invoices. <coughs> should, so should I expect a bill for my trip to um, go for a run yesterday morning? How do I know whether I my entitlements, uh, whether I'm exercising my travel entitlement within entitlements or not. This goes back to this issue that Senator Faulkner raised, Senator, about the, the lack of a definition of what's parliamentary and electoral service. So it's, um, you get down to a common sense interpretation, I guess. Okay. And, and it, judgment, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and, and the member or the senator needs to, in effect, make a personal judgment about whether they think they're inside the entitlement. And, and if someone is mistaken in their judgment, what would be the normal procedure in of pursuing that? Um, if it came to our attention, uh, we would ask some questions if we thought it was uh, some, you know, maybe on the borderline or whatever. Uh, and then, uh, you know, a judgment, as Senator Faulkner says, would have to be made. Okay, so people need to be, is it legitimate that people need to be provided with an alternative means of going about their ordinary personal business or not? I'm sorry, I don't follow the question. Is it legitimate that... Okay. So, it, it's common practice that parliamentarians would indicate that many think it's reasonable to travel to purchase food and beverages to, um, you know, sustain them while they're in Canberra. And I note, you know, there has been a particularly controversial case in this light. Um, Peter Slipper's case, I think, was referred um, to the police. Um, but, and I can understand that there are different definitions of judgment here, but how are MPs supposed to know what the line is? I think, as I mentioned before, Senator, we, we do make a, a deal of information available on the website. As you began this discussion earlier, you referred to the determinations. There is an expectation that senators and members make themselves familiar with that. And of course, one of our key services that we provide in ministerial and parliamentary services is access to <coughs> um, dedicated entitlements managers. They are always available um, to, to answer questions should senators or members want to uh, explore whether but or not a particular action would be within... You haven't given me a clear answer about whether taking a car to go and exercise yesterday morning was a legitimate use of my entitlement or not. Because, as we've mentioned, whether or not you consider that is reasonably in the course of your parliamentary and electorate business is, is a matter for you, and whether or not what you consider as a reasonable personal <laughs> service, which is what is contemplated yeah. in the, this particular entitlement, when these services are not available at Parliament House, they're always going to depend on the particular services. 
So if I had a different interpretation of that to the department, ultimately, how would you expect to resolve that? Well, you're, you're, you're saying, you're making a judgement, you're saying, saying it's okay. If it comes to our attention somehow that that was not the case, we would be discussing that with you. Okay, and, you, and that is a legitimate, a legitimate thing to do. And, uh, and you would expect that to be resolved in what way? Clearly an MP would stop using uh, the entitlement in a way that you've now notified someone is inappropriate, or perhaps you might, what, bill them? Or yes, what? yes, it could be. That could okay. be the case, yeah. Seeking um, recovery. Can I ask in that context what approach was taken to um, Peter Slipper's use of travel yes. entitlement? Uh, the situation with respect to the member for Fisher is quite different to all of that. Uh, in that uh, normally we have a protocol which we call the Minchin Protocol, which is when these things, the situation we've been talking about, if it escalates, uh, and if we think there's been inappropriate behaviour, we can run it through what the Minchin Protocol, which has been tabled and is available to, on our website. Uh, that then involves a committee of which I chair with a number of my senior people to run through the circumstances of that, come to a view about the severity of that, maybe zero, may be small, in which case we may ask for the money back. It may be quite uh, uh, major, in which case there's an option to seek assistance from the, or seek a referral, in fact, to the AFP and so forth. So that's the normal process if it comes to our attention. Mm. The, mo the big difference between that and the situation that pertains at the moment with the, the member, for, member for Fisher is that it was a former member of his staff who referred it directly to the AFP. So therefore we had no role. The Minchin Protocol and all our procedures internally had no role in that mm. whatsoever. It was an AFP investigation from the very start. AFP spoke to us and sought some information which we provided, and some of our records, and then the AFP made the decision whether to refer it to the DPP, which they did, and we're now going through that other process. So it was the reversal of what we would normally do, and therefore we were, had no role in it whatsoever other than to provide information to the AFP. Is it time, do you think, Mr Chern, for us to consider uh, changing the name of the Minchin Protocol? No. He's, no, I mean, I mean this he, he's happy that he still gets mentioned at virtually every hearing. Well, there he we said go. it's occurred much more since he left than when he was I, here. We could call it's, it Protocol A, I suppose. I'm not sure. No, no, but I, th uh, I, I, I take your point. I actually me. wonder, I mean, and, and um, I've, I've asked in the pr previously for the Minchin Protocol to be tabled here. I've got a good knowledge of it, and um, and uh, it's a good shorthand terminology. But uh, but sometimes I, I just wonder is, if it isn't worthwhile thinking about this now, particularly now that you know Senator, Senator Minchin obviously doesn't have now that he's have ministerial responsibilities, no longer a senator, and um, it's a, it's an interesting historic uh, document. But maybe maybe. It ought to get a name that that means that um, it might be a little bit more user friendly. So quite seriously, into the future. I mean, so it, it a, a protocol about how the how the uh, the Department of Finance uh, deals with uh, certain matters. I'm not suggesting that be the name of the protocol, but it, it might be time to think about moving this along a bit. Yeah, that's fine. I think I think I don't know. If it's, I was using the colloquial. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I think it does have an official title, doesn't it, it Stephen? It, uh, it does, Senator. And the one that uh, the oh, it version does, does it? It, it does. It, it's it's a long title, and I think you'll understand why it's shortened to to the to mention yeah. protocol. I'll read it out for you. Protocol followed when an allegation is received of alleged misuse of entitlement by a mem member or a senator. So, yeah. so hence, uh, a shorter version is so, the mentioned protocol. So it does have that title. It and, does. And what, so we're all just referring to it effectively by what it's best known as a short, a shorthand. That's On right. that basis, I reckon you've always got it in politics, quit while, when you know when you're behind. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> I'm behind on that one. So, can, can I ask the principles of the Minchin Protocol, as it's called, uh, are that um, you know you need to reasonably um, discuss with a senator or a member or someone else who's got that in, uh, exercising an entitlement about what their reasonable understanding of that entitlement was. 
Yeah, yeah. perhaps, uh, and the Secretary made the distinction uh, in this area between uh, serious allegations and less serious allegations, so, and they're handled differently under this uh, protocol, and the less serious allegations are handled uh, via a process of um, um, the Special Minister of State writing to the relevant Senator or member mm. and seeking, you know, an explanation, providing them with information around, you know, the entitlement and and uh, what uh, what kind of entitlement could be available, and providing the Senator or member with a chance to to consider that <coughs> and to provide an explanation if there is an explanation. Um, and there's a different process in place. Uh, as the Secretary was indicating in relation to serious matters. And when we talk about serious matters, they're the kind of matters that might suggest, for instance, that there's been you know, fraud or, or some other uh, criminal offence committed. And, and even, an assessment, yes. um, even an assessment about whether a matter is serious <coughs> or otherwise, and whether the so-called Minchin Protocol would apply, yes. in the particular circumstance, these, these matters can be bypassed by literally the Department of Finance and Deregulation being cut out of the game. That's, that's yes, I, I'm Member saying, Fisher. I mean, so, so uh, that of course can happen. Uh, and you have protocols and procedures when the Department of Finance and Deregulation is in the game. Yes, that's correct, Senator. I, I guess that what concerns me about that is that, in effect, it cre can create a completely double standard depending on how the so-called complaint uh, about the use of your entitlements is resolved. Uh, I don't know if, well, it's, it's just the circumstance in which it arises. Someone makes an allegation, not to us, but to, directly to the AFP. And but it's the, for the AFP then to decide what they do with it. But it strikes me that the use of the Minchin Protocol has seen um, uh, issues resolved via, uh, usually via the repayment uh, and a clarification of what the correct entitlement is. You know, you could look to the um, Peter Reith. Um, yes, but they're complaints that are made to the Department of Finance and Deregulation. And this wasn't a complaint made to the Department of Finance no, and Deregulation. That's and they can only deal with matters that are before them. They can't deal with matters that aren't before them. It, I guess the thing is, if, if you... It, it, the matter before um, us is that you may be leading us all down a garden path, <laughs> exercising entitlements that if someone were to dob us into the police, we wouldn't actually be entitled to be using. And so you're telling us we can use them, and yet the AFP might say that you can't. I, I think and, and in a sense, it's the question of what is a consistent ruling in, when, in relation to those questions. Misleading senators and members in the use of their cannot, entitlements. No, no, I, I, understand, I don't, I, I don't, that's not really the, um, I'm not saying that that's done in any kind of malicious way. You're there to support us in the use of our entitlements, naturally. The question is, that if we're going to have a discussion about the literal interpretation about whether me using a, a com car to go, go for a run around the lake in the morning is legitimate use of entitlement or not, and you're telling me that it's subjective, and then those things uh, end up in the hands of the AFP, it needs some clarity. Well, Senator, I think um, Mr Toon, I think, has explained uh, the I suppose procedural reasons why the particular matter you raise has been handled in this mm. way. I think, I mean, that the difficulty is that, or that the issue is that um, any citizen can um, ask the law enforcement authorities to consider a breach of the law yes. uh, as is appropriate. And there's, you know, whatever people's views might be about there being other ways that might be better to deal with a particular issue. Mm. Um, we, we operate, um, these officers operate within the context that any citizen ca can do that, should they wish. But it's and actually even <coughs> further than that. I mean, one long-standing uh, protocol is that it's not appropriate, or, well, that, 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 that once the matter, a matter, any matter, becomes, uh, uh, is before the Australian Federal Police, and it's an operational matter, Yep. then there are correctly and properly 
limitations on what any individual or agency or, um, or parliamentary committee uh, can properly do, surely. I, yes, I, certainly, I certainly took that view, Senator, uh, that once the AFP had, it had been referred to the AFP, I was out of it other than that the um, if we, if we, if we were that, requested for many, almost, for many, for many years for information. at this committee on for a short time well on, on, on both sides of the table if you like um, that that uh, I've I've tried to and many other senators have tried to ensure that uh, if we find ourselves um, uh, inadvertently uh, trampling into an area which we establish is a matter that is. Uh, an operational matter before the AFP, you cease trampling there. Mm. That's, that's the principle we operate under. Well, I, I guess I raise the question because I don't want other members of parliament to um, trample there uh, inadvertently either, you know, be it, um, you know, people who take a car down for dinner in Manuka, which it sounds like is unclear as to the extent to which the department's prepared to declare is within or without entitlement. I, I think Senator Faulkner nailed the, the crux of the issue earlier when he was talking about the lack of definitions, clear definitions in the Act around what's parliamentary service or electoral service. And we, as administrators, would welcome further clarity around that, quite frankly. Now, that's obviously for the parliament to decide. Um, I, I guess the other me. question there is, though, it is parliamentary service or electoral service, but when you're dealing with taking cars in Canberra, it's very clear can then define that people use them for personal services because you're, in effect, living here while you're here. Yeah. But, and then you can define what's parliamentary service to encompass those things that you wish to encompass. Yeah. If you so yes. choose. Yes, yes. which is your requirement yeah. to live away yeah. from home. Yeah. And that becomes part of your parliamentary yeah. service well, I think because. That clarify things for both you as politicians and us as administrators. But in the absence of definition, Mr. Tune, what I think it's fair to say that your department has depended on is practice and precedent. Absolutely. Is, is that a fair comment to Absolutely. make? Absolutely, yes, yes, it is. Yeah. And trying to advise people when they, if they ask the questions, the difficult questions, the questions at the margins, that we try and give them clear advice as, as much as we can based on that precedent. Okay. So c can I ask um, just finally how, you know, when we're making judgments about whether particular travel is within entitlement, you know, I've certainly learnt some things uh, uh, today and I'm not clear, I'm much less clear now what those <coughs> entitlements are. Um, Ah, so thank you. I have. Um, uh, do you want to go and then I'll, I'll go. Senator Ryan. We're still in outcome three, aren't we? Um, you told me you were done. I have one you more did. question. You said I'm I done. Fed, I'm done, Penny. I feel I've got my voice back. The um, again. Does the government keep records of how many ministerial staffers are employed by the government while on leave without pay from other organisations? You now they're employed by finance as ministerial staff as while on leave without pay from other organisations? Not central. Or is it something? within government? Or yeah, people in ministers' offices. No, hang on. Yeah, Do you mean they, within government or from the private sector? Leave without pay oh, from where? From the private sector, from, from external to government. Okay. I'm not sure if there is a declaration process that might be kept. I mean, I know there are declarations okay. ministerial yeah. staff make. No, no, this is... Ms. Baker, may Senator, in terms of the information, I'll just make a couple of points if I could answer it yeah, in a staged, a staged approach. Um, the engagement of persons employed under the MOPS Act is undertaken by a senator or member on behalf of the Commonwealth. Yep. We have a role to, we provide a, a range of supporting personnel services and which will give them their employment contract, for example, to, to complete so that we sure. can start yep. processing them through the system. There is no part of that process that requires a, uh, any one to, to, as far as I'm aware, and Mrs Baker may correct me, 
to nominate whether or not they are currently on leave without pay? Um, for, for ministerial staff or for any staff, um, we would know if they were on leave without pay from a Commonwealth agency. Yeah, no, I'm actually talking about private sector, non-government. No, we have no knowledge. Okay. We have no, no um, knowledge of that at all. Minister, does the Ministerial Code of Conduct, is that enforced by the Special Minister of State, for staff, I should say, Ministerial Staff's Code of Conduct, is that overseen by the Special Minister of State or is it overseen by the Prime Minister? I think I understand the, it's different to the Ministerial Code of Conduct, which I know has looked at the Prime Minister. Um, the Staff Code of Conduct isn't administered by the Department of Finance. No, as I was asking. Can I take that on notice? I yeah. was, I, I, sorry, did we go to the Ministerial Staff Code of Conduct in the conversation previously? Not yet. I mean, I think this is um, where I think the issue to which you're alluding was potential conflicts of interest. Obviously, would be dealt with by. Um, people are expected to disclose. Yeah. Um, uh, but I'd have to take on notice, because I'm not the person that deals Appreciate. with it, um, how those, you know, who's responsible for administering. I mean, as ministers, you get conflict of interest disclosures for your staff. Yes. Uh, and you praise yourself of those. Uh, and They're not centralised by the Department um, of Finance, I'm not sure. To, well, they're not centralised by finance. I don't believe. No, they're not. No, they're not. Um, so I can tell you, I can only tell you from my personal experience yeah, that, that there's a regular uh, disclosure of, of um, yep. a declaration <coughs> of interests, uh, and you would discuss with the chief of staff any um, uh, potential conflict. And uh, my expectation would be the chief of staff would then put in arrangements to deal with Avoid any that. potential yep. conflict of interest. And as a minister, you're not required to. Yeah, send those all to the PMO or something. I don't know what occurs with them administratively, Senator. I know I cite them and sign them. They yep. may well be sent centrally as well. Like, uh, that was Could you take on notice yeah, what happens to, to them that, after yeah. that? Thank you very much. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions um, in relation to the uh, the transfer of responsibilities from the Sorry, Department Senator, of... Sorry, Senator. I've just been handed something, <laughs> uh, which is that the... Here we go. Um, implementation of this code, which is the Code of Conduct for Ministerial Staff, is the responsibility of the Prime Minister's Office and the Government Staffing Committee. Yep. Any sanctions imposed under this That's code? Included, isn't that, Senator, in the Minister in the code? Yes. That's yes. part of the code, yes. an I, element of the yes, code. Yes, I recall that it was exactly. referenced. And any sanctions imposed on the code determined after consultation with the relevant Minister by the Chief of Staff, the Prime Minister, acting on advice from the Government Staffing Committee. Sure. Thank you. So I don't have to take it on notice, yeah? No, I'll put it, I can, no, that's a very good answer, thank you. Thanks. My question uh, goes to the transfer, if you could update the committee as to the transfer of responsibilities from the Department of Finance to the Department of Parliamentary Services, where that's at as far as uh, members and senators' yes. entitlements are concerned. So um, the transfer is on track for 1 July this year. Um, DPS have uh, spent a, a lot of time and effort working up a proposed model um, which uh, offers more flexibility and is less device specific than the existing model. That model is currently being costed by the Department of Finance um, and as soon as we have finalised that costing we will be in a position to brief the Special Minister of State with a recommendation and together with that, we'll also include proposed instruments to actually formally transfer this function to DPS with effect from 1 July. Okay. Uh, the responsibility of rolling out an upgrade to the um, computer systems and internet speed, um, that's been undertaken recently to electorate offices, is that not correct? That sounds like a matter for DPS. Senator, I'm... That's already transferred over. Yes. Okay. In relation then, we'll move on to um, budget um, in relation to, for instance, um, uh, communication uh, budget can cannot be rolled over from one financial year to the other. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. No, that's, that's correct, Senator, yes. In relation to the charter budget that is available, can that be rolled over? <laughs> For, from one year to another, and is there a limitation on, is that a rolling rollover, or, or in fact, you cannot roll that entitlement over? Just let me check for a moment, Senator. <coughs> I 
With the electorate charter budget, up to 20% can be rolled over from one year to the next. Okay, thank you for that. In relation to um, the, the um, management reports as such, um, we heard um, a contribution today in relation to the travel and the issues around not having all that budgetary information um, passed over to the department and consequently over to the management reports. Uh, is that, um, will we, con how long will there be a continuation of receiving two documents? Is this just a one-off document and then everything will be pertained into the management report? That's our intention at, at this point in time. It is a one-off document um, intended to give senators and members some, some early information um, as, as soon as the um, sort of upload issues that we have with the data at the moment are resolved. In relation to the signing off of management reports, in, previously in estimates there's been uh, discussion in relation to um, the amount of, of management reports or senators or members who have outstanding um, signatures. Is that still an issue for the department or is there a compliance now of all senators and members? Um, Senator Sheridan Moy, Assistant Secretary, Chief Operating Officer Group. In terms of the certification of reports, the certification is now of the six monthly reports, not the monthly management reports. <coughs> the current period we have four outstanding for the uh, reports that have already been published. So all but four of current parliamentarians have certified um, and a large number of formers. In terms of the reports that will be published on the 27th of June, we have 200 certifications already received and 140 for senators and for uh, former parliamentarians. So the uh, certification issue is um, somewhat less than, than previously a, uh, a major issue. There are no further questions. Then uh, can I thank uh, the department again? And uh, no doubt you'll be back for the committee at the next estimates. Can I place on record my thanks to uh, Hansard and in particular the Secretariat, uh, my colleagues, and uh, we now stand adjourned. Thank you.